Block 2. Owens. Time? Doniger asked. Sir. Oh, oh, five, five hours. Five minutes until Keyes is scheduled to begin the assault. All right. Let's hurry up. Hayes, where are we? Sarah glanced at her tablet before replying. Sir, Prince Lonad is in an isolated cell just up ahead. Got it. Owens, get the prince out of there. We'll watch the corridor for any guards coming in. On it, sir. Owens replies as he snuck toward the cell. Owens walked down the hallway, carefully checking each corner with his MP5. Alpha team had already cleared this section, killing four guards, but there was no telling if more were in the vicinity, hiding behind corners. Torches illuminated the path ahead as he continued toward the prince's cell. As he edged closer, he stopped, having heard the shuffling of armor. Slowly, he peeked the corner and spotted two guards in front of the prince's cell and immediately executed the guards with his weapon. The prince yelled in response, having never before seen such weaponry. SHH, I'm here to bust you out. Owens whispered. The prince nodded and pointed toward the dead guard on his right. Keys. Owens grabbed the keys to the cell from the dead guard and freed the prince. Lead the way, he said, stepping out of his cell. Owens returned to the corridor that Alpha Team was holding finding two additional bodies by the doorway toward the exit. Took you long enough, Doniger said. Ignoring this remark, Owens replied, focused on the mission. I've got the prince. Let's get out of here. Right. Having studied the schematics of this facility, Alpha Team experienced little issue with regards to escape. They ran until they finally reached the back exit, only to find themselves surrounded by a hundred guards. Well ain't this a cliché? Jones commented. Can we even beat this many? Richard asked. Doniger, unsure about the situation, looked at his watch. He smiled, a stupid, but potentially brilliant idea forming in his mind. To his teammates, he whispered, when you see the signal, we charge left and cut through their lines. The rest of Alpha Team, confused, asked about the signal. Apparently, according to Doniger, they would know when they see it. Having said this, Doniger needed to buy time. He stepped forth, announcing himself to the crowd of Nabian guards. I am the mighty wizard Houdini. You all will drop your weapons or face my wrath. The time on his watch was displayed as 12.59 and 30 seconds. 30 seconds left. I have not heard your name. You must be merely an apprentice. You are surrounded. You are in no position to make demands. The guard captain sneered. Ah, but you see. I control the powers of light. Doniger pulled out a flashlight and began turning it on and off. The guard captain stared at him, unamused by his parlor tricks. Do you think us to be fools? Any mage can do that. Five seconds left. Fine, then for my next and final act, I shall demonstrate the explosive power of the gods. Behold. Doniger raised his arms, as if casting a magnificent spell. Simultaneously, massive explosions occurred throughout the city creating bright flashes of light that caused the guards to look up into the sky. Understanding this was the signal, Alpha Team tossed stun grenades toward the crowd of guards. Bang! Alpha Team dashed left, running toward the designated extraction zone at the Nosh courtyard. The guards, realizing that they've been duped, immediately began pursuit after they recovered from their disorientation. Unfortunately for them, Alpha Team has a considerable head start thanks to Doniger's act, placing the guards at a massive disadvantage. As he ran, Doniger radioed command, informing them of their status. We've got the package but he's slowing us down. We could use some support. He looked back, seeing Prince Lonad struggling to keep up. Indeed, years in a cell without any opportunity for cardio would result in such low stamina. However, Lonad tried his best, seeing that his life was on the line. Alpha lead, this is taxi lead. Request is acknowledged. We are still trying to hold off assaults on our position. You're on your own until we clear out this area. Roger. Thanks for the heads up. As he took his hand off the radio, he fired at a charging Nubian guard who was able to get dangerously close to Prince Lanad. Alpha team continued to run until they received a transmission from the team holding down the extraction zone. We're close to being overrun. There's way too many of them. What's your position? We're half a click out. Should be there in about four minutes. I don't think we're gonna last four minutes, Doniger. All right, I'm sending a Viper to your location. Doniger then patched into the network for requesting air support. Firefly 1 to 1, this is Alpha Lead Actual, requesting close air support on the extraction zone. This is Firefly 1 to 1. We copy. Up ahead, 
Donager could barely make out a mass of Nubians, their silhouette against the raging flames allowing him to estimate their numbers. From the looks of it, Taxi was being pinned down by hundreds of archers and footmen, plus a handful of mages. For a 12-man team, they were holding fairly well, but not well enough to secure the extraction point. Incoming arrows and fireballs deterred the Chinook from landing, as it was too risky to stay on the ground. Fall back to secondary defensive line. Use the fountain for cover. At Whitman is hit. Medic. The injured soldier was dragged to safety by a brother in arms allowing taxi squad's medic to rush over and treat the wound. It was another lucky hit, the area to which the American defenders retreated was the poorly, and thus the Nubians couldn't see them. The only indication of their presence was the firing of their weapons. Enemy archers, seeing the muzzle flash of their firearms, would fire an arrow in the general direction. Once in a while, the Nubians would land an arrow near or on an American soldier. Thanks to the night vision goggles of the Americans, they were able to strike down targets with little challenge. Eventually, the Nubians figured out that they were visible to the Americans and sought cover behind various walls that lined the courtyard. We need to disrupt their cover as much as possible. Use grenades. Taxi lead yelled. Following the instructions of their commanding officer, the combat-capable soldiers of the unit began lobbing grenades and firing their launchers. Unlike the Americans, whose main weapons were dependent on line of sight, the Nubians could fire over walls, while still remaining in cover. The parabolic motion of arrows enabled the Nubians to randomly fire at the Americans, which didn't change much since they were firing randomly in the first place. Unfortunately for the Americans, they did not have the luxury of being able to waste ammunition on blind fire. Eventually, they will run out of grenades to fight back with. On the other hand, the Nubians could continuously fire arrows at their position winning this battle of attrition. Their firepower, even with explosives and light machine guns, was not overwhelming enough. Amidst the staccato of weapon fire and explosives going off, a faint thumping sound was heard in the distance, getting louder as seconds passed. Upon seeing the machine, the American soldiers cheered and intensified their barrage against the Nubians. The Nubian lines began to falter as their cover was rendered useless by the hovering machine of death. Hyder rockets were unleashed upon groups of archers hiding behind the stone walls that lined the perimeter of the courtyard, obliterating the cover they had and rendering the survivors vulnerable to the defenders on the ground. The onslaught continued for another minute until all the attackers were routed. The helicopter remained in the air guarding the vicinity as the Chinook descended to pick up the ground teams. Damn, Doniger said as he arrived at the extraction point. That's a lot of damage. Not even flex tape can fix this, Alex remarked. Alpha team and Prince Lon had boarded the Chinook, followed by the members of Taxi Squad. Six Taxi Squad members were secured inside before another battalion of Nubians marched into the courtyard. Firefly. You still got anything to throw at him? Doniger asked. All out of explosive ordnance, but I still have the chain gun. That's good. Light them up. The Viper lined its 20mm gun turret toward the marching force while the Nubians readied a volley of arrows. It was too late for the Nubians. The chain gun spun up, spewing pure death at the enemy. B-R-R-R-R-R-T. With one sweeping motion, the finely organized Nubian lines were shredded. Nothing remained but a bloody mess with dismembered body parts strewn across the area of the courtyard where the Nubian battalion once stood. Inside the helicopter, Prince Lonad had a look of horror on his face, having witnessed the destructive power of the metal dragon floating above him. By the moons, it is a flying metal monster. I'm sorry you had to see that, your highness. I know they were your people but I hope you understand that this is the price that must be paid in order to save your country from the likes of your father," Kalmethus said in an attempt to console the young man. Your words carry great wisdom, so Naren, Lonad replied with a shaky voice. Regaining his composure and sitting up straight, he continued, I understand what must be done. All personnel within the helicopter stared outside as it took off, the tension within them starting to be relieved. Donager looked over to Lonad who was still trembling at the massacre he just witnessed. He then looked over at his teammates and fellow soldiers. They were glad, especially since no American lives were lost in this operation. The helicopter's blades began to turn as it prepared to take off. A sudden jolt as it ascended slightly unnerved the prince. Ah, this is most unnatural. I wish to travel by horse instead. We both know it's not safe enough to do that, your highness, Doniger said. Just stay in your seat. My. 
How does this thing fly? I admit, I have little faith in the integrity of this machine. How often do you ride in this? Personally I've had over 20 rides in Chinooks like this. I guarantee you, it's safe. Just relax, and enjoy the view outside. Soon, the helicopter was in the air, almost over the city walls, at which point Lonad looked out of the window to see the view. Fires raged in numerous places within the city while thundering booms occasionally penetrated the hull of the Chinook and assaulted Lonad's ears. The eastern wall of Nock was completely obliterated in some sections. He surmised that this destructive feat was accomplished by the metal behemoths on the ground, with their long cylindrical noses. The skies were filled with metal dragons similar to the ones he saw at the Nosh courtyard. A group of four of them were breathing fire upon a section of the ground. He shuddered at the implications of this. The dragons were most likely massacring thousands of defenseless soldiers below. He wondered, how could the Americans have achieved such air superiority? What happened to all of the capital's wyvern forces? He got his answer as he watched a pair of arrows in the distance, their outlines barely visible thanks to the lights on the tips of their wings. In the city, four wyverns emerged to greet some of the metal dragons that plagued the skies of his beloved city. Compared to the arrows, the wyverns were extremely slow. Suddenly. He saw the arrows unleash smaller arrows that had trails of light. A few seconds later, the wyverns that had been deployed were obliterated, causing Lana to gasp in shock. The larger arrows were followed by several more, who ventured into the city. Moments later, flashes of light erupted throughout the city. Explosions somehow caused by the large arrows were decimating buildings within his city. Lonad's heart sank, and he wished to yell for them to stop but he knew they could not hear him. The city grew smaller as his craft flew away, and his wish was mysteriously granted. The flying machines of the other worlders began to retreat, following them home. The explosions on the ground ceased. Seeing this, he silently thanked the moons for hearing his prayers. Unbeknownst to Lonad, the Americans ceased their assault not because of his wish but because they had succeeded in their objective. His extraction represented the beginning of the end for Emperor Novus, and the sparks of life for a new empire, built in the image of a shining city upon a hill. Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntb and w chapter 25 operation upper hand part 2 nabian throne room month 6 day 23 2 23 a.m general narasa remained expressionless as he watched two other nabian generals attempt to calm down their emperor to be attacked by barbarians there is no greater damage to our pride. Such an egregious insult should not have happened in the first place. I understand, my lord, but it is okay since this is actually a part of our cunning strategy, General Nirimi said. His voice faltered as he ended his sentence. Narasa smirked internally. Obviously Nirimi was on his last straw and was desperate to save his neck from a beheading. Do enlighten me. What type of cunning strategy requires the destruction of my empire's defenses? Nirimi, having had but a few seconds to develop his argument, responded with an accordingly poor justification. My lord, it was to give the enemy a false sense of security. They will believe that our forces are weak, and thus underestimate us. Wrong answer, Narasa thought. You wanted them to believe that our forces are weak? The strength of Nabiya should never be mocked. What you speak of is treachery. Guards. Take him away. Two Imperial Guards marched forward and grabbed Nirimi's arms, dragging him away as he screamed. No, please my lord, have mercy. I have always had the best interests of our great. Nirimi was dragged out of the throne room before he could finish his sentence, which was followed by the slamming of heavy ornate doors. It was too easy to frame Nirimi as a spy. His incompetence as a general was too glaring to neglect. Narasa almost felt bad for the man. With Nirimi framed as the Sonaran spy, Narasa would be able to experience greater liberties throughout the Nabian High Command. No one would expect an additional spy in such a high position. Now, all he needed to do was figure out how Nash acquired his information. Despite the errors with this information, the fact that Nash was able to secure any at all suggested that a leak existed within the Sonaran Federation. Although unlikely, there was a possibility that Nabians could have infiltrated Sonaran ranks. If he could infiltrate the Nabian High Command, 
Then he supposed someone could have embedded a spy within his own nation. Now calm down, Emperor Novus continued their discussion. General Nosh, my most trusted warrior, I should have given you full control over the entire army. My lord, your judgment is always correct, Nosh said, bowing. Still, a large part of my judgment is derived from your counsel. So, what say you regarding the simultaneous attacks? According to reports from our intelligence officers, the Americans have attacked several scout outposts, and destroyed bridges leading to key industrial sectors that they are capturing right now. We have lost control of most of our forges and mines in the recently conquered kingdoms. As for our industrial assets within the Empire's heartland, most have been bombed. It is a good thing they attacked at night, most of our citizens would have died if they were working inside the forges during the attack. What about the Sonaran attacks and the Siege of Nok? Narasa raised an eyebrow remaining silent as Nash answered. From what we've gathered from our intelligence assets in the Sonaran Federation, the Americans hid details of the operation from the Sonarans. As Nash continued his explanation and briefing, Narasa thought about the spy. Given the inaccuracy of the intelligence, Narasa surmised that a junior officer must have been the culprit. He knew that the Sonarans were only told about the main assault on Nock and the secondary Sonaran efforts at Nilmer Fort and Normanton Fort. Seeing that defending against Sonarans is easier than defending against Americans, Nosh had reinforced the two forts from adjacent bases, unwittingly allowing the others to be sacrificed to the Americans. The intelligence of General Nosh was indeed exemplified by this action since he didn't know about the impending American attacks on other key strategic locations. Pleased with the information given to him by Nosh, Emperor Novus questioned the general further. Despite what I have said to Nerimi, I understand that the Americans would have taken some of these forts regardless of our defenses. Your decision to transfer troops was wise. How effective was your strategy in defending Nilmir and Normanton from the Sonarans? Very much so. Your Highness, our spy in the Sonaran Third Army was indeed helpful in providing us with the relevant information. Our forces in both forts could not be reinforced in order to overwhelm the attackers, but we had enough time to supply enough troops and equipment in order to deter capture. The enemy forces are currently engaging our defenses there. Hopefully, the Sonarans will be sufficiently slowed down long enough for us to reevaluate our strategies and adjust them in order to fight the other worlders. The doors to the chamber slammed open. Emperor Novus was just about to convey his satisfaction regarding Nosh's advice. My lord, pardon my intrusion, but they have ceased their assault. I see. Return to your duties. The soldier bowed before leaving. Novus, finding it odd that the enemy would suddenly stop attacking, Asked Nosh what the action may have implied. Your Majesty, I believe that the force that attacked our capital came here to destroy our defenses, perhaps even demonstrate their power. I believe this assault was an attempt by the enemy to flex their muscles and intimidate us. To accomplish this, they sought out our defenses and demolished them, as if they wanted to let us know how much power they have. In that case, why have they attacked our treasuries and prisons? I remember hearing of a report about small teams of men with dark clothing. They are the American counterpart of our Dark Shadow organization. I had reason to believe they wished to rescue the prince, so I increased security in his holding site. Did they succeed? Unfortunately, yes, but it should not be a problem given that your rule is followed with unquestioning loyalty. Our citizens will not be swayed by a false prince. Emperor Novus smiled relishing the relieving words of his top general. Excellent. Now, as for you, Narasa, tell me if the progress made with our research into Eclipse Magic. Fort Washington, 3.54 a.m. Lieutenant Colonel, report. Lieutenant Colonel Key saluted her commanding officer. Sir, Operation Upper Hand is a success. We have secured the package. Any complications with the mission? We have a couple injured from arrows. No losses on our side. Although the extraction itself was a bit dicey, it's like they know what we were trying to do. Some of our tanks got stuck in small traps and taxi squad got swarmed with hundreds of Nubians. The extraction would have failed if not for our air support. I see. I think I'll have to talk with the Sonarans about this. Go take care of your men, Colonel. Dismissed. Once she exited the room, he sighed. Key's assault on the capital and the extraction made up the final segment of the whole operation. The other plan attacks were executed without much difficulty and with much haste. Doniger's team completed their mission almost an hour after the others, 
which led General Harding to worry about the well-being of his people. Unsurprisingly, he was extremely glad when he found out that no American lives were lost. He made sure that his people did not underestimate the enemy, and used all advantages provided by their advanced technology and tactics. Unfortunately for the Sonarans, they had no such advantage. Last he heard, the Sonarans were struggling to capture the forts, having met fierce resistance. According to Sinders, King Celius suspected a spy within his ranks. No wonder the enemy had double the expected troops. Still, signed as reassured, it was nothing their forces couldn't handle. Of course, they would be able to request air support should they need it. Hopefully they wouldn't need much, since he had just reassigned a large force to assist Colonel Sanders in his mission of defending Site Beta-1 against the bandit army. According to Sanders, he had a new plan to eradicate the hostile army. Harding admitted, it wasn't pretty, but considering the sins of the soldiers who made up this army, he reasoned that their demise would be for the greater good. Sanders scheduled his operation to begin on June 27, since he believed that the final enemy reinforcements were arriving that day. Putting away the various reports and files strewn throughout the desk, Harding stood up and walked toward the exit. Well, it was a long day. Harding turned off the lights in his office and hit the hay, now that all of his men were back home safe. Month 6, Day 23, 10 a.m. My. This cuisine is fascinating, Prince Lonat exclaimed as he devoured a bowl of Twinkies cereal for breakfast. I'm sure it beats anything they've given you in the dungeons, your highness, Director Tempos joked lightly. I haven't experienced the outside world for perhaps two years now. One year and ten months, your highness. I see. How has the reformist movement been? Your imprisonment gave you the status of a martyr. More of our Nubian brothers and sisters have flocked to our cause ever since your father wrongfully sentenced you to the dungeons. Even the common peasant grew suspicious from this action. What of my allies within the Nubian army? They too have grown in number and strength. Some of the lower ranking members of Nubian high command will support you in the event of any coup. I suspect that even General Nosh would refrain from defending the emperor since his true intentions are and have always been with the Nubian people. That is good. And how have you been, Tempos? Last time we spoke, you were promoted to Director of the Dark Shadow. Ah, well unfortunately that promotion is no longer. The Dark Shadow was disbanded ever since I switched my loyalties to the Americans. I believe that Emperor Novus I now sees the Dark Shadow as compromised, and full of potential traitors. So it would seem. At the very least, my father's intelligence gathering and assassination operations have come to what appears to be a halt. Without the Dark Shadow to do his bidding, he's going to need time to reorganize, with loyal men this time around. And that is why the Americans have decided that the time to act is now. Sliding over a packet toward the prince, he described its contents. In this packet is the plan for the coup. One of the targets during last night's operation was a city known to be loyal to you. This is where you'll be transferred so that you may reintegrate yourself within Nubian society and expand your influence. Flipping to a page, Prince Lonad paused, reading something that caused him to raise an eyebrow. It says here that I will be provided with guards from the Otherworlders, for my own protection. Under normal circumstances I would have declined this, but at this point, I suppose it would be more wise to trust the Americans than my own people. After all, None of the other worlders have been tainted by my father's corruption. Indeed. However, before you are transferred to the city of Nusk, the Americans have requested that you prepare a propaganda letter for the people of Nubia. They wish for you to write a short essay in order to convince Nubia's citizens to rally behind your cause, and they plan to mass produce these letters and drop them from the sky onto our cities. Yes I have heard of such methods being employed before. I believe it was the Mechanies who did something similar. They called it a leaf drop I believe. Leaflet drop, your highness. During the second Mechanies Lutherian War, the Mechanies used a similar strategy in order to damage the morale of enemy troops and convince them that defeat was inevitable. The Lutherians had never before witnessed such masses of paper. Right. I remember this from my studies with General Nash a few years back. Considering that the Lutherians during that time were unaware of the printing press, they believed that the mass deployment of these propaganda papers represented the massive resource disparity between the two nations. Tempos smiled and nodded. Indeed, it is good to know that your mind is still sharp, even after all that time you've spent away from society. Upon hearing that final phrase, 
Lonad's eyes shimmered with an unimaginable fury and thirst for vengeance, but just for a split second. He then laid back in his chair, contemplating his plans for winning his people. Well, this Twinkie cereal was indeed a delectable dish. We should have some of these back home. I concur, your highness. I too have tried this dish and it is most pleasing to my taste but, satisfied with his treat, Prince Lonad stood up. Immediately, Tempos grabbed Lonad's dishware and placed it into the proper receptacle for dirty dishes. Once finished with this task, he returned to Lonad's side in order to escort him to his temporary quarters. As they walked, Lonad asked questions about the Americans and their culture. So I take it that you have been living on this base for quite some time now. Indeed, I have been here for almost two weeks now. I have been settling in nicely. Ah, you know. Experiencing that delicious dish earlier leads me to wonder if there is anything else that the Americans have that we don't. Well, if you talk to Ambassador Perry, he can most likely arrange for a trade agreement between our people and his own, after the coup is successful. At the moment, I can think of a few things that I do enjoy on this base. The lights are very convenient. Yes I've noticed that. Just flip a switch to activate the lights. I wonder what type of magic they use. Ah. The Americans know nothing of magic. Everything they build is considered scientific technology, much like the Mechanese. But the Mechanese have some magical devices as well. Do these Americans not have any? No, their technology is purely scientific, although I hear they are thoroughly researching magical technology. I see. Please continue. Another convenience that these people have are elevators, Tempos said as they walked up to a set of silver doors. He pressed a button causing the elevator doors to open. Lonad was slightly surprised, until Tempos reassured him that it was safe and motioned for him to step inside. The music playing in the elevator was pleasant, and quite calming. Lonad watched Tempos press another button once they were both in the elevator, and suddenly he felt a slight force on his legs. A few seconds later, he noticed a different force. The elevator stopped. Ding. The elevator doors opened, Revealing a smiling Tempos and a pleasantly surprised Lonad, who remarked on the function of the elevator. This would be very useful on some of our taller buildings, like the Nabian Imperial Library. I don't see why the Americans would build such a device in a small building though, when they could simply use the stairs. I have seen a blue sign with a white symbol on it. It looks like a person on a chair. Perhaps it has something to do with this? Or than just lazy and having an elevator in such a small building is a representation of the power at their disposal. Perhaps, your highness. Anything else? Have you noticed that the temperature of this entire facility is constant? Yes, now that you mention it. This is accomplished by the air conditioning or AC as they call it. There are lots of vents in the ceiling that house these AC units which breathe cold air into the building. I wonder how such an accomplishment could be achieved without any usage of elemental magic. Surely there must be a wizard casting a spell throughout a vent system. I shall reiterate, there is no magic among these people. This cold air technology is also present in the boxes from which the milk for your cereal was acquired. Fascinating. Tempos answered as they approached the door to Lonad's temporary room. Indeed, there is also a drink called Coca-Cola which is chilled by these machines. Would you like to try some? Yes. I shall fetch for it right away, your highness. Month 6, Day 25. 10 a.m. Sola's morning light shone through the windows of the conference room. In it, Five people were gathered for a meeting on the propaganda flyers for the leaflet operation. General Harding, Ambassador Perry, Prince Lonad, and Director Tempos were all there. The fifth member was CIA Director Samantha Gray. Of course, due to the nature of her organization and its past experiences dealing with government upheavals, her presence was essentially required in order to ensure a solid plan and smooth operation. Prince Lonat had spent the last couple of days drafting up a short essay for the purpose of convincing any readers to support him instead of his father. With the help of Ambassador Perry and some staff from the CIA, he was able to finalize his work. Now, they were all reading the final product. I like this, Director Gray mused. I reckon you should. Considering it's your organization's work, Samantha smirked at Perry's smart-ass reply before providing her thoughts on the short essay. Overall, I'd say it's good. Of course it could be better, but we simply don't have the time for further drafting. Prince Lonad, how do you feel about this? I must say, I feel a bit guilty for exaggerating my father's sense. 
despite my vengeful nature toward him. Aside from this, I think I'm proud of this work. It'll get people questioning their loyalty to the current emperor, and make them reevaluate their beliefs on the own errands. It is a good thing you mentioned the army last right outside these walls, and outside the walls of Sophius. My citizens will certainly begin questioning the disappearance of over a hundred thousand men. My father simply cannot continue to hide his defeats from the population. Samantha nodded, satisfied with Lonad's answer. She then looked toward General Harding and addressed him. General, it looks like we're good to go from here. If everyone's okay with this version of the flyer, I'll go ahead and make arrangements to begin printing. Everyone agreed in various ways, reaching the consensus required for a great to begin the printing of the flyers. Before the meeting was disbanded, General Harding remembered something. Wait. Everyone stopped and turned to look at General Harding, who directed his attention toward Ambassador Perry. Before we start making the flyers, I need to know something. Mr. Ambassador, did you get any response yet from the Nabian Emperor? I did, actually. But he basically just told me to screw off. His exact words, if I recall correctly, will you dare attempt communication with us even after your insolence? You will pay for your transgressions against us and so on and so forth. Miss Sindas got tired of the babbling so we disconnected from the magical communicator. I see. Well in that case, Director Gray, you are cleared to begin printing. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 26, Dragon's Layers, Fort Washington Month 6, Day 24, 123 PM Captain Henry Donerger stared at the charred target in front of him. He was practicing with his new N25 pistol testing its limits before it had to be recharged. This time around, it took about 150 shots at 50% charge before the energy in the weapon was depleted. For some odd reason, the weapon used up unexpectedly more energy the higher the charge was. Very interesting, Dr. Tesla commented. Last time around you were able to fire 350 shots at 25% charge. Next experiment, we will repeat the 25% charge test and see if the decrease is a result of crystal deformation or something of the like. Donager looked at him confused. Ah, it might be simply wear and tear on the device. The next experiment tomorrow will determine this. Donager nodded before returning the weapon to the armory, where he placed the depleted gun on a designated charging station. Such stations were recently designed in order to boost the national regeneration rate of the weapon. As he walked back to his quarters, he ran into Ambassador Perry, who seemed to be in a rush to be somewhere. Hey Perry, something going on? Donager asked. Ah, Henry. Just the man I was looking for. Quickly, follow me to General Harding's office. There's been a situation. Perry replied, a grim look on his face. Donager heeded the man's suggestion, and as they jogged toward the General's office, he asked Perry about the so-called situation. Charles. What's going on? I was in the communications room talking with Sindas when a communications officer informed me that we received a distress signal from a group of people identifying themselves as a Mechanese diplomatic convoy. We received their communication via several radio and magical frequencies, so it seems that they are actually Mechanese. Their SOS message described them as under attack by monsters, and given your team's expertise regarding such matters, I thought it would be best if you accompanied me while I brief General Harding. Well, that's a lot to take in. Sounds like a good old quest, he replied, smiling. All of his games on MMORPG games like World of Warcraft would culminate in his moments on this planet. After a minute, they reached General Harding's quarters. Harding, seeing the looks on the two men's faces, grew concerned. What's wrong? Ambassador Perry replied, General. We picked up an SOS on radio and magical comes from a group claiming to be a Mechanese diplomatic convoy. They're about 80 miles east of our position, past Fort Sewell. Can we establish any communication with them? The communications officers tried but they couldn't get a secure connection. Alright, if this convoy really is from Mechan, then we're going to have to rescue them. Picking up a phone from his desk, 
he relayed new orders to some flight personnel. This is General Harding. We have just received news of a Mechanese convoy in need of our assistance. As such, I am authorizing an emergency rescue operation, Lieutenant Colonel Keyes. I need you to get a Chinook ready for Terra Squad and Alpha Team within 15 minutes. Take an escort of four helicopters, we don't know what kind of monsters we're dealing with here. If they're enough to pose a threat to the Mechanese, then we know damn sure that guns might not be enough. He then placed the phone down and turned his attention back toward the two men in front of his desk. As you have heard, Captain, I would like you to lead the rescue operation. I'm sending Terra Squad as backup, since they're second when it comes to terrain familiarity around these parts. You leave at 1350 hours. And Ambassador Perry, I need you to get things ready on the base. Once we rescue those diplomats, I want them to be able to relax and experience a warm welcome. By the time Doniger arrived at the armory, the remaining combat members of Alpha Team, alongside Terra Squad, were already there, gearing up. Terra Squad selected larger caliber rifles, notably the Scar H, in order to have increased stopping power against the monsters. Ever since the Site Beta 1 incident, new types of ammunition have become available to the servicemen stationed at Fort Washington. Armor-piercing rounds were dispersed amongst the warriors. Considering General Harding's warning, the members of Terra Squad and Alpha Team U also packed explosives, anti-material rifles, and rocket launchers. Doniger selected one of the looted N109 energy rifles and yet N25 as his sidearm. Based on previous experiments, it seemed as if the low power settings on the N109 were on par with the highest settings available on the N25 energy pistol. So far, almost everything in this world has proven to be susceptible to small arms fire. Even the spiders back in Sight Beta 1 couldn't handle sustained barrages from their weapons. Doniger could only imagine how effective a fully charged N109 would be. He reckoned that it was powerful enough to fully vaporize a tank maybe even a small bunker. Satisfied with his loadout, he secured his equipment and walked toward the rest of his team, who were waiting for him by the door. Nice choice of guns you got there, Captain, Alex said. Thanks, Sergeant. Maybe one day you'll get one of these yourself. Boys and their big guns, Sarah said, shaking her head. And our big, long sticks, Joan said acknowledging the large scepters that he and Kelmethus wielded. Everyone laughed as they headed over to the tarmac, where their helicopter awaited. All systems check. Okay Big Bertha, you're cleared for takeoff. Good luck. Thanks, Control. See you in a bit. The Chinook's blades began to pick up speed, rotating with enough angular velocity in order to produce the necessary lift for ascension. Once in the air, the vehicle tilted and rushed toward the Walsaw Forest. A few minutes into the flight, the pilots picked up a radio transmission coming from Walsaw Forest. Help! I am a Mechanese diplomat and my team requires assistance. We are under attack by a flame dragon. Hey, let me get that radio, Doniger said as he walked up to the cockpit. The pilot nodded and handed him the radio. This is Captain Henry Doniger of the United States Army. We have received your request for assistance and are on our way to support. What's the situation? This is Legator Pre Ambinaparius. I am the legator of the Mechanese diplomatic team. We were attacked by a legendary beast, a flame dragon. The dragon has retreated for the time being, but our shield is at less than 20% capacity. We have no way of fending it off. Our guns cannot pierce its armor. Doniger then looked at the pilot. Covering the radio with his hand, he communicated his concerns to the pilot. We need to warn command. I don't think our hellos would be very useful against this dragon. The pilot nodded and began contacting Fort Washington in order to request for reinforcements, particularly for air superiority fighters. Meanwhile, Doniger returned to his conversation with the Legator. OK Legator, we have just called for reinforcements in order to deal with the beast. Just sit tight, and we'll be there in about 20 minutes. The transmission ended after the Mechanese man conveyed his understanding. Kelmethus then popped up. A flame dragon? Are you all mad? The Divinion Empire could barely even slay one. It took them hundreds of lives and dozens of aircraft. Doniger smirked. Too bad they've never heard of good old American firepower. What can you tell me about the dragon? It is enormous. It has a wingspan similar to one of your large transport planes, and it has incredibly thick armor. The material is so great that the famed Sword of Infragath, 
which is made of it, can cut through any other sword. Donager thought about this. Such material could be very useful in producing new technologies. Body armor and weapon components could benefit from a new durable substance. If the scientists back home could synthesize the material, they would be able to mass produce it. He would need to relay this information back to base once they deal with the threat. I see. Reynolds, make sure our reinforcements know what they're dealing with. We should land about a mile out, behind some foliage so as to not attract the attention of the dragon. The pilot nodded. Roger that, sir. As they approached their landing zone, the rescue teams heard a roar in the distance. Everyone looked out of the closest respective windows and saw a sight that none of them ever expected to see in real life. A fire-breathing dragon was laying waste to a section of forest, presumably where the Mechanese diplomatic team was hiding. Their helicopter touched down, with four Apaches hovering above them. As the rescue teams exited their vehicle, a radio communication came in. Please, hurry. Our shields cannot withstand another assault. The beast has left us for now. We're about a mile away. Hold on, Donager replied. Okay, he addressed his and Wilkes teams. I want a perimeter set up around that convoy. Everyone should have launchers or anti-material rifles. Remember, we might be fighting what is essentially a flying tank. But it is biological so it still has weak spots. Aim for the face and anything else that seems unprotected. I've been through a lot of missions, Wilkes said, tossing his cigarette. But none of them ever had me slay a dragon. This'll fit nicely into my record. The other elite operatives under Wilkes' command laughed, amused by the concept of not only being slayers of powerful terrorists, but also of dragons. I get your enthusiasm, Wilkes. However, our objective is to rescue these folks. We don't want to engage the dragon unless it comes for us. The dragon is currently away, so that gives us about 15 minutes to get the Mechanese to our choppers. Sir, how long till our fighters get here? Ryan asked. Reynolds, the pilot radioed Fort Washington to get an estimate. About 35 minutes, sir. Let's hope we won't need them. All right people, get moving. Hey, over here. Donager looked toward the source of this voice. Finding two vehicles with a vintage appearance and a peculiar device mounted atop the more extravagant one. What's that thing? He asked, pointing to the device. The man who identified himself as a legator responded, Ah, it is our shield generator. It is one of our Mark II models. It has sustained us for about five attacks from the flame dragon. Moving after each attack buys us a little bit of time. But the dragon doesn't seem to have difficulty tracking us. The legator turned around and gestures toward his people. As you can see, the dragon's attacks have left us battered and in need of assistance. This convoy initially had four vehicles, but two were taken out in an attempt to preserve my life. They valiantly distracted the beast and allowed us to escape. Unfortunately, we only carried with us rifles and pistols, as we never expected such an attack. The man hung his head as he finished his tale. I see. Donager replied, Well, we've got a helicopter on standby, about a mile out. Are your vehicles functional? Yes, they are. And? Helicopter? It's a type of rotary-winged aircraft. It is our way out of here, but we need to hurry if we want to escape while the dragon is away doing. Whatever a dragon does. The man nodded before issuing orders to his people. Everyone was about to depart before a radio communication interrupted their progress. Sarah conversed with her radio before reporting to her commanding officer. Sir, we've just received word from our E3. They're saying that they picked up an unidentified radar signature five miles north of our position. Apparently the thing just popped up. They think it was resting in a patch of forest before it shot into the sky. It's now heading here at about 150 miles per hour. So we've got about two minutes till it gets here. Yes. And our fighters are still 15 minutes out. Damn. All teams, maintain perimeter defenses. We need to hold the fort for three minutes or at the very least force the dragon to retreat. The next couple of minutes as they waited for the dragon to arrive was tense. The Chinook and its escorts had left when they received the warning from the E-3 AWACS aircraft. Given the unknown nature of the dragon threat, it was deemed too risky to have any rotary-winged aircraft near the dragon. Sure enough, the pilots were right. As the dragon came closer to the Mechanese convoy, it gained speed, ultimately surpassing 300 miles per hour as it used its claws to grab the shield device from the roof of the fancy car. Open fire. Everything you got. Holy shit, that thing is huge, 
Alex muttered as the shadow of the beast blocked the sun from all of them. Fire erupted as it flew away and tossed the device somewhere into the forest. Several missiles were locked onto its glaring heat signature. As the missiles approached, the dragon breathed fire upon two of them, but was unable to circle around in time to eliminate the third missile coming from behind. The third missile hit the beast's left wing, tearing off a small chunk. Seeing an opportunity, Donager began charging his N109 at maximum power. Cover me. I'm gonna blast it to hell. Sir, it keeps avoiding our missiles. That's okay. If the missiles can't be used as weapons, use them as distractions. Maybe we'll get another lucky hit. The dragon roared in pain before smashing its tail into one of the Mechanese vehicles, sending it hurtling toward an unfortunate Mechanese guard. It was at this moment that the charge on Donager's rifle hit 100%. At the same time, the dragon blew a heavy gust of wind toward Donager by flapping its wings, slightly disorienting him and causing his aim to falter. As a result, the N109 shot only struck the tip of the dragon's wing. The remainder of the charged energy projectile flew past and vaporized a dozen trees a few hundred feet away. A small blue mushroom cloud rose from the impacted area. Some of the combatants spared a few milliseconds in order to gaze upon the awesome power of the ancient weapon that Donager wielded before returning to their duties. Donager himself began charging another blast. Aside from lucky hits from missiles, the only weapons that seemed to be effective were the anti-material rifles that the Americans brought with them and the magic casted by Kelmethus and Dr. Jones. Without access to their own rifles, the two magic users harnessed metal ores buried beneath the ground, and implementing the science of electromagnetism into their magic, accelerated these metals to ridiculous speeds. The makeshift trail guns created by the magic users easily shattered the dragon's armor, creating numerous weak spots that could be further exploited by the forces wielding the AMRs. Distracted by a hail of bullets and magically accelerated rocks, the dragon was unable to counter a missile coming from a clump of bushes. Boom! Direct hit. The missile exploded on the dragon's right wing structure, effectively neutralizing its maneuverability in the air. Understanding that staying on the defensive wasn't working, the beast went on the offensive and incinerated the last car with its fire breath causing the vehicle's engine and gas tank to explode. At Donager yelled, having been hit on his legs. Sir, Richard reacted as he rushed to his commanding officer in order to provide medical attention. Don't worry about me, get back in the fight. The dragon lashed out in a circle, using its tail to strike multiple people, sending them flying. Donager, ignoring the pain in his legs, rolled to the side before the tail could hit him. Having gained a short respite from the dragon's attempts to kill him, he slunk back behind a tree and began charging his weapon. Meanwhile, the dragon continued to take hits from various explosives and projectiles, creating many cracks in its armor. 20% Enraged, the beast charged at the nearest team shooting at it, three Mechanese soldiers. In one swift motion, all three men were ripped apart by the jaws of the dragon. Donager's eyes widened from the sight, not even the horrors he had seen in his tours and special missions could compare to what he had just witnessed now. He looked over to his other team members, seeing Alex cursing and Kelmethus dropping his staff. It was as if time slowed down as he watched his friends and fellow combatants react to the tragedy before them. The dragon turned its attention to Kelmethus identifying him as an easy high-value target. Run! Donager yelled, 50%. The beast bit down on Kelmethus. No. The members of Alpha Team cried in unison. Fueled by vengeance, the American forces pummeled the dragon with their weapons, tearing through the weak spots created by Kelmethus earlier. Donager looked at his weapon. 90%. He took aim at the dragon's chest, at center mass. Unbeknownst to him, the dragon sensed something wrong as the weapon hit 100%. An intense blue bolt flew from the barrel of Donager's weapon as the dragon jumped into the air. For the dragon, it was a stroke of luck as the blast only managed to take out its tail and lower limbs. Gotcha now. Sensing defeat, the dragon ascended and began its retreat. The missile attacks during the battle managed to cripple it and injure its maneuverability, but they didn't render the beast incapable of flight. As it retreated, the men on the ground began to tend to their wounded. The Mechanese convoy suffered the most casualties, having received less training and combat experience than the American rescue teams. On the other hand, Donager looked around. His team's medic, Richard Yu, 
was helping those who were injured by the dragon's tail attack. Many of them suffered broken ribs due to the sheer impact force of the hit. Thankfully, the tail weighed considerably less than the dragon itself and thus the kinetic energy transferred was manageable. Sarah Hayes, his communications officer, was currently informing command of their situation. Upon closer inspection, he realized that she was crying. Kelmethis became a close friend to the members of Alpha Team over the past month, especially to the scientists back on the base. He realized that he would need to tell them what happened, since he is the commanding officer of this force. He realized that he would need to tell Kelmethis' daughter what happened. No, this can't be possible. He thought, was there any way to save him? He couldn't bear to imagine what it would be like for Sari, after learning that she lost her father. He remembered seeing the two so happy together when they reunited after the intense moment back at Site Beta 1. Who knew that it was for the last time? Before getting too lost in his train of thought, he was snapped back to reality by Richard. Sir, I found Jones and Kelmethis. They're unconscious, huh? Just come. Doniger followed the sergeant. His jaw slightly dropped once he viewed the miracle before him. What? How? We all saw him. I don't know, sir. But I think we will get answers from them once they wake up. And now, we should get the other injured into the Chinook. He pointed toward the Chinook that was just landing. Okay. All right, everyone. Let's get the hell out of here. Quickly. Everyone hurried into the vehicle. Once everyone was inside, it took off. Inside, everyone was shocked to see Kelmethis there. Many of them saw him eaten by the dragon. Suddenly, loud roars outside caused everyone to look out. A group of six of F-15 Eagles raced past the Chinook and its escorts, chasing after the injured dragon. The Mekani survivors were stunned, particularly the Legator who had never seen such powerful aircraft. How fast can they go? Binaparius asked. A bit over twice the speed of sound, around 1,800 miles per hour, Doniger answered. How is that possible? Well, hitting afterburners. Let's show the damn thing that we own the skies. Major Adam Griffin navigated to the panel on his right, where the engine controls were located. Coordinating his movements with the other pilots, he activated the afterburners bracing himself as he became subject to extreme g-forces due to the massive acceleration. Bandit is 10 clicks out. Arming sidewinders, he said over the tactical network. Roger. Target locked, another pilot replied. Stand by. Adam wanted his squadron to get closer before they fired, at least 5 kilometers. The dragon may be injured, but he wanted to assure a kill on the damn thing. If they were successful, their squadron might even be nicknamed the Dragon Slayers which they all joked about during the mission briefing. Engage on my mark. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Fox 2. Fox 2. 2 AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles streaked from the belly of each fighter. 12 missiles in total raced toward their target at a speed of nearly a kilometer per second. 5 seconds after deployment, they made contact with the unsuspecting foe, who was too busy tending to its own wounds to realize the threat from behind. Target hit. Its signature is gone, a pilot said. Roger. Move in to confirm the kill. Adam directed his squadron toward the last known location of the dragon before their missiles made contact. Noticing smoke coming from a small clearing within the forest, they slowed down in order to investigate. Sure enough, it was the dragon, or rather, pieces of it. Looks like we did a damn fine job, boys. Let's head home, Dragon's Lairs. Author's note If you enjoy my story, Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 27, Show of Force Part 1 AN Bonus points if anyone can figure out what two cultures the Mechanese are based upon. Hint names and titles. 2. I'm going to put the main story on hold for maybe a week or so while I revise the early chapters 1 to 6. If anyone has any suggestions or criticisms, please direct it to my Discord server, linked at the bottom. Month 6 Day 25, 9.43 AM. Prion by Naparius eyes flew open as he woke up in a sweat. He sat up, and looked at his surroundings. To his left was a nightstand with a water bottle, a digital clock and a lamp. To his right was a window, 
Outside he saw vehicles buzzing about as they prepared for an operation. This can't be real. He had a nightmare about being eaten alive by a flame dragon. Were the past events of a rescue fabricated? Could he be in the afterlife? He got up and walked over toward a restroom attached to his guest quarters. There, he used the toiletries present to go about his standard activities as accurately as possible. Hot running water toothpaste. Must be quite a civilized society much like ours. As he exited the restroom, he navigated to a neatly arranged set of his standard legator attire. No dirt, he noticed. He exited his room, seeing American airmen and soldiers bustling about. He remembered how he got to his room, and walked over toward the elevator, selecting the first floor. Hey, Morning. How you doing? A female voice to his left asked. He turned to the woman and saw something familiar about her. Hello. You were there when the flame dragon attacked? Yes I was. We got you and half of your team back here to safety. Not knowing how to respond, Priyam nodded slightly and muttered, Thank you. The elevator doors slid open and they exited. The woman questioned him again. Is there anything you need? Where can I see the leader of this place? He responded. He remembered his original mission establishing diplomatic ties. I can show you to General Harding's office. Lead the way, madam. Their short stroll was uneventful and relatively silent, since Prion was more interested in studying the architecture of the facility and the various technological pieces scattered throughout. He glanced at a small black dome on the ceiling, noting that he passed by several of these already. What they were for? He couldn't guess. Most likely, he determined they were some sort of light system that was currently inactive. Here we are. The general is right through here, the woman said, gesturing toward the door. Thank you. As the woman began to leave, Prion said, wait, sorry. I didn't learn of your name. Sergeant Sarah Hayes. Thank you, Sergeant. Sarah smiled and left the mechanics man as he knocked on the door. Come in. A voice from within called. Prion opened the door to find a man dressed in a dark uniform with sparkly badges on the left side of his chest. The man was busy with something on an American screen device, fiddling with the machine's built-in typewriter. General Harding? The man looked up. Ah, you must be Legator Prion Benaparius. I'm glad to see that we got you out of that jam in one piece. Prion wondered what the man meant by that, but brushed it aside assuming it was one of their figures of speech. Yes, I cannot emphasize how grateful I am for your help. Of course, General Harding smiled, it's what we do. I would like to be direct, before our encounter with the Flame Dragon, we were en route to this location as part of a diplomatic convoy. I am the Mechanis diplomat and I intend to complete my assigned task. When can we begin talks with your government? Straight to the point, huh? All right. I've already scheduled a meeting with us and Ambassador Perry in his office. He's the guy who represents my government. He's busy right now, but he will be at the meeting at 11 o'clock, in about an hour. In the meantime, why don't you head on over to the cafeteria, grab a bite to eat. I'm sure you'll love some of our earth dishes. We'll call you when we're ready. Okay, Prion said, bowing before he exited the room. 11 a.m. After enjoying a delicious meal of culinary items called pancakes and bacon, Prion wandered around the base, studying these otherworlders until a communication from within the building summoned him to Ambassador Perry's office. Legat Urban Aparius, please, have a seat, Ambassador Perry motioned toward a couch. Once seated, they exchanged introductions. As such, Ambassador Perry, my government, led by President Augustus Ducrelius, has sent me here in order to investigate. You may have already gathered some information about our people through your experiences here, so I assume you already know about how the Mechanis arrived on Gay Era? Yes, I've heard of it. Legend says your people arrived through a portal, much like us, but the portal closed after some time and those here were stranded, unable to return. Right, and we believe the same scenario might be occurring back then. We had no understanding of magic and very little of science. Now, I believe we are in a position to help each other out. I'd like to propose a cultural and intellectual exchange between our people for now. I see that you're still setting up your economic infrastructure. Haha, <laughs> yeah, at the moment we want to make sure the North Grandin Plains are safe. If we're going to build a port city near this gateway, 
we must ensure the safety of those who visit and live here. Speaking of which, how do you intend to operate a massive trading operation between two worlds using a small portal that's probably big enough for only two locomotives side by side? Honestly, we haven't put much thought into that. We're considering maintaining a constant operation in order to compensate for the limit on the volume of traffic. And now, we plan on using trucks. Our scientists think that using a railroad might be risky, since wormhole physics isn't something they've gotten down quite yet. I understand. Anyway, let us get back to the topic of cultural and intellectual exchanges. Meanwhile, pop, pop. Two bodies hit the floor, their heads decapitated from the sheer force of the 50 calories bullets that struck them. Sentries are down. Move up said Luna 1. Luna 3 spared a quick glance at the bodies. Poor fellows couldn't even see it coming. And now they can't see at all. Luna 3. Yeah, yeah. Focus on the op. The six-man team moved toward an unsuspecting group of guards, who were tormenting a group of people trapped in a cage. Making sure not to accidentally hurt those within the cage, the professional operatives angled themselves accordingly. Once they repositioned properly, they all fired their weapons. Two shots per guard one in the chest and one in the head. Shocked and confused from what they have just witnessed, the prisoners were speechless and allowed the operatives to approach. Don't worry, we're here to rescue you. After releasing the prisoners, Luna's squad began to escort them into the forest, toward their designated extraction point. Suddenly, they began to hear bells in the distance, along with shouts from soldiers. Damn it, we've been made. Luna 1 cursed. Pick up the pace, everyone. Sir. Some of the rescued are in bad condition. They won't be able to run, Luna 6 informed. Okay, Lunas 2, 3, and 4, cover our asses. We need to rescue as many of these hostages as possible. Sir, are they even hostages? Luna 3 asked. Focus. Luna 3 nodded and fell to the back of their lines, covering their escape by eliminating their pursuers with extreme prejudice. Come on. We're almost there, Luna 1 said to the rescued prisoners in order to motivate them. Unfortunately, his timing coincided with the arrival of several scout and cavalry units from Bracton's army. They poured out from the forest, surrounding the Americans and the prisoners they were attempting to rescue. Ah hell! Based on an extremely quick head count, Luna 1 determined that his team's firearms would be able to eliminate the 20 hostiles that currently surrounded them. Using any flashbangs was out of the picture. The rescued prisoners would not know what to do if he yelled flash out, and he couldn't tell the rescued to close their eyes, since that would alert the enemy as well. As such, any action he takes to neutralize the hostiles could result in friendly casualties. Thankfully, the opposing force didn't have any archers or any other ranged attacker allowing him to come to a solid decision. All units, take him out. Automatic gunfire from suppressed MP5s and SCAR Hs thundered throughout the forest, the attached suppressors doing little to mitigate the volume of sustained fire. After only a few seconds of combat, all 20 hostiles from the Bracton gang lay dead on the ground, blood soaking the green grass beneath. The rescued hostages simply stared in utter shock as they witnessed firsthand the overwhelming power of their saviors. To them, it was as if Sola herself sent angels to rescue them. Good work. Let's proceed to Point Alpha. Luna's squad encountered no trouble as they proceeded to the extraction point. Luckily, the soldiers from the Bracton gang had no units in the area aside from the initial guards and the scouts. Only a handful of their cavalry units were in the area, so it took time for reinforcements to arrive. Okay everyone, get in. Hurry. Luna 1 commanded. As the last of the hostages boarded the Chinook. Luna's squad began burning. At the same time, an arrow struck the hull of the vehicle, bouncing harmlessly off the reinforced metal. Acknowledging the threat, the operatives picked up their pace and jumped into the helicopter. Go. Start going. Luna 1 yelled as he fired his weapon into a crowd of incoming swordsmen. His squad mates provided supporting fire from the ascending helicopter. Luna 1 turned around and jumped, grabbing onto the rear door as it began to close. Quickly. His squad mates pulled him and before any arrows could fly into the main cabin, the door closed and everyone within heard loud impacts against metal. If they had delayed any longer, people could have been injured by the arrows. The Chinook cleared the tree line and headed back to base. Suddenly, an arrow struck one of the windows on the vehicle, lodging into the glass and creating a small crack. Inside, 
the members of Luna Squad chatted while unbeknownst to them, a new threat began to surface. Another mission in the bag, Luna 3 commented. Good thing we got that intel in time. Would have been pretty bad PR if the Sonarans found out that we accidentally bombed some of their prisoners, Luna 1 said. Yeah? wonder why they were there. It's not like they have any purpose moving along with the army, unless they're a sacrifice or something. Or slaves. Luna 2, the most politically oriented out of them all, slid into the conversation. Our boys with the suits and sunglasses figured out they were former nobles, from the lands conquered by the Bracton gang. Bad guys probably brought them here in order to send a message or make a trade. Either way, we got them out of there and the Sonarans are gonna find themselves with an amazing set of gifts in a bit, Luna once said. I kinda wish we could've stayed a bit longer, or come back later. Really would've liked to see all the fun, Luna 5 said. Don't worry bro, said Luna 4. The generals set up a movie theater for this. He's got some 4K cameras attached to a bunch of drones. Something about putting on a show for the Mechanese diplomats. Real shit? Luna 3 asked. No cap. Luna 4 affirmed, shit's about to get real, crack. What the hell was that, crack? Everyone turned to the source of the sound just as the glass shattered. Air flew out of the window as the cabin was being depressurized. A bag that wasn't secured on the ground flew toward the window and was sucked out. Thinking quickly, Luna 1 realized that the pilots should begin descending in order to reduce the effects of depressurization. If they flew near ground level, then the atmosphere inside the vehicle would essentially be the same as the atmosphere outside the vehicle. Anderson, bring us lower. The pilot followed the command. The Chinook began its descent. As the vehicle's altitude lowered, the magnitude of the depressurization decreased, allowing the cabin's environment to revert to normal. Damn, Luna 2 said. We're gonna have one hell of a mission report, Luna 3 joked. Fort Washington? Ambassador Perry's office. I find your proposition to be agreeable. We initially wanted to withhold certain key technologies from the inhabitants of this world until we could accurately determine their technological status. Of course, this would have been difficult due to the factor of magic. Perry leaned forward and clasped his hands together. We're reasonable. As long as there is something of value, we are always open for negotiation. We recognize that you have knowledge and products of value in particular your expertise in the fields of magical science. So, I think yeah, our current arrangement is fine. Trading textbooks is a good start. Indeed, Ambassador. I am glad we have come to an agreement. I'm sure you will be quite pleased with what we have to offer. I do however have an additional request with regards to information exchange, the exchange of our scholars for the purpose of studying. Ah, that is a good idea. Legator, your people are free to visit and study with our best and brightest in our top universities. We can arrange for a transfer once we have sorted out our schedule. Splendid. Your scientists are also welcome to visit our learning institutions. We can work out a schedule once you've selected people to transfer. Legator von Naparius said, certainly. Having American scientists studying the magic of this world with native experts was desired. Considering that Meccan was also a nation based upon science, with citizens who lacked the ability to control magic, it might be easier to learn from them. Once the scientists submit their report, he could work with the White House in order to develop a more streamlined trade agreement. For now though, he saw it imperative that he visited their country. Legator, on the topic of transfers and visits. When can we visit your country? I will have my assistant see you later for booking purposes. Is it possible that we see your nation within a couple weeks? The journey from Meccan was quite arduous, and I prefer not to go back and come here again. Thank you, and don't worry about that. I've got to inform my superiors about this visit first, so they can requisition appropriate accommodations for your people. Most likely, we will be ready to accept your delegation by the end of this week. Legator von Naparius smiled and nodded, satisfied. At the same time, a communications officer entered the room and whispered into General Harding's ear, Please excuse me fellas, I'll be back in a couple minutes. General Harding and the officer walked out of the room, closing the door behind them. Outside, the two men discussed the urgent matter. What happened? Was the mission successful? Sir. Our forces reported zero casualties amongst themselves, but the prisoners are in poor condition. Once they get here, 
We will need to transfer them to the hospital immediately. Okay. General Harding activated his radio. This is General Harding. Have a medical team on standby to receive injured once our heel arrives. He ended the transmission and faced the officer. Anything else? Sir, the Chinook suffered slight complications incurred after their escape. Slight complications? An arrow pierced one of the windows in the cabin and cracked it. The window shattered during transit while they were 15,000 feet in the air, causing rapid depressurization of the cabin. They managed to bring the Chinook to a lower altitude and they're currently en route to the space. Okay, good. Let me know once the Chinook arrives, General Harding said as he returned to the meeting. Ah, welcome back General, Ambassador Perry greeted. We were just talking about you. Oh, yes, I wanted to witness a demonstration of your military capabilities, if you will allow it. Legate Turbo Naparius requested. General Harding had planned for this, and had set up a viewing room for his guests and some of the members of his command. Of course. In a few hours my forces are going to be conducting a bombing run on a hostile enemy target. We have a theater set up in one of the recreational centers. There, we can view real-time footage of the events that are to take place. The Mechanese diplomat's interest grew further. This nation has real-time video capabilities. His own nation had just begun to commercialize video broadcasting technology via television. Unfortunately, the video quality for real-time broadcasts was subpar compared to the quality of pre-recorded footage. He wondered how much recording technology that the other worlders have figured out. Wonderful. I just finished my talks with Ambassador Perry here. Would you mind directing me to this theater? Of course. Prepare to be amazed, General Harding said. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 28, Show of Force Part 2 Author's Note New version of Chapter 1 is now out. I'm going to be changing some titles and military commands for the story. General Harding is an Air Force General, Master Sergeant Owens is a Lieutenant instead. Etc. Fort Washington, month 6, day 25, 1 11 p.m. And I thought your pancakes and bacon were good. This steak simply crushes them. What is this steak made of again? Legator, I am glad you asked, Ambassador Perry replied. Perry was indeed glad, since the Legator's interest in American food products presented yet another opportunity for trade. The meat that you have just eaten is called filet mignon and it is essentially a cut of beef from a cow's tenderloin. The seasoning is simple, since this is a military facility and not a renowned restaurant. The seasoning is a combination of various spices, including salt, pepper, rosemary, and garlic. How fascinating! The Mechanese diplomat sat there, spaced out. He was remembering the savory deliciousness of the meal. And these cows, are they plentiful on your world? Oh! Yes they very much are. Our country produces enough food for a billion people every year, even though our population is just slightly over 300 million. But Naparius' eyes widened. 300 million people in one nation alone? That essentially rivaled the population of the Divinian Empire, and also the lives lost during the ancient war. Of course not including the losses of any Axons. He wondered how many people there were on Earth in total. Wow! 300 million? How many people live on your planet in total? Around 7.5 billion, and I believe we might hit 8 billion sometime in the near future. But Naparius remembered the documents he read on America and Earth. Earth was smaller than his own planet, implying that Earth was indeed crowded. What would happen if those billions decided to invade his world and colonize it? He wanted to shudder at the thought, but restrained himself. Instead, he merely showed his surprise toward the extensive number. Is that so? Yeah, it sure is. I'm certain you can deduce the kinds of problems that have surfaced among my people because of such overpopulation. I suppose that whatever territorial disputes and conflicts over resources here do not compare to what has happened to your people. Yeah, you could say that. Say, does agricultural magic exist on this world? My nation produces more than enough food for our citizens. But I'd like to help out other countries in our world that have food shortages. How interesting. On gay era, nations would normally fend for themselves, only communicating with other nations for trade or political purposes, 
such as an alliance. There were no examples of anyone providing aid to other nations for free, except for the Quad Republic, but that was truly an exception. They fended off the Orc hordes at the expense of their own warriors, and they did so for the sake of the other civilizations' nations throughout the central continents. Obviously, it was in everyone's best interest to ensure that the Quad Republic does not fall. Considering these thoughts, Bonaparius revised his next question. Suddenly, a man walked up to them. Legator. The man gave a slight nod. Jean. Bonaparius glanced at him before looking back to Perry. Perry, this is 3rd Commander Jean Danius, one of my assistants. Partner, Jean corrected. He then turned to Perry. Ambassador Perry, please forgive Preon if he has not displayed proper etiquette during his stay here. Oh don't worry. It is good to meet you. Commander Danius. Perry pronounced the name carefully, wondering why it sounded familiar. In fact, the culture of the Mechanese were all very familiar. He had spent some time in France and Italy during his pre-portal days. Bonaparte. Jean. Damir. Legator. It seems like the Mechanese language was based on French culture at the very least. Their titles and names did seem Italian, but not quite. If anything, he guessed that it might be Latin. Realizing his train of thought was distracting him from his guests, he pushed the theories aside. Such speculation was more suited for Dr. Jones anyway. Likewise, Jean replied, So, what can you tell me of your military? I'm not the most informed when it comes to our weapons and strategies, but I suppose I can give you a rundown of what you might expect to see today. Across the room, nine people walked in. Four were from Alpha Team, Major Doniger. Captain Owens, Dr. Jones, and Calmethus. The rest were from the newly created Bravo team, Captain Williams, Sergeant Yu, Sergeant Gutierrez, Lieutenant Hayes, and a new member from the Sonaran Federation, Aran Mithis. They walked in, chatting and congratulating Doniger, Owens, and Williams on their respective promotions. So you finally got your own command, Williams, Doniger pointed out. Yeah? Sir, I don't think I'll be getting the missions you'll be getting though, Ryan answered. Major Doniger smiled. Well, I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's a big planet. Besides, I hear that Bravo Team is getting an assignment with the local adventurers guild in one of the northern Sonaran cities. Rumor has it you'll be doing some quests in order to collect some rewards that our nerds can study. Ryan's eyes widened as he lit up at the prospect of going on a real-life quest. Oh my god. He turned to his team grinning like an idiot. Oh calm down, you geek, Sarah said, hesitating before adding sir to the end of her remark. Lieutenant Hayes, you've got to learn some culture. Alex defended his commanding officer. See, Alex gets it, Ryan said. I did a few quests recently, actually. Last year, right after I graduated from Master Kell's Academy, Aran Mythos added, they were low-level quests, but they were still good fun. You remember how we blasted those feral wyverns? Master Kel? Kelmethus nodded, smiling as he reminisced. Well anyway, my point is, as you people say, don't hit it until you've tried it. Aaron continued. Don't knock it till you've tried it, Aaron, you corrected. Right. Oh look, the lights are dimming. The lights in the theater began to dim as a voice crackled to life on the PA system. It requested that everyone take their seats and quiet as the feature film would begin within the next minute. Commander Jean Danius took his seat between Perry and Prion, his face emotionless. He heard stories of the might these otherworlders possessed, but until he saw it with his own eyes, he would remain doubtful and suspicious. The screen flashed to life, showing footage of a pristine mountain range and clear skies. A voiceover and caption identified the area as the Ovine Mountains, near the Amalan ruins. The scene remained unchanged. Displaying the beauty of this continent's nature is crisp 4K Ultra HD and 120 frames per second. Gene raised an eyebrow, straining his eyes as if he could not believe what he was seeing. He looked to his left, seeing Benaparius doing something similar. He wanted to speak to him, but out of courtesy for the other viewers, he kept his mouth shut and made a middle note to discuss this with him later. He returned his attention to the screen. Our target is this army down here. Located at the base of the mountain, the voiceover said as the scene switched to an aerial view of the opposing army. Jean was astonished. The quality of this reconnaissance far surpassed any picture that the Mechanese have ever taken. Their recon planes did a similar job, 
but nothing to the extent of the Americans. Shortly after displaying the army, the scene switched to a different aerial view of the army, which then zoomed out, showing the entire southern half of Yenif. How high would the camera have to be? Feeling like he was getting distracted, he redirected his attention toward the screen. And because of this geological data, our pilots will be targeting specific points along the mountain. The scene switched to a crisp picture of the mountain. Red circles identified the points the voiceover mentioned. Our white phosphorus deployments will disorient them and prevent them from escaping the ensuing rock slide. A couple people in the room mumbled a bit upon hearing this. Why, he could not guess. As he watched, he saw the scene change to a formation of planes with a larger version of his own nation's MB-29 Super Fortress bomber leading the formation. This one however, did not have any propellers for propulsion. It appeared to be using a set of four jet engine pairs, where the propellers are supposed to be. Leading the formation is a B-52 Stratofortress bomber, carrying a white phosphorus payload. Flanking it are two B-2 Spirit bombers, they each carry GBU-43 payloads, also known as the Massive Ordnance Air Blast. Ambassador Perry leaned over and whispered to him, Mother of all bombs. This unnerved Gene, since it made him think of his own country's king of bombs, the atomic bomb. It also made him think of the Divinion Empire's devastating Mana Bomb, which prompted the Heavenly Light Project in the first place. So far, American naming conventions when it came to their equipment was pretty straightforward. He calmed himself down thinking that because the weapon did not have nuclear or atomic in its name, it must be a conventional weapon. Well, he would find out in a bit. The bombing will commence in about 180 seconds, the voiceover explained as the scene panned out to display the distance between the American warplanes and Bracton's army. In the meantime, I'll be discussing the specs of our escorts, the F-15S. Gene lit up inside. This was something he was very interested in. He had heard rumors about the flying swords of the otherworlders, with many in his own country speculating them to be jet aircraft. Indeed, they had their own jets, but they were still early in development, with speeds up to Mach 1. One feat he heard that the otherworlders were able to accomplish was going faster than the speed of sound. To what extent, he hoped to find out. Our 12 escorts will make sure that hostile aircraft, particularly wyverns, don't get too close to our planes. Now, of course, we could just fly higher than the maximum altitude of the creatures, but our plan relies on precision. Our pilots will have a very low margin of error on this mission, so, they'll want to fly as low and slow as possible. After the bombers have delivered their payloads, our escorts will deploy theirs. CBU-87 cluster bombs. Each jet here is carrying 12 of these bombs, and each bomb has 202 bomblets. The fighters will not have the same restrictions as the bombers and thus will be performing their maneuver at a speed of just over Mach 2.5. Please hold. I've just received word that the Bracton Army has begun to deploy their aerial assets. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the show. Ovine Mountains, near Site Beta 1, 129 p.m. Heads up. Dragon's Lairs. We're gonna be shooting down some more dragons today. Major Griffin yelled. Sir, those are wyverns. A voice came over the network. It was none other than Griffin's best buddy, Captain Hawkins. Whatever, Hawkins. Let's just keep these lizards off the escorts and bombers. Griffin looked below and saw dozens of wyverns jumping into the air. To his surprise, there were less than a hundred wyverns total, but then again, he considered the very nature of this particular army. Wyverns were pretty rare and hard to come by, so much so that they weren't very accessible to some upstart outlaw nation. The situation could actually be compared to a modern third world nation owning fourth generation fighter aircraft. It would be hard, but doable. Unfortunately for Bracton's men, their hard work would have been for naught. As the commanding officer of four squadrons, Griffin directed his men to begin attacking the Wyverns. The advance FCS of the networked jets coordinated their missiles, each of the 48 missiles launched locking onto a separate target. To the comparatively primitive forces of the Bracton gang, this attack seemed like magic. Most of them could barely even see the small specks that represented the missiles, of course until it was too late. Boom. The first wave of missiles decimated half of the Bracton Air Corps. Despite this, Wyverns continued to launch into the air. The inexperienced officers of Bracton's inner circle had in fact little professional combat experience, 
having spent most of their campaigns subjugating enemies through fear and intimidation. Bracton himself stood outside his command tent, too awed by the spectacle to even give orders. He stared, speechless. It was only until his entire wyvern fleet was destroyed that he spoke, and even then it was only a mumble. What the fuck just happened? His army acted similarly all watching their comrades erupting into fireballs. Dark clouds of smoke were all that remained in the sky, as burning husks and dismembered wyvern pieces rained down from above. Some of Bracton's men had to raise their shields in order to protect themselves from large chunks of flesh. For an army built upon gory atrocities, they sure couldn't stomach experiencing a taste of their own medicine, evidenced by a number of units along the perimeter that deserted. Back in the command tent, Bracton gathered some of his officers and initiated a discussion. Someone here tell me what just happened. Bracton commanded, his face contorted in rage and disbelief. Boss, I, I think we must have angered one of them ancient dragons. Gitten hypothesized, slurring through his buck teeth. Gitten is one of Bracton's newer lieutenants, somehow earning his position through sheer luck in his various suicide missions. And what kind of dragon would have this attack? Ye dumb to bow, Beaven retorted. Unlike Gitten, Beaven earned his position through his strategic skill and cunning. Gitten picked his nose, trying to think of a reasonable reply. Hey, have you ever seen an ancient dragon? Beaven furrowed his brow and glared at Gitten. You absolute buffoon. Of all the tales of dragons, none have this kind of power. Bracton scratched his short beard, amused at the bickering between his lieutenants. Unfortunately for them, his amusement was not an immediate concern. After enjoying the dispute for a few seconds, he decided that they had gone far enough. Shut up. With everyone silent, they could all finally hear a mysterious sound, soft, but getting louder. Do you hear that? Gitten asked. We all do, you damn idiot. Beaven replied. A glare from Bracton prevented any further altercation between the two. The sound grew louder and Bracton brought his officers outside of the command tent. Look. Gitten pointed at a quickly dissipating formation of dark smoke. It broke apart, revealing a flying sword, much like the ones rumored to exist near a portal in the North Grendon Plains. Across the sky, more flying swords began to appear until finally, a flying wagon and two flying triangles appeared. That was some fine shooting fellas. Now let's give these poor SOBS an air show. Major Griffin announced. Upon his command. All pilots and his squadrons hit the afterburners on their aircraft, racing just above the ground. Griffin and his men executed a low pass, creating sonic booms above the Bracton encampment, before pulling up out of sight and reorganizing for a bombing run. Search up Sonic Boom Examples or SpaceX Rockets Sonic Boom on YouTube. At my ears, Beaven screamed. See, we just made some ancient dragons real mad. Look at their wind magic, Gitten yelled. He referred to the cones produced by the jets as they broke the sound barrier. They continued their remarks until they were eventually silenced by Bracton, who directed their attention to the enormous flying monsters overhead. Why aren't they breathing fire on us? Gitten asked just as the white phosphorus was deployed. Beaven attempted to conjure a witty reply, but couldn't as he began to choke his eyes burning. The area around them began to fill with smoke, thanks to a burning fire that engulfed the command tent. Beaven looked to Bracton as he fell to his knees, his vision deteriorating. Bracton was surrounded by a translucent blue shield. He wore a protective amulet that helped defend him against environmental hazards, such as toxic fumes and high heat. Bracton stood, watching his subordinates suffocate. He looked around. A few tents over, People seemed to be faring better. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that this area was relatively far from the fires, and so he deduced it was safer there. He walked, watching people around him die. Some were intelligent enough to realize his objective, and went to one of the safer areas. Suddenly, he heard two massive explosions. He frantically worked to identify the sources, finding two rising plumes of black smoke coming from the mountainside. Then, he heard a heart-sinking rumbling noise. No. He ran toward the wyvern stables, glad to see that it was mostly untouched by the dragon's fires. His steed uttered a noise as he approached. Undoubtedly, it was suffering from the effects of the toxic atmosphere around them. Come on boy, let's get out of here, Bracton ordered, untying the wyvern. He hopped on its back and fled as the mountain came crashing down on his men. Remembering the scene involving the other wyverns, he instructed his steed to fly low and slow, 
directing it toward a tree line. He didn't know how the metal dragons were able to detect their targets, but he assumed that it would be safer if he stayed away from the open skies. As his wyvern made its way to the tree line, he looked back, having heard the flying swords once more. Fortunately for him, they didn't seem to care about him, if they knew he was there at all. Instead, their focus was directed toward his army. The swords flew over the encampment, releasing things from their underbellies. Moments later, Bracton witnessed as his half-buried encampment erupted into bright explosions numbering in the thousands. He watched in despair as the power of the gods completely blanketed his army in a million bursts of light. Was this the power of the Sonaran's patron deity? Could they have established a pact with demons? His thoughts drifted for a few seconds before he realized that he most likely would never discover the origin of the metal dragons. As such, he turned his steed back into the forest vowing never again to anger the gods with his unscrupulous deeds. Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 29, Changing World A.N. If I get 15 votes on the chapter by Wednesday night, I'll release another chapter on Thursday. Fort Washington, Month 6, Day 25, 3 p.m. Third Commander Gene Danius swished the iced tea around his mouth before swallowing it. He sat together with Prion by Naparius in one of the lounges around the base, discussing the earlier screening of the Americans' bombing run. Prion, you must do anything you can to secure the support of these people. Jean said with unbreakable determination. He remembered how just a couple dozen aircraft were able to wipe out an entire army. He recalled the weapon they called White Phosphorus totally incapacitating their enemy while massive bombs called Moabs brought an entire mountain down upon the suffocating targets. Like them, these other worlders fought with maximum efficiency and lethality, except with far superior weapons and equipment. I agree, Jean. I saw it too. But why would they show us such a display of force? It is clear to me that this is a form of warship diplomacy, meant to intimidate us so that we are more compliant to whatever they demand. Prion shook his head slightly, fearful of making a diplomatic mistake that could have negative repercussions on his nation. Ah, I spoke with General Harding about this. He told me that his people are best reflected by sayings from their history. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Jean smiled. Finding great wisdom in the quote, essentially, they have achieved peace on their world through overwhelming power. They strive for friendship, but are never afraid to defend themselves and their allies. Still suspicious, Prion voiced his doubts, the tales of the defeated are suppressed by the voices of the victorious. Admiral Picardius, indeed, I would caution against trusting them outright. So far, the exchanges we've agreed upon have been quite reasonable. In fact, they're probably offering us more than we are to them. However, we still do not know of their true intentions. Their recent victories against the Nubian Empire could be seen as steps toward conquest. To be true, they were attacked first. Then for all we can be certain, they are fortunate to have such a reason to invade. That is a valid point, but consider what they've done to this Bracton army. So far, they have been generous to the Sonarans especially in regard to their defense alliance. We could benefit much from something like that. And, it would be in our best interest to keep the Americans from being swayed by the Divinions, should they ever consider involving themselves in the matters regarding the portal. Prion nodded in understanding. Jean's argument and the threat of the Divinions convinced him to opt for a more open and friendly approach with the Americans. You are right. It has been 50 years since our last war with the Divinions. They still hold us in a negative light and it does seem that another war is looming over the horizon. Jean saw where Prion was going with this, and smiled internally, glad with his small victory. Helping Prion complete his thoughts, he added on, We need to be as prepared as possible for the next war. Their display of might through their combat livestream was, I believe, merely the tip of the root. I could see it in the eyes of General Harding, he is experienced in warfare. There are yet many secrets to be uncovered, and he is the keeper of them. Portal Hangar. Welcome to Gay Era, Captain Lamar. Major Henry Doniger greeted a striking blonde lady, a new transfer from Cheyenne Mountain. Why, 
Thank you, Major. It's nice to finally meet the famous hero who fought off hordes of monsters and even a dragon. Captain Emmy Lamar smiled, further captivating Donager. Henry stared into her beautiful blue eyes for a bit too long before he realized what he was doing. No, I cannot do this. There is no fraternizing in the military. He thought to himself, thankfully. Emma only giggled. Trying to regain his composure after this slight embarrassment, he began again. Sorry, Captain. Please, follow me to General Harding's office so you can be debriefed. Emma nodded, asking some questions as they walked to their destination. So, I hear magic really does exist. I've been told by some scientist at Area 51 that it's a new force in this universe, separate from the four fundamental ones we already know about. Henry instantly became nervous. Obviously, this woman was much smarter than he was, and currently he struggled to remember any bit of information from the academy that he could. Yeah, magic is real. I've even got a magic user on my team, Kelmethis. We sometimes call him Kel for short, but that's usually reserved for Dr. Tesla and Dr. Oppenheimer. Henry found the perfect escape from his situation. If you want, you can probably ask Kel about magic, he's a master wizard in the Sonaran Federation. Or you can talk to the docs. Emma's eyes lit up at the prospect, no longer would she have to study magic in some secret lab on Earth. Now, at the very least, she could interact with real magic users. Thanks, yeah I'll do that, she said. So, what do you think of the base so far? Henry asked. Pretty impressive considering it has been a month since it first started construction. She answered, looking out the window. Outside, additional hangars and research facilities were being constructed, while a section of the main structure was being upgraded for more living quarters. Yeah, we also have a few civilian buildings in the works, infrastructure for trade and research. They're gonna build a bunch of warehouses for the goods that are eventually gonna be shipped through the portal. All this stuff was built pretty quickly, huh? Emma commented. Yeah. The worker bots Lockheed made with the remains of that crashed alien ship back in 95 were a big part of that. Oh speaking of aliens, I was looking through some of the stuff brought back from Site Beta 1. I was able to conduct some scans of the N25 pistol, and I think we might be able to manufacture them. Now, it was Henry's turn to get excited. Doing his best to suppress his delight, he gave a grin before reducing it to a mere smile. When do you think we'll be able to crank them out? Well. I said might, she said, emphasizing the word. But, assuming we learn more about magic and more about whatever ancient technology is stored at Beta 1, I'd say maybe less than a month or so. This seemed like a reasonable deadline. The US military would want to be able to manufacture these as quickly as possible, so they could build a stockpile and then distribute it once enough units are made. And now, though, Henry was content with the N25 units that his team and fellow airmen around the base would be getting. As he thought of a reply, he suddenly realized they had reached their destination. Well, it was nice hearing that news. He knocked on the door, hearing a come in. That prompted him to open it. After you, Captain. Once inside the office, General Harding greeted them and dived straight into business. Captain Lamar. I've requested you here because of your exceptional abilities regarding reverse engineering new technologies and implementing them. On one occasion, you even saved your entire facility by figuring out how to disable that alien self-destruct in what, three hours? General Harding raised an eyebrow, impressed at the feats accomplished by this lady. Well, I'm sure anyone else in the research labs could have done it as well. We all spent a lot of time on Project Pioneer. Captain Lamar modestly deflected. Regardless, it was because of your actions here that you were promoted from lieutenant to captain. I have high hopes for you, Captain Lamar, and that is why I am placing you under the command of Major Doniger. Henry's facial expression changed ever so slightly before he regained control and silenced his shock. Sir, she's joining Alpha Team? Correct. I understand that you and your team have already run into numerous advanced artifacts in Site Beta 1. I reckon this won't be the last time this happens, especially not after the database we found down there. The two junior officers remained silent. General Harding, seeking to avoid awkward silence, continued. The database contained the locations of five additional outposts on this continent alone, with nearly 30 worldwide. Some of these outposts may contain caches of weapons, vehicles, and other technologies. The closest one to us is located in Nabian territory, 
near a waterfall called Nobu Falls. According to the description in the database, this outpost was mainly for weapons. It served as an early warning platform for incoming threats, and housed various defensive systems such as PDB-3 batteries, drone swarms, and DOT. Of course, Site Beta-1 has them as well but it seems that its previous occupants left with most of their weapons and gear, obvious by the lack of vehicles in the hangars. Well anyway, I want Alpha Team to check out this outpost. I'm scheduling this mission for tomorrow at 0810 hours. You'll be inserted via Pavehawk, right after the leaflet drops happen. This way, most of Nubia will be occupied with the mass amounts of paper fluttering around rather than your mission. Oh and try to avoid encounters with any Nubian forces along the way, but in the event you run into some, just radio for assistance. I'll have an Osprey with some Marines on standby should you need an evac. Yes, sir, the two officers said, saluting. Once they exited the room, Henry asked, ever worked in the field before? Yeah, actually, Emma replied, trying to remember the details of her most recent mission. It was a forest in Oregon. We were investigating anomalous energy signatures, and we ran into some robots. They were guarding some sort of crashed vessel, and they've apparently been there for a while now. We traced some disappearances in the area to these robots, dating as far back as the early 1900s. Turns out, the robots were on a strict defensive program. Her eyes suddenly became watery, her breathing slowly becoming irregular. When we ran into them, they were in like a sleep mode. I guess to save energy. We accidentally activated them when we got too close. I, I lost my commanding officer that day, Captain Nick Mackay, and one of my close friends, Lieutenant Joseph Evans. They were in front when the robots activated. I, Emma faltered. I should have said something. Henry looked at her, sympathetic to her plight. It's not your fault, Emma, he said. There was no way you could have known. Emma turned to her side and brought her arm up to her face wiping a set of tears that streamed down her cheeks. I wish I could have done something, but... Henry waited for her to continue. But the robots killed them with a self-destruct sequence. There was nothing left of them. I try to let my work distract me. I try to tell myself that I'm fortunate and honored, working with alien tech and all that. Ha ha. Emma looked up to Henry with a sad smile, which Henry reciprocated. Well, Henry said. You can now look forward to working with magic. There are some real miracles that can happen around here, like when Kel first healed some of our wounded after the time the Nubians attacked our base here. If only these people could heal mental wounds. We are all capable of doing that ourselves. I used to hate myself over a particular botched mission from my past. Sometimes I still get bad dreams about it, but they've been getting better. You know, now that I think about it. I probably wouldn't be here if I had never experienced that mission. Oh, Emma tilted her head slightly, the gears in her head working to figure out the mystery behind Major Doniger's statement. Noticing Emma's confusion, Henry continued. Normally, I wouldn't have been qualified for this, but I picked up a few things along the way, as I fought my way out of enemy territory. Had to do things not too many people would be fond of, just to survive. Henry saw a flash of his memories as he said that, a moment where he ripped the fingernails off a captured enemy soldier in order to secure intel. Emma nodded in understanding, seeing that her new commanding officer did not want to speak further of the topic. Suddenly, a man ran past them, yelling for the general. Wonder what's got him in a hurry, Emma remarked. Sir, the intelligence officer panted out, tired from his sprint. What happened? Lieutenant, report. Emperor Novus is missing. What? General Harding couldn't believe what he was hearing. His forces, working in tandem with the CIA, had placed numerous recording devices throughout the capital and royal castle during their assault on the city. They even had agents embedded within the royal staff, serving as cooks and cleaners. If the Emperor had gone somewhere, they would know. However, the contrary was evident. Sir, one of the CIA agents reported that the Emperor just went to his private chambers and then simply vanished. The agent was scheduled to serve him breakfast the next day, but when he entered, Novus was nowhere to be found. He couldn't have exited, since we have the corridor outside the room under 24-hour surveillance. General Harding sat there in deep thought, trying to make sense of the situation. That is concerning, he finally said. Despite this, I would still like to carry out our schedule for tomorrow. Keep monitoring the situation, 
and take some extra drones. I want the emperor found. Understood, sir. Ovine Forest. Getting stopped by a tree, catching his breath after escaping from that burning, toxic hellscape. Now, having had a sip of water, he allowed himself to relax and contemplate the occurrences of the past few hours. None of that was supposed to happen. He was lucky he had a plan for escape, and a protective charm to help him survive. However, that plan was meant for escaping a Sonaran raid or a futile battle against a Sonaran force. At least he would be able to tell epic tales of his escape from what was essentially a volcanic eruption. He smiled, thinking of how he could hyperbolize his heroics and relieved that he no longer had to play that silly act with a dumb attitude. Well, that was enough of that. He had to report the situation to his superiors first. They might not be happy about the events that have transpired, he thought, but they would definitely be glad to hear about this new intelligence. His original mission was to monitor the status of the Bracton gang, in order to account for them and plan appropriately for the conquest of their continent. Ianif. After the skirmish in the Ovine Mountains, he was able to convince Bracton to go on the offensive, they could strike while the Sonarans were busy scuffling with the Nubians. As a result, his objective changed, gauged the losses inflicted upon the Sonarans by the Bracton gang. All that got thrown out the window with today's bombing. He pulled out a peculiar device from his travel sack, about twice the size of a modern walkie-talkie. The configuration of the device was similar to a modern radio except without any way to adjust the frequency. Instead, runes adorn the surface of the device, numbered from left to right. Getten recalled his training, focusing his mana on the device. He called to the first four runes, and used them to tune the device to the frequency given by his commanding officer, 105.3. With the device now connected, he activated the fifth rune, enabling one-way communication. He began from the beginning detailing the disappearance of a raiding party. After they hadn't reported in for a day, another party was sent to investigate. Finding bodies riddled with bullet holes and metal fragments, the party immediately reported to Bracton. At the time, Bracton and his inner circle haven't yet heard a single thing regarding the portal in the North Grandin Plains. Cotton also knew nothing of the people who came through the portal, since communication with the Imperium was restricted to reports and orders. Knowing nothing of the Americans and the weapons they used, they assumed Sonarans killed the raiding party, seeing that the transgression occurred on Sonaran territory. He was able to convince Bracton to attack the Sonaran Federation, ultimately leading to the massacre of his army. It was as if the demon Vesuv himself rose once again to smite mortal armies, he detailed. But, this was different. This was caused by men by the Otherworlders rumored to have established a base in the Grandin region. These men flew in planes, like the ones in Meccan and Davinia, but certainly more advanced than those of either nation. I know not if they have shields like the Davinian models, but they certainly carried greater firepower than the Davinian and Meccanese warplanes I've read of. These American warplanes truly do deserve the titles given to them by the locals, metal dragons. One large one was able to spew fire upon the encampment covering the entire area in poisonous gas and flames. Two others blew up the mountain, whose base we had established our camp, causing a disastrous rock slide. The smaller planes, their escorts, took at our wyvern forces as if they were mere target practice. We could not even see the enemy planes until the wyverns were annihilated. And then, the escorts exploded the air around them, going faster than I can imagine. Cotton began to falter. Some of the details too egregiously dark to coherently describe bodies, and burning men. Everyone around me choked to death, and as I ran, the escorts returned, dropping thousands of bombs that blanketed the entire camp. The entire camp. It. All the people turned into red. A man's arm hit me in the head as I ran from the camp, I still had blood on me. Cotton screamed, beginning to go mad from the carnage he witnessed. No. I can't do this anymore. Gittin pulled out a flintlock pistol and brought it under his chin. I came face to face with a D-demon. Gittin channeled mana into the weapon, priming it. And it exterminated a hundred thousand men without mercy. Gittin cast a flame spell in the ignition chamber. The powder stored in the chamber exploded, sending a metal ball through the barrel and into Gittin's head. The man dropped to the floor, a large hole where his chin used to be. He knew fighting demons would be futile and he feared his fate should he fall in battle against them. His superiors on the other hand, did not share the same fear, 
as they were confident in their abilities even against a possible altercation with the Mechanese or Divinians. Their counter to this fear, ignorance. Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 30, Changing World Part 2 Authors note, thank you all for over 20 votes in just 2 days on Chapter 29. As promised, here is Chapter 30. Soon, I'll be setting up a Patreon for those who wish to read more, so stay tuned for that. Nabian Capital City, Knock. Month 6, Day 26, 7.58 AM Opening her eyes, Lano saw the sunlight streaming in through the bedroom window. Morning time. She stretched, allowing herself to wake up after a comfortable night of rest. When she finally got out of bed, she walked toward the window and opened it. Outside was the same beautiful scene that she had awakened to for the past couple of years, excluding the numerous scaffolds that dotted the cityscape. Reconstruction started but a few days ago, and it will be lengthy, but the city will be restored to its former glory. Lano smiled knowing that her city survived such a grave assault on their homeland, but it faltered when she began thinking about the future security of her home. Her thoughts were interrupted by a droning noise, unnational in every sense. She had never heard of such noise in her life. Well, she heard it once, several days ago when the metal dragons came. Looking up, she discovered the source of the noise, a massive metal dragon. As it lumbered overhead, she feared the worst. The last time metal aircraft had intruded on their fair city, no one had a means to fight back, their wyverns were immediately shot out of the sky by exploding arrows and their ground forces simply could not shoot that high up. This time, they had no defenses, although it could be said that nothing has changed, since the Nabian defenses were useless during the first assault. Additionally, the metal dragons in the first attack targeted only military targets, including walls, forts, and forges. There was no other target for the second attack aside from civilian ones. As it flew toward her, she closed her eyes, making her final prayers to Lunara. After a while, nothing happened, and so she opened her eyes. Once again watching the metal dragon, she saw that it just continued in its previous direction. What was it doing? Finally, it acted, dropping a small dark object, which she could barely make out with her bare eyes. What could it be? Following it, she realized that this small speck was a weapon of some kind, meant to drop from the sky and onto the ground below. But this one didn't explode, rather it exploded into paper. The paper that was released came fluttering down, landing in the city by the thousands. To her, this was shocking, since paper was decently expensive, even when purchased from the Mechanese. When compared to Mechanese paper, the paper delivered by the Metal Dragon amounted to nearly 200 Novix worth. This money, it's enough to last two peasant families for a year each. How powerful was this nation, such that they could toss away 200 Novix worth of paper at the enemy? Well, evidently this nation was powerful enough to ravage the defenses of her city and fly over them without a care for their wyvern fleet. She walked outside to grab one of the flyers. Exquisitely printed on it was a message from Prince Lonadnovus himself. He hasn't been heard from in years. Excited to see the beloved prince was in fact alive. She read the message. To my Nubian brothers and sisters, I, Prince Lonadnovus of the royal family, hereby declare my return to my subjects. For years, I have been silenced by my father the emperor for my reformist views. In order to maintain his dominion over my subjects, he imprisoned me, and for years I remained in a dungeon. Blessed be my fortune, my prayers to Lunara were answered, and she has granted me my escape through a third party. The Americans. The Americans are people who come from the portal, you may have called them the Otherworlders. These were the same people who attacked our defenses, but do not worry, for this attack was designed as a message to my father. All of the death that has plagued us these past couple of months leads back to the current emperor who, in his irrationality, awakened the sleeping dragon. No, even this comparison cannot speak for the wrath he has incurred. In fact, he has awakened the sleeping dragon slayers for he attacked a force far more powerful than any army or epic beast we have yet seen. And yet, these Americans are willing to show mercy, and even kindness. If we cease our quarrels with them, they will open up some of their technologies to us. Even now, 
the Sonarin Federation reaps the benefits provided to them by the Americans. They have mechanical carriages, faster and more comfortable than those produced by Meccan. They have the power to cool rooms during hot summers, and to freeze food for storage. For wars that are useless to us, they pay generously. Against any threat, they will grant us protection. No longer shall we live in the squalor that my father has degraded our society to. No longer shall we fear attacks from beasts and monsters. No longer shall our people suffer. We Nubians are on the precipice of a great change. With the grievances I've listed in consideration, what say you all to the rule of my father? Will you write yourself into the pages of history? signifying yourself as the people who brought Nubia into the future? Or will you remain, and rot along with those who cling to crumbling ideas? In one week, American diplomats will arrive at each of our major cities. We will not force people to join us, but it will be beneficial to do so. To betterment, to reformation. She paused for a moment. What if all this was an elaborate hoax developed by the invaders? Any doubts La Noah may have had were immediately silenced by the seal next to the prince's signature. It was genuine, and only the prince himself could have had access to it. She grinned, and so did many others throughout the city. The famous prince is returning, and the war-hungry emperor will be dethroned. The path to reformation has been laid out. Those who seek it will prosper, while those who do not will fade into dust. SB1 Outpost Alpha With the help of Kalmethus and Dr. Jones, the Black Hawk touched down quietly, with the only sounds coming from the rustling of leaves as they were blown away by the powerful gales emanating from the helicopter's blades. Alpha Team, now consisting of Major Doniger, Captain Lamar, Captain Owens, Kalmethus, and Dr. Jones, disembarked from the helicopter, which then took off. There weren't any Nubian patrols on the sensors or imaging equipment as of yesterday, but they couldn't be too careful. As such, Alpha Team scrambled to some nearby foliage in order to conceal themselves as they worked their way toward the Homagus outpost. Of course, the name was tentative, but since there weren't any good ideas in the science department, nor any records in the Site Beta 1 database, the higher ups went with Homagus after Homo Magus Sapiens. The outpost, approximately one mile from the designated drop-off point, was hidden in the forest, many miles away from the nearest settlement or base. As they walked, Dr. Jones described his adventures in the Amazon rainforest. These forests here are nothing like the ones in South America, I tell you. Down there, I had to worry about creatures that haven't even been documented yet. Jones looked around. Well, I guess it's the same case here but the circumstances were different back then. Anyway, the humidity and heat were enough to kill ya. Just imagine how much harder it was for me, traveling alone, cutting through the densest brush while making certain not to accidentally step on a venomous snake or awaken a supposedly extinct beast. I'm glad it's much simpler here. Reminds me of my exploits through European forests, searching for hidden Nazi caches of treasure. Did you ever run into Nazis? Emma asked. Why? Yes I did, Jones exclaimed. Immediately after his outburst, a arrow flew past his face, lodging itself into a tree to his left. Get down, Henry yelled as more arrows came flying toward them. Working as quickly as they could, Kalmethus and Jones created a shield to intercept the second volley before it hit. The arrows bounced harmlessly off the shield, narrowly missing their targets. With wide eyes, Emma muttered, thanks. You're not gonna die in your first mission. Lamar, Henry affirmed, leading Alpha Team back the way they came, in a tactical retreat. Thankfully, deflecting arrows was much simpler and easier than deflecting bullets. Consequently, the two magic users in Alpha Team didn't break any sweat as they retreated. Why aren't you shooting? Kalmethus questioned his team members who were holding guns. Oh, I assume we couldn't shoot through the shield, Henry admitted. Come to think of it. Who would have guessed? Most shields in science fiction were two-way. Nothing penetrates in, and nothing shoots out. Testing to see if Kalmethus claims were indeed correct, Henry fired a blast from his N25 pistol at the lowest setting. Sure enough, the bolt went through the shield. Seeing the confirmation with his own eyes, he gave the order to Emma and Ron to begin firing back at the enemy. It's hard to see them. Emma yelled as she eliminated three archers with her P90. The shield really messes with our target acquisition, Ron affirmed, despite having netted six kills already. Noticing the attack patterns of the Nubian archers, Henry realized that they were beginning to adjust their tactics. The men he's killed so far were not wearing armor, instead, 
they wore some sort of camouflage that allowed them to blend in with their surroundings. They would fire a volley, then pull back into the trees in order to ready their next volley. This strategy made it hard for Alpha Team to determine how many hostiles were out there. So, Henry turned to Dr. Jones and Kelmethus. Is there anything you can do in order to locate the Nebians? Kelmethus shook his head. He knew of no such magic, and if it even existed, it would most likely be the Divinions who could perform it. Jones, on the other hand, simply stared to Henry. It looked as if he was thinking, but Jones was in fact communicating with Omnis. Hold on, I think I might have a way. Jones said. Omnis has a database of spells he has encountered in the past. One of them is a pulse spell, which will send energy toward hostile attackers and wrap them in an orange light. Okay, do it. Okay, Kel, do you mind holding the shield for a bit? Jones asked Kelmethus. You are fortunate we are only defending against arrows and the occasional lightning attack, he said before complying. Go. With his concentration now free for other tasks. Jones began his spell casting. Using the scepter of Axneel, he created a circle of energy above himself, like a ring. Then, he placed his staff in the center, and allowed Omnis to complete the remaining tasks. A beam of light shot out from Omnis, stopping just above the ring and dispersing energy to the ring, which slowly grew in size. Once the ring had grown to an optimal configuration, Jones chanted something in an unknown, ancient language. The spell finished and the ring of energy pulsed outward, harmlessly passing through Alpha Team and the shield. After a few seconds, they began to see outlines of human bodies in the forest, highlighted by a mysterious glow. Henry remarked upon this, having seen something similar in the past. Huh, looks like a vision pulse from Call of Duty. Henry said, astonished. He then looked over to the rest of his team, who all shared the same stupefied look on his face, but for different reasons. Ron Owens was most likely surprised because of the military applications, Emil Amar because of the scientific impossibility of it, Jones because it actually worked, and Kelmethus because he had never seen such a spell before. All right, Henry said after merely a second, let's get to work. We can do some more testing once we get back to the base. Now, the hunters have become the hunted as the Nabian forces who sought Alpha Team have become the prey. It could be said that prey aren't truly defenseless, for many animals possess various defense mechanisms, such as camouflage or hardened exteriors. Although predators have evolved certain features, such as keen, forward-facing eyes and a heightened sense of smell, they are sometimes fooled by the prey. Today, in this scenario, none of this was the case. With the Nabian soldiers marked for Alpha Team to see, it was as if they were playing a video game with all of the hacks turned on. Tatata shots rang out from the trees, hitting their targets through visual obstacles such as bushes. It was already bad enough that the Nibians had to fight an uphill battle, against guns while they only had bows and arrows. They weren't climbing a hill anymore, this time they were climbing Mount Everest with their bare hands and no provisions. It was impossible, and thus they retreated. My, they run fast, Kelmethus said tiring out. I'm getting too old for this. He managed between breaths. As they continued to run, they saw the Nabian force regroup about 100 meters ahead, their individual energy signatures all clumping up in what appeared to be a chamber. Of course, there was no way to be certain since Alpha Team could essentially see them through walls. They could be behind a patch of dense vegetation, or behind their fortress. Suddenly, all of the energy signatures disappeared, causing Henry to put his hand up signaling everyone to stop. Panting, he asked, did it run out? Like with video games, he assumed this ability had a time limit. No, Jones answered. It wasn't supposed to run out for another 10 minutes. Maybe it doesn't work like it's supposed to since this is the first time you're using the spell, Kelmethus suggested. No. Something else happened, Jones said as he looked around. Eventually, he looked down and found the energy signatures below the ground. Hey guys. Henry turned and saw Jones looking at something on the ground. Following his gaze, he as well saw the energy signatures. What the hell? There's no way the Nibians have elevators, right? Emma asked. Let's go investigate. Upon arriving at the location where the Nibians used to be, they found a metal platform, circular in design. It looked like an odd mix between the floor of a Star Trek transporter room and a Stargaring transporter. Noticing this, Henry suggested, let's stand on it. Seeing no better alternatives, 
Everyone else shrugged and agreed. Calmethus and Jones readied themselves. They might need to create a shield the moment they get to the facility below. Nothing is happening, Ron pointed out. Yes, I can see that. Henry looked around again. Maybe there was some device that activated the machine, like a console or switch. There. The other members of Alpha Team turned around and looked to him in confusion, then followed his finger. He was pointing at a console covered by greenery. The lower portion of the silvery device entangled in roots. This device was clearly of Homagus design, and thus everyone turned to Jones for answers. What? Jones asked. You know the most about Homagus tech. You can ask Comnus for answers, Ron said, his reply more straightforward than usual. Okay. Jones gripped his staff, reaching out to Omnus. Walk to the console. It will activate when you approach. Greater than. Sure enough. The device activated upon his approach, projecting holographic controls which were partially obscured by sun leaves. Jones pushes the leaves aside. Place me in the sphere. I will interface with the device. Greater than. Jones followed Omnis instructions and slowly maneuvered his scepter into the hologram, placing the scepter's crystal in the blue sphere that hovered above the console. He waited for a few seconds, then the hologram disappeared. Jones began to say something. Then stopped when another voice spoke. I can now activate transporters remotely. I will tell you later how to use the transporters, for I believe your team wishes to proceed with their mission. Greater than. What's going on Dr. Jones? Emma asked. Ah, just talking to Omnis. Let's get on the platform. He can activate it remotely. Alpha team went to the platform once more. As soon as everyone was standing above it, Omnis glowed blue radiating light from his crystalline form in the scepter of Axneel. Alpha team shone as if their bodies became flashlights. This event occurred for a split second and was accompanied by the sound of space distorting around them, similar to the sounds produced by beaming technology in science fiction. Then, they vanished. Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 31 Changing World Part 3 Site Beta 1 Outpost Alpha Henry immediately had his weapon ready when he beamed down. Unfortunately, he had some disorientation due to the beaming process. Of course, nothing was wrong with the technology. Rather, the blinding light and sudden environmental shift were the culprits. He made a mental note to close his eyes before beaming and then reopening them once he heard the audio cue of the beaming's completion. He then looked around. The design and architecture of the whole place was consistent with those of Site Beta 1. Scanning the room, he found no hostile elements. Perhaps they had gone toward their base of operations in order to report to their superiors. Once he was certain the area was clear, he went back to his team all of whom but one were resting on crates. Everyone okay? Henry asked. Just a little dizzy, Emma replied. Ha ha, woo. That was a rush, Dr. Jones said ecstatically. He was the only one not resting on a crate. Ron and Kelmethus replied with standard yes, very contrasting compared to Jones's excitement. All right, let's keep moving. Our objective is to figure out just what the hell is going on here. Jones, make sure to renew the spell once it runs out. And now. Let's follow those other guys. Looks like they're up ahead in a room of some sort. Maintain stealth. Only engage when I give the signal, Henry ordered. We should be wary. They might know we are here. If they were able to figure out how to use the transporter and how to turn on the lights, they may have also figured out how to use the systems in this place. They may be tracking us using the internal sensors. Ron cautioned. Henry nodded and signaled everyone to move forward slowly. The highlighted Nubians from before were about 100 meters up ahead and to the right, Henry deduced, based on the sizes of their figures. Currently, they did not have to worry about any Nubians waiting in ambush, since they were walking down a brightly lit hallway, with the only entrances in front and behind. Taking advantage of this, Henry and his team moved as quickly as possible until they could reach the intersecting corridor ahead. It was a crossroads, with a door directly in front and two diverging paths, left and right. At this point, the highlighted Nubians were right in front of them. However, the lights revealing their location were quickly disappearing. When once they could see their entire outlines, now they could only see a small glow, 
each representing one Nubian. The fading lights showed a few men in the room directly ahead, with many more behind. Or rather, it might have been a large chamber, seeing that most of the Homagus building sections were incredibly vast, with smaller rooms in each chamber. If it was truly a large chamber, then that meant almost 30 men were in there, ready to hold the choke point that was the doorway. They could probably throw flashbangs inside, but it wouldn't be effective enough to neutralize all of the men in the chamber. They could also try combining this with a shield or other magical spells from the two wizards on Alpha Team, but there could be enemy wizards on the other side as well. They needed another way to neutralize them, or more men. 29 tangos right in front of us. How are we gonna approach this? Sir? Ron asked. Henry looked over to Jones and Kelmethus. Do you two know of any way to neutralize all the men in there? Kelmethus stroked his magnificent, gray beard for a moment. Jones simply stood still and stared into nothing, perhaps communicating with Omnis. After pondering for a few seconds, both came up with a resounding awe, signifying that they've come up with ideas. You first, Kelmethus. Dr. Jones offered. Kelmethus nodded and began his explanation. I've been studying your ways for quite some time now, particularly your flashbangs and explosives. After our battle with the epic dragon, I experimented with flash spells. I can summon a flare in the chamber in order to temporarily blind them, as well as an explosion to deal damage and disorient them. Once my flash boom spell is complete, I will summon a cold gale into the room and we can push in with a shield around us. Henry contemplated this plan. This flash boom of his could potentially work, but what if there were wizards in there who have learned how to counter flashbangs? The US used enough flashbangs on Nubian warriors that at this point, their wizards must have figured out how to create a defense against them. Though, the cold wind could help throw off wizards who are expecting a flashbang. He then turned to Jones wanting to hear his idea. I was thinking of summoning some golems and letting them do the work for us. Don't you need some material to make a golem? Emma asked. I've read reports on the Battle of Fort Washington, and the enemy mages summon dirt golems from the environment around them. Well, I thought about that and I came up with a workaround, with the help of Omnis. There are many things in our environment that we can use. For example, we can make golems out of the walls. But I'd rather not exert myself trying to dismantle Homagus engineering. Instead, we can use the air. Omnis. That's the guy in the crystal. Emma tried to remember what she'd read. She still couldn't wrap her head around that. Yeah. Dr. Jones, I don't mean to be critical, but how are our golems gonna help us fight the bad guys? Henry asked. Ah, I was just getting to that. Now, Consider the force shield. I can create a force shield golem by summoning a shield around a pocket of air, like this. Jones created a force shield golem, humanoid in shape, but twice as large as a human. I could further shrink this golem, compressing the air inside, and on my command, the shield will disappear and send everyone inside flying. Once more, Henry pondered another possible avenue for their breaching and clearing operation. The two plans could potentially be combined for a more effective one. Okay, I think I've got it. First, I want Kelmethus to use his flash boom spell once we open that door. Kel, you're gonna have a very small window to cast your spell. Once we open that door, everyone on the other side will be ready to strike. Second, the flash boom has gone off. I want Dr. Jones to send in the suicide golem. On his signal, we push in with a force shield around us and pick off the stragglers. Lamar, Owens, you're with me. As soon as he finished relaying his orders, the lights that were detailing the enemy positions disappeared. Henry looked over to Jones. Can you renew the spell? They're gonna know we're here, Jones replied. Henry thought about it for a moment. On one hand, they will reveal their position to the entire complex, and there was no telling how many hostiles might rush to their position once they're hit with the scanning pulse. On the other hand, it could tell them exactly how many more Nubians were stationed here, and of the situation in the other room. Eventually, they're going to need the pulse, so Henry decided Jones might as well conduct his spell now. Okay, do it. Once more, a pulse of energy emitted from the scepter of Axneel 
passing through the walls of the facility and encapsulating the Nabian troops in light. On three, Henry moved his hand over the pad as the rest of his team positioned themselves on opposite sides of the door. 1. Kalmethus began his incantations. 2. Joan summoned the force shield golem and began compressing it. 3. Henry slid his hand downward, opening the door. The door slid open, and the atmosphere became tense. Nothing came out from the other side. No spells, no crossbow bolts. The Nabians waited for someone to peek out from behind the door. With his spell now ready, Kalmethus quickly peeked the door and aimed his staff into the chamber. Unfortunately for the Nabians, their reflexes couldn't catch up with those of an old man, thanks to a speed spell. Immediately, after Kalmethus withdrew to the safety of the hallway a bright light engulfed the room. It was so bright that it outshined the lights in the hallway. Following the burst of light was a burst of sound caused by a combination of vacuum knowledge and magic. Unlike the Nubian warriors, Alpha Team prepared for this. Boom! A voice shouted from the Nubian side of the room. It seems that the Nubians did in fact find a way to defend themselves against flashbangs. Henry filed this information away into his mental notes. Working with expert precision, Jones then sent in the suicide golem which ran into the center of the room and burst open. Pop! The gust of wind sent the Nubian warriors inside flying, many of them making contact with the walls, creating numerous thud sounds. On the other side of the door, Alpha Team felt the wind as the room depressurized. Even though it was short, at just above shoulder length, Emma's hair went flying and smacked into Henry, who was behind her. Brushing it off, Henry gave the order to move in. Go! Kalmethus and Jones took point holding up Alpha Team's shield. Henry, Ron, and Emma quickly followed behind, scanning the room for any target still standing. As they looked around the room, they saw blood splattered over the walls, with the broken bodies of Nabian warriors below each respective blood stain. My god, that air burst golem worked a bit too well, Emma muttered, surveying the gruesome damage. Indeed, the effects of having thousands of cubic feet worth of air compressed into a small vessel were devastating. If shield compression was this destructive, Emma wondered what it could do to a person inside of a shield, or even a planet. She shuddered merely thinking about it. After checking the bodies, they discovered that no one survived the attack. Having cleared the chamber, they looked around. It was quite similar in design to Section 2 of Site Beta 1. It was a control room. They continued into the chamber toward the next batch of highlighted foes. There were ten of them, rushing to the chamber in order to reinforce their allies. Unfortunately for them, Alpha Team knew exactly where they were coming from. Taking up a position behind a control table, Alpha Team waited for the Nubians to arrive. Despite being equipped with the best armor produced by Nubian forges, the warriors were quickly turned into Swiss cheese by the otherworldly weapons. Da -da 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 -da. Alpha Team's combined fire of P90S. N25 bolts, and ice projectile spells made quick work of all but one. How? The survivor muttered as he fell to the floor, bullet holes throughout his breastplate. The survivor couldn't imagine how pathetic his last battle was. As a guard to the Emperor himself, he was supposed to lay down his life for Emperor Novus. However, he never imagined it to be like this. It was as if an epic dragon was after the Emperor and he was sent to his certain death in order to slow the beast down. The survivor then realized that someone was standing above him. The bearded man had an object aimed at him. No, it wasn't one of those black objects that spewed small metal arrows. This one looked different, and seemed as if it had lightning coursing through its mechanisms. Henry aimed his N25 energy pistol at the lone Nubian survivor. Why are you here? Seeing no response from the man, he pressed his boot onto the Nubian soldier's breastplate, specifically targeting his bullet wounds. At the soldiers screamed in pain. Talk. Henry commanded. I. Serve. To protect. The Emperor. He muttered before passing out. Henry turned back to his team. That must mean Emperor Novus is here. Somehow he escaped from our spies in his castle. We need to find him and capture him. I know our orders aren't to find him, but I know for damn sure they would be if the general knew our situation. No signal from our equipment. I guess it would be hard to penetrate all the layers of earth and rock above us. Emma added. Yeah. Okay, so we've got to continue deeper into this outpost. These guards came from this corridor, so I assume that the life signs up ahead are the Emperor and the remainder of his guard. Henry led Alpha Team toward the next group of highlighted foes. Their number's at 15. Alright, let's do what we did earlier. But if the Emperor is really in there, 
we need to try and take him alive. Jones, ease up on the airburst. Dr. Jones nodded and everyone got into position. On three. One. Two. Three. Henry slid his hand over the door's pad, but nothing happened. Instead of sliding open, the door gave a buzzing sound, as if their access was denied. Upon closer inspection, there was a sign above the door's pad, written in an unknown language. Jones? It's in Homagus. Omnis says the room is a research lab belonging to Omanis Lore. Authorized personnel only. If it's in Homagus, shouldn't our communication buff translate it? Henry asked Kalmethis. My communication spell can only work in the presence of a physical being or a knowledge base, such as a dictionary. It cannot translate a language based on one sign. Even magic has its limits. I see. Jones. Can you and Omnis find a way to access this door? Can't do that. We need a keycard. Jones paused for a second. Hold on, Omnis says there is a locker room through the second corridor. We have to go back to the chamber and get to that locker room. All right, let's all go. If these guys try to leave we'll see them anyway, Henry said, referring to Jones's vision pulse. Alpha team backtracked to section 2 and navigated toward the locker room. The door to this room was not locked and the team began searching for the keycard. I found Manus Lore's locker, Ron announced. Alpha team crowded around him as he sifted through the ancient scientist's personal effects. After discovering a picture of the scientist's family, he remarked upon the picture's pristine physical condition, despite being thousands of years old. Well, if they can make wormholes, I'm certain they can also preserve their stuff pretty well, Emma voiced her thoughts. After a few more seconds of searching, they discovered the keycard, located in the pocket of a lab coat. All right, let's get moving. We can come back to this stuff later. After returning to the lab, Henry ordered his team to prepare to breach. Okay, he said, holding the keycard in his hand. On three. One. Two. Three. Henry slid his hand down, making sure the keycard was in close proximity to the pad. The door slid open and Kelmethus cast his flash boom spell incapacitating those inside. Jones sent in a less powerful version of his airburst golem, which only forced the Nubians inside to the ground. Having learned his lesson, Henry made sure to stand a bit further back, so this time he wasn't smacked in the face by Emma's hair. Go. Go. Like before, Alpha Team reached the room with their two wizards maintaining a force shield. They scanned the room and found many days Nubians on the ground, groaning. With the guards in an incapacitated state, Alpha team easily subdued them and rounded them up for questioning. None of them were the Emperor. One of the guards who was quick to recover would wish he hadn't, for Henry walked up to him as soon as he detected a viable candidate for interrogation. Holding his N25, he aimed it at the guard and spoke. Where's the Emperor? The guard smirked, as if Henry had already lost. Hehe. <laughs> He's not here. He was telling the truth. There were no more highlighted figures throughout the complex. I know he's not here. Where is he? You waste your time with meaningless talk. I know not where he is, only that he is not here. Henry looked visibly annoyed. He shot the man with his N25, using the lowest power setting and the Nubian fell to the floor, unconscious. Turning to his team, he ordered them to stay and watch the subdued Nubians. Jones. Let's go back to the surface and contact command. Lamar, look around this place. See if there's anything useful here. Emma smiled and nodded. Will do, sir. Henry and Dr. Jones walked back to Section 1, where the transporter was. Along the way, they discussed the implications of the Nubians in this outpost. Jones, what specifically was this outpost for? Dr. Jones remained silent for a few seconds, communicating with Omnis. Then, he spoke. Omnis says this outpost was one of three that were researching the gravitational anomalies of this planet. I haven't put much thought into it, but it is a bit weird how this planet is about twice the size of Earth, but the gravity is the same. Oh okay, Henry said, relieved. So that means there's nothing here the Nubians could have used as weapons. Mm, not exactly. As we now know, science can heavily modify magic and vice versa. This outpost had a lot of data on gravity. If the Nubians were able to figure some of it out, they may have been able to create new gravity spells. That could be bad news for some of our aircraft. Yeah, but at least they're not going to bring an asteroid down on us or anything. From what I've heard, it sounds like the Divinions might be able to do something like that, if they knew how, Henry said. Hey, 
Why don't we tell the general that we want to stay for a bit? I'm sure Emma and I could use some extra time studying this outpost. Okay, I'll forward the request, Henry said as they were transported back to the surface. Command, this is Alpha Team. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 32, America, Fort Washington Month 7, Day 1 Ambassador Perry and General Harding chatted in one of the lounges, each taking occasional sips from their drinks. I finished talks with the governor of Noak. The fortress city. They're the last to surrender. Perry sighed in relief, glad that the war is finally over. Yeah, seems like that propaganda really helped out the prince, although he probably could have done all this on his own, seeing how much those people love him. Ha ha, you should have come to the crowning ceremony at the Nubian capital earlier today, Prince Perry said before correcting himself. Emperor Lanadnovis gave an amazing speech about gradual democratization of their country. Looks like we can push them in the direction of Imperial Japan following World War II. I just hope Emperor Lanad doesn't grow too fond of his newfound power. I doubt it, but in any case, He's still unaware of most of our strategies and tactics. I think he will remain grateful for what we've done. Perry nodded, taking another sip from his Arizona green tea. He was silent for a moment before he suddenly remembered something. Speaking of gratitude, you'll never guess what he gifted us. The president's gonna go crazy over this. What? Is it all their magic research or something? Well, we already have an agreement for that. No. This is something even bigger, Perry said enthusiastically. What? Just spit it out already. On top of the trade agreements and military bases we get to build, they're giving us a literal ton of gold from the Imperial Treasury. General Harding's eyes widened. This would mean more funding for his missions and an incredible PR boost for his entire command. He wonders, would the president promote him to Major General for this? Probably not. But maybe he could get a nice pay boost and get his wife and kids a bigger house, maybe even get himself a new boat and grill. How much is it worth? 70 million, give or take. Oh, and that's not even the best part. What could possibly be better than that? General Harding asked. Perry smirked. John. General Harding did not want to remain in suspense. Well, he gave us a large section of the Nubian Northern Territories. It's about the size of California and was formerly known as the Essaith Kingdom. He told me that there were a lot of untapped resources up there, partly because of some monster lurking in the woods, but he gave up the land since he thought we'd be able to kill it. They call it a hydra. That thing with multiple heads, where you cut one off and two grow back. It appears so. General Harding frowned. The epic dragon they had slain over a week ago was troublesome for ground forces to deal with as it was essentially impervious to smaller caliber rounds. The only thing that saved Alpha Team was their access to unorthodox weapons, such as magic and advanced alien guns. He didn't want to send men to their doom. Hopefully, reconnaissance aircraft, satellites, or drones will be able to locate this new monster quickly. John Perry then pulled up the map from a tablet and outlined the territory with his finger. Here is the S8 Kingdom. The kingdom was situated below and to the right of a massive bay, the territories of the kingdom stretching to cover over a third of the bay's arc. The emperor is willing to give up access to the whole bay. Perry looked to his side. Well, he also mentioned a sea monster that likes to ravage the villages along the coast every now and again. He's only heard of it from stories and tales, but apparently it's called a kraken. Oh, and the one that likes to attack the Essex coastline is one of many that exist. General Harding shook his head. Are there any more catches? Any more surprises? The only other thing I can think of is that it borders the Eanif Imperium, which recently annexed a Beastia Alliance. The Essex territory has thus received a large influx of refugees. It won't be long before some of them find their way here. Beastia Alliance? Yes. A few of my teams were sent to this alliance to establish communications. They're safe now, don't worry. They're up in the Imperium trying to make contact with Imperium officials, but so far they've been experiencing irregularly long wait times. Anyway, the Beastie Alliance is an alliance of Beastmen Kingdoms, like the Cat Human Kingdom, the Bunny Human Kingdom, etc. Huh? Interesting. An airman walked up to them, 
announcing that the guests had arrived. General Harding filed this information for another time. He wondered if these beast people had special abilities related to their animal parts, like increased agility. Please see them in, Airman. The man nodded and led a group of people inside. Ah, King Celia's and Lady Sindus, welcome to Fort Washington, General Harding greeted. It is good to finally meet you in person. General Harding, I never truly expressed my gratitude for your pacification of the Nabian threat, for slaying the epic dragon, and for ridding us of the criminals along our southern borders. As the king of the Sonaran Federation and the spokesman for all its citizens, please accept my gift of gratitude. The king bowed slightly and one of his attendants came up, offering a scroll. The attendant spoke, I present the deed to the reclaimed Aracel province. He then pulled out a printed map one of the benefits the Sonarans enjoyed in their relationship with the Americans and explained the location of the Aracel province. It was a vast territory along the south of the continent of Ianif, stretching from Site Beta 1 down to the coast. It was easily thousands of square miles worth of territory and contain another Homagus outpost. The final two in Eanif were presumably in the Imperium's territory. General Harding looked to Ambassador Perry, shocked. Perry, sensing that his old buddy was speechless, stepped in. This was his area of expertise anyway, dealing with foreign relations. Thank you for this most gracious gift. Your Majesty, we humbly accept. President Keener will be very pleased to hear about these gains. Sure. There might be some tension with Russia and China when they hear about this, but the most they're going to do is criticize American imperialism. Excellent. Now, shall we begin? King Celius asked, referring to their scheduled tour. Of course. Right this way, he said, gesturing toward the lounge. We will be waiting for the Mechanis group. They will be here within the next few minutes. With everyone now seated, Ambassador Perry left the Sonarans with General Harding so he could go talk with Sarah Sindus. Sarah, he greeted with a smile. John, are you excited? Yes. I've been thinking about all those stories you've told me of magnificent glass towers as far as the eye can see and that food you called. Pizza? Pizza? Yeah, I know a good place in New York. You'll love it. Sarah tried to remember the circular alien delicacy from John's home. Yes, it was the same thing that had baffled her a few weeks ago when she first started talking with Ambassador Perry. She remembered seeing photos for the first time on John's phone, they were of excellent quality, far surpassing that of any realist painters within the whole continent of Ianif. Even after he explained everything, it still seemed like magic to Sarah. And speaking of magic, John, last time we talked you told me about Disneyland. I forgot to ask, but I thought magic didn't exist on your world. Ah, yeah. Magic doesn't exist on my world. But that's never stopped our imaginations. My people have always sought after the impossible. Without wyverns, we had no way of flying. So, we began experimenting with balloons. A hundred years after that, we learned to conquer the skies when the Wright brothers built their first plane. We put a man on the moon just half a century later. It won't be long before we learn how to conquer space. What is space? She tilted her head. John thought of a way to explain space in a way that can be understood by someone who has not even heard of a printing press. Consider the following. What is above the sky? Well. That would be the heavens. The domain of the gods. What else is up there? Sindas was confused, not seeing where John was going with this, but she answered anyway. The stars, the planets, the moon. Right, and how far away do you think they are? If she had encountered the Americans four years ago, she would have said that the stars are a part of the night sky, much like a painting. However, one of her friends from Academy pointed out a specific event that completely opened her eyes. Did you see how big the moon is tonight? Sisson asked. Yes. Can you explain why? Sindas thought about it, but couldn't think of anything. She shook her head in response. It is because the moon is closer to our world. Many within our nation would most likely believe that it means Lunara is blessing the Nubians. But this is merely something that happens every so often. How far away is it? Sindas asked her friend. I've heard that the moon is thousands of times the distance from Sonri's to Nock, and that all of the other celestial bodies are even further away. Sindas gave John her reply, to which he reacted with a raised eyebrow. John was pleasantly surprised at Sindas' knowledge. Space is the vast distance between this planet and the other bodies. It is so vast and empty that we merely call it space. But, 
you've already put a man on the moon. Doesn't that mean you have already conquered space? Compared to the other bodies, the moon is extremely close. Imagine that the length of the couch we are sitting on is the distance between this planet and your moon. The distance between this planet and the next planet in your solar system would be the length of this entire room. I'm not an astronomer or astrophysicist though so don't quote me on that. Scientists thought about it for a moment humbled by the vastness of space and the insignificance of her home. Her thoughts were interrupted by a group of people who entered the room. Seeing it was the Mechanese group, she went to greet them. King Celius got up to greet them too, and apparently he was well acquainted with the Mechanese diplomat. Ah, Brian, how are you? How is President Ducrelius? King Celius joyfully asked. I am doing well. Thank you. And I believe the president is just as excited as you are about this upcoming visit. Unfortunately, he's been very busy dealing with his constituents and the Divinions. They've been questioning our involvement with the portal and he's doing his best to prevent another war. In that case, do let him know that I hope for the best. I remember how destructive the last war was, when automatic projectile weapons were first introduced. One only need look at the Americans and their battles to see how devastating such firepower can be. Indeed, Legator von Napari's appearance darkened for a second before he spoke once more. Well, we should probably get going. Ambassador Perry is about to make an announcement. John stood in front of the two groups. May I please have your attention today? We will be embarking on a journey to an entirely new world, Earth. Please follow me, and I will explain some details along the way. Now, I assume many of you have never stepped through such a portal before. Well, it really doesn't feel any more different than stepping through a regular doorway. You walk in, then almost instantly, you're on the other side. It might take a while for your eyes to adjust to the environment on Earth. Since the portal happened to open in the middle of a scorching desert, you also may experience a bit of disorientation, but your body will adjust after a few minutes. We will be traveling by car, so don't worry about having to walk under the burning sun. Once we get to the base, we will provide a meal for you. Then, you'll be sent to learn about our customs and culture. After learning the basics, you will be flown to New York City. By the time we arrive at New York City, it will be nightfall. We will guide you to a hotel near Rockefeller Plaza and for dinner, we rented out a nearby restaurant that specializes in steaks. They arrived at a large garage with a set of black SUVs. The excited tourists from another world climbed into the vehicles. Comforted by the air conditioning, the passengers glued their faces to the windows as the environment began fading away behind them. The portal was just up ahead the road cutting off a minuscule distance from the tear in the fabric of space-time. The world became dark for a split second as they passed through its event horizon, and then, there was light. Somewhere in the S8 Kingdom, a man wearing a sleek suit of armor stood before a peculiar device. Made of alloys unknown to the gay Aaron native, the suit blended well with the dark environment of this hidden cave fortress. As he approached the device, it lit up. Connection established. A voice within the suit's helmet connected itself directly to the neural pathways of the man's brain, allowing a technologically created telepathic connection. A careful manipulation of fields using automated magical systems within the suit essentially eliminated the requirement for a telepathic wizard. Upon hearing the confirmation, the man grinned, his sinister nature pouring out of his emotional expression. Excellent. Now, we move on from testing to application. The device before him hummed and fired a concentrated burst of light into the night sky, easily phasing through the hundreds of meters of rock above. Outside, anything not attached to the soil hovered as gravity became distorted, then fell back down. Huh? Henry remarked as he and the rest of Alpha Team watched the beam of light shoot into space. Like lightning, it disappeared almost instantly, but one thing was certain, it was moving upward. Emma took note of this and when asked about it, could offer no scientific explanation. The only answer was provided by Calmethus, who assumed it was magic, but this merely spawned more questions. There are things relating to magic even I don't know, he said. Perhaps it was someone experimenting with a new type of magical attack, maybe a divinion? Well, whatever it is, we can check it out in the morning while we scout the area. The general wants to make sure this area is safe before we start building infrastructure here. Henry said, Here, help me set up this tent. You're not gonna sleep in the car? Emma asked. How often do we get to enjoy nature like this? The land here is pristine, 
virtually untouched by mankind. Suit yourself. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 33 New York City, Groom Lake, Nevada July 1, 2019 Sarah signed is looked around as the world turned dark, a weird display of distorted space drifting past as they continued through the wormhole. The two other Sonaran passengers, two of the King's aides, were similarly confused and curious about the transportation. As soon as the convoy emerged on the other side of the portal, Sarah was bathed with blinding sunlight. She squinted a bit her eyes adjusting from the partly cloudy environment of the North Grendon Plains to the blinding heat of this alien desert. Feeling the heat from the sunlight, she was immediately grateful for the device the Americans called an AC, which had no discernible translation, as their standard communication spells couldn't decipher acronyms. In the other vehicles, Sonarans and Mechanies alike displayed profound surprise, Amongst a swirling cacophony of other emotions, the scorching desert was an environment not many were used to. A barrage of questions and considerations ran through their minds. Is this really a different world? Did all Americans live on a desert world? No, that couldn't be. Various pictures clearly displayed lush fields of grains, towers of still overlooking an ocean and beautiful greenery within cities. Their questions were quickly answered when Perry spoke through the radio. Welcome to Earth. We will be arriving shortly at our Groom Lake facility in Nevada, otherwise known as Area 51. Once the convoy arrived at the base, some personnel came to help the guests out of their vehicles and guide them to the briefing room where they would be taught American cultural norms and important information regarding pedestrian safety, society, and above all, how to deal with any media coverage. Inside the briefing room, the instructors utilized various presentations sourced from the tour industry and schools. The first topic, pedestrian safety, taught the gay errands about street lights and their significance. The Mechanies immediately recognized this system, as they had implemented something similar in their own society once vehicles became widespread. The second topic involved numerous lectures about social interactions in America. Each gay Aaron was given a phone and some money in case they somehow got lost, and they were given instructions on how to call their guides in such an event. Finally, the gay errands were informed that they might encounter hordes of reporters and journalists who will descend upon them like hawks in order to reveal their presence to the entire world to billions of people. The Sonarans and even the Mechanese were surprised at this. How connected was their world, such that billions across the entire planet can receive information simultaneously? Most Mechanese families had radios, but even then only a few million may be able to receive messages broadcast through these devices. The Sonarans didn't even have a quick method of distributing information, they still relied on paper, word of mouth, and town magicians who had contact with the capital. On Earth. However, billions of people had access to communication devices such as radios, phones, and televisions. With the president having already announced the existence of sapient alien life, coverage of such specimens would certainly be the most watched and heard broadcast in history. Consequently, the gay errands were reminded to keep a low profile. Most of the world would be expecting something truly alien, and not anything remotely similar to humans. Thankfully. Their profile was further reduced since the gay errands were not wearing overly extravagant clothing. King Celia's had even left his crown back in Sonri's. Still, there was a chance of being found out, and regardless of how intrusive or annoying the reporters can get, they were told not to react. The gay errands agreed. With the basics now settled, they were dismissed from instruction and guided toward a hangar where Ambassador Perry, his diplomatic team, and a jet waited. Two hours ago, Washington, D.C. That is excellent news. Please relay my thanks to General Harding once the renovations are complete. Speaking of which, any updates on the new gate? Sir, we are still testing the capabilities of the new mithril compound we've developed. Initial test results were promising, with about an inch of what we are now calling mithrium being as strong as three feet of reinforced concrete. Further refinement will take time 
but we expect that we can enhance the capabilities of this new compound tenfold within the next year. President Keener factored this new information into his plans for what they are now calling Fort Grendon, renamed from Fort Washington. With the recent revelation of the existence of magic and monsters, there was no telling what kind of threats lurked beyond the portal. So far, hostile encounters in gay era have been limited to primitive natives, giant spiders, and a large dragon, easily the size of a destroyer. Testing has shown that objects larger than the portal itself couldn't rematerialize properly, but with the existence of magic, who knows if this could hold true. Therefore, President Keener concluded that all precautions must be taken in order to minimize otherworldly threats yet maximize potential profits. I see. Begin installation of the compound as it is currently. Given all that has happened in the span of just a couple months, I would hate to imagine what dangers may surface in a year. We could always just upgrade the gate later on. Yes, Mr. President, the aide said. As he was about to leave, Keener stopped him. Wait. One more thing. Make sure the self-destruct mechanism is operational. If there is something out there powerful enough to overrun the most fortified position in two worlds, then we need to make sure it does not gain a foothold on Earth. Of course, sir. The aide nodded slightly before taking his leave. President Keener sighed. Hopefully, such drastic measures wouldn't need to be implemented. With his term ending next year, he was essentially gambling. So far, his bets have paid off with Ambassador Perry's report on the treaties and deals with the natives. With carefully orchestrated information leaks, he aimed to both reinforce the technological edge of the United States and its allies against the East and in doing so, satisfy his voters. As for their allies, a few trade and technology deals would certainly keep them from calling out what might appear to them as yet another wave of American imperialism and colonialism. Eventually, his counterparts in the UN Security Council's P5 particularly China, will push for full access. Britain and France will be easy to deal with because of their close relations with the United States. That leaves Russia and China. If they bend together and force a stalemate, the United States might be forced to concede access. However, Russia is more receptive. Thanks to Ambassador Perry's earlier missions, the Russian Federation has been more cooperative with NATO to the point where Cold War fears of a nuclear war have been finally put to rest. President Keener filed away these thoughts as he grabbed the telephone on his desk and dialed Stacy, the lady who managed guests and foreign diplomats. Climbing to the top and making a name for himself was easy in comparison to his tasks now, maintaining his position and bringing his friends in the Ascension Party up with him. In the skies above Pennsylvania. My. It got dark quite fast, Sarah remarked as she looked out a window. The sun, which was hours from setting earlier, was now minutes from dipping below the horizon, its beautiful orange glow receding as the purple skies above darkened. The Mechanese diplomat the legator on the other hand, was not as surprised as he stared out of the opposite window. John Perry surmised that it was because the Mechanese had already commercialized air travel to enough of an extent that their population saw it as normal. Despite the normalization of air travel in Meccan, Prion by Naparius never stopped appreciating the beauty of the skies. Seeing the lights from the cities below also reminded him of home. Sitting across from Straw was Perry himself who was now explaining the circumstances of the unnationally expedient nightfall. Sarah tried her best to keep up, but following Perry's lessons on Earth's revolution along with their plane's motion made her head spin. Such scientific knowledge was not common to the everyday people in the Sonaran Federation. John, noticing Sarah's confusion, stopped his explanation and smiled. Let's just enjoy the sunset and the wine. Three hours later, John put his glass of wine down after he finished taking a sip. He was sitting at a large table with the envoys from the gay Aaron nations, Lady Sarah Sindas, King Cernan Celius, Legator Pri Ambinaparius, and Third Commander Jean Danius. Sitting beside him were General Harding and Lieutenant Colonel Ava Keys, both of whom were recalled back to Earth for debriefing. While they waited for the food, the gay Aaron natives discussed their impressions about America. The spires of this city almost reached to the heavens. How can they possibly stand against the weight of the sky? King Celius asked. The Mechanese delegation looked toward Ambassador Perry, who was providing most of the answers to their questions, sometimes consulting a mysterious device the people around here seem to always carry. Prion, aware of the technological discrepancies between his own nation and the nations of this world, 
paid close attention to all of Perry's answers. I'm not much familiar with structural or material engineering, but we use materials that can withstand greater amounts of pressure or weight. A lot of our buildings use steel compounds because they are durable and convenient, easy to mass produce. Sometimes Perry's answers were less than informative, but at least they could help lead his people in the right direction. If anything, Securing partnerships between McKinney's and American companies should be a top priority. That way, scientists, engineers, and culture workers from both societies can mingle and learn from each other. Prion made a middle note to ask Ambassador Perry about this later, as the food was now here. As the dishes were set down, the gay errands all could smell the alien spices used to create these masterpieces. Rosemary, oregano, these plants did not grow on gay era nor did anything similar surface. Despite the genetic similarities between humans and some other animal and microbial species common to both worlds, it seems that genetic divergence led to a shocking lack of spices on gay era. The visitors sliced into the steaks, from which a dark mahogany sauce oozed, and took their first bites, the succulent meat causing their taste buds to go wild and their eyes to go wide. The expert culinary techniques that went into this filet mignon as the Americans called it, rivaled those of the finest chefs in Meccan, perhaps even surpassing them in some regards. This must be quite expensive, Prion remarked. Oh, don't worry about the cost, John reassured him. How could this be? He remembered what Ambassador Perry had told him days before, his nation produces enough food for a billion people. With such abundance, there's no wonder that food like this has great availability. Ah so everyone can purchase a meal like this daily? Well, not quite. The food is pretty expensive, I think we've racked up a bill of over a thousand dollars already, but hey, the government is paying for all this so it's basically free. They continue to eat, trying the various alien foods included in the dish. This mashed potato reminds me of the Nashita Nashita crop back home. Sarah was pleasantly surprised by this discovery. Within a few seconds, she received a tap on the shoulder to find John holding a phone, with a picture of a crop. Does Nashita look something like this? He asked. Why, yes. In fact, it looks the exact same. She answered. John was intrigued by this. Perhaps some things in gay era had equivalent Terran counterparts, except with different names. His thoughts were interrupted by King Celia's, who asked a question. How many people live in this New York City? I'm not sure of the number to be exact but I believe it is around 8 million. Why that is the same as entire nations. King Celia's gasped. Indeed, John affirmed. King Celia's laid back in his seat, his plate empty, and both his mind and stomach full. 8 million in just one city was a tremendous number. How could that many people fit into one city? He looked out of the window and realized the answer. Outside, steel towers proudly stood, contrasted by the plain night sky and illuminated by the city's lights which seemed to be coming from everywhere at once. The lights from the skyscrapers stretched as far as the eye can see, all across the landscape, and some even dared to pierce the heavens, their lights so high that they might even be mistaken for stars. The lights shone so brightly that he could not even see the stars in the sky. But then again, what were they compared to the stars rising up from the ground? Even compared to his recent visit to Divinia, this metal jungle was far more splendorous, certainly. If the concept of abundance was a city, this would be it. Month 7, Day 2 Ina, E. Anif Imperium A man dressed in mithril armor, itself emitting a golden glow, stood upon his castle's balcony as he overlooked his fine city. Emperor Voxa Valian enjoyed nights such as these, when he could see the lights of his shining city, its glory perhaps rivaling that of even Divinia. Built upon the backs of enslaved beasts, he hoped to see his empire expand to the point where he could challenge the other nations. Perhaps he could even conquer land from the brutish orcs, something that neither the Mechanese, the Divinions, nor the Quad Republic had been able to accomplish. First, he needed to secure his own continent, although ousting the Divinions and Mechanese from their colonies wouldn't seem likely for the time being. Another concern was that of the Americans who had swiftly crushed the Nibian Empire and the Bracton Gang in a month's time. If the reports he received were in fact truthful, then it wasn't really a month-long war, for battles waged during the spans of merely a few days were sufficient in bringing about the complete surrender of both parties. While the elimination of two of the biggest obstacles to his conquest was pleasing, 
he was worried that an obstacle larger than the two combined may have surfaced, even if his factories were able to equip his entire army with the latest second form gear. It would still take several months to repeat the same feat accomplished by the Americans. Although the second form rifles and artillery pieces were much more powerful than their Mechanese counterparts, they had a painfully slow fire rate. Despite being somewhat balanced in terms of firepower, Evalian's forces lacked a critical component of modern warfare, mobility. Compared to Mechanese fighters, Eana Freeborn Wyverns are actually faster, but they couldn't be mass produced nor could larger versions be manufactured in order to carry troops. Compared to Mechanese personnel vehicles, Terrasc drawn troop carriers were slower, but had greater maneuverability in harsh terrain. If the Americans had superior vehicles compared to the Mechanese, then their quick victory may be explained. However, he still could not make sense of the dead spy's report. Before his untimely demise, the spy kitten reported seeing hellfire being rained down upon the entirety of the Bracken gang, annihilating the camp in one fell swoop as metal swords shrieked through the skies and wiped out their wyverns using explosive homing arrows that traveled faster than any natural object. Furthermore, the power of the flying machines were so great that a couple of the larger ones were able to decimate a mountainside causing a catastrophic rock slide to bury much of the Bracton encampment. At first glance, this report seemed too outlandish to be true, unless the Divinions had done it. Still, Divinion involvement couldn't have been possible since his other clandestine operatives in the area reported no residual magical energies. Perhaps Gitten exaggerated? No, since the same operatives reported seeing the aftermath of the battle, or rather, extermination. There could be no other explanation. The Americans have a weapon similar to the Mana Bomb, but without a magical detonation catalyst such as Mana Crystals. How? In the midst of his contemplations, a man hurriedly knocked on the door of his chambers. Emperor Evalian returned to his room in order to open the door. My lord. The man sputtered, tired from his sprint. Please, forgive my intrusion. What is it? My lord. Some of our forces participating in the Beastie Alliance subjugation campaign have reported witnessing a bright light shooting into the sky, near the hunting grounds of the Hydra. Emperor Evalian exhaled. Unfortunate. Have the unborn project paused for now. We need the Tamers to prioritize the Hydra. Send them on our fastest wyverns. I do not recognize the significance of the light, but there is a possibility that it may interfere with our future operations. It will be done my lord. The imperial messenger bowed and took his leave. Back to his thoughts. What was he thinking of again? Yes, it was about American military capabilities. Esseth Kingdom. Deep within the aptly named Hydra Forest, there lived an enormous beast who hunted for food every hundred years. It would hunt for a year before returning to its hidden cave dwelling to hibernate, allowing its food sources to repopulate. The titanic monster would, from time to time, engage in mating rituals attracting other hydras lurking in the ocean below, who have remained in the water mostly due to their subsistence on oceanic life, unlike their counterpart who dominates the hydra forest. Mating calls are produced in a very high frequency range, audible only to a few types of gay air and fauna. One day ago, the terrestrial hydra slumbered, and would have done so for the next 70 years. What kind of world has insects this big? Emma shrieked as she swatted a large fly with the butt of her rifle. You wanna tell her about the time with those spiders? Dr. Jones asked. Just hearing about this made her experience a most unsettling feeling, yet her curiosity was more powerful and she asked away. How big were the spiders? Massive. Probably the size of a horse. And there were a ton of them. If it weren't for Jones and Kel, we wouldn't all be standing here right now, Henry recounted. Just thinking of a spider that large sent shivers up her spine. This was truly an alien world, complete with fantasy monsters. As she thought this, a high-pitched, screeching roar erupted from a swath of forest several clicks inland. Somehow, despite being an ultra-high frequency, the birds within the region took to the skies, as if they didn't need to hear the roar in order to sense the danger. What the hell was that? Henry asked. Probably what we were sent here to find, Ron replied. Damn, Lamar, radio back to command and inform them of the situation. Come on, let's keep moving toward the mountain range. We still need to investigate that beam of light. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. 
You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 34 Independence Day Part 1 July 4, 2019 Essith Kingdom We really should have had at least a day of leave. Like, the war against the Nibians is over, there's nothing to worry about for now. Emma voiced a complaint as she and Alpha Team trekked through some dense forest. The aliens out here ain't gonna give us a break just cause we've got a holiday, ma'am, Ron stated practically. Of course, Emma sighed. Don't worry Lamar, I'm sure you'll still get to see some fireworks later tonight, one way or another, Henry said. Perhaps we may even be able to create some of these fireworks ourselves through magic, Kalmethus added. To demonstrate his ability to accomplish such a task. He summoned a few light orbs before allowing them to quickly dissipate. Perhaps, if we can find the Hydra. If we didn't try looking for that light we probably could have been done already, Henry said as he scanned their surroundings from atop a hill. The dense forest hid anything below the tree line. How tall is this thing supposed to be anyway? Like five stories? Shouldn't be too hard to spot. Dr. Jones said. Speak of the devil. Ron muttered. About twelve clicks southeast toward the mountain range we just came from. You see that? Henry raised his binoculars and spotted a lumbering creature that resembled an ancient plesiosaur, but with a more compact, mammalian body and a shorter stature. It was about three stories high, its head sticking above the pines, or rather what seemed to be pines. One could never tell in an alien world. Looks like it's running huh? Ron pointed out. Yeah, sure does. Henry looked around the creature. Scanning left and then right. Whoa, what is it, sir? Emma asked, pulling out her own binoculars. Owens, a bit to the right, that's the Hydra isn't it? Ron brought the gaze of his equipment toward the giant, three-headed lizard. Yeah, and it's closing in damn fast. The three officers watched as the Hydra closed in on the other beast. The left head spat acid at the prey in order to immobilize it while the right spat fire blocking off any possible escape routes for the prey. The herbivorous beast began to thrash and panic as the acid chewed away at its neck and fires raged around it, smoke beginning to obscure parts of the scene. The left and right heads bit respective sides of the prey, but before anyone could see what the middle head did, smoke from the fire blotted out the sky, preventing Alpha Team from gathering vital information. All that could be discerned was a loud roar followed by violent tremors that shook the lush valley where the battle took place, causing birds even miles from the battle itself to fly off. Even Alpha Team felt the rumbling of the earth, albeit slightly. The magnitude of the quake deteriorated as it passed through miles of earth. The three officers were all open-mouthed and wide-eyed. Damn, that was like something that should be on National Geographic, Henry commented. I've never seen anything like that, Emma said. Ah. Yes, I have never seen anything like that as well, Kalmethus said, his arms crossed. He and his staff were leaning on a tree a bit further back. Oh, sorry about that. Next time we'll get you a pair of binoculars, Henry apologized. Hey if it helps you feel any better, I caught most of it on tape. Jones popped up. To the three officers' surprise, he was holding an expensive looking video camera. Henry shook his head as he motioned for his team to begin moving. You know all that footage is gonna be classified, right? Jones fiddled with the camera, analyzing the footage before stowing it. You never know, Major. Besides, we need all the intel we can get, right? True. All right, Lamar. Contact command and let them know we've found the Hydra. Keep a drone on its tail. She nodded and retrieved her radio. Sir. After that, We'll be heading back. If we hoof it, we can make it to Varman and hitch a ride back to base in time for the fireworks show. Perhaps, Kalmethus muttered, looking back toward the side of the Titanic battle. Heaven's Peak, Essith Kingdom. The fools thought they could track me down. Pathetic. They walked right past me, even with a giant beacon signaling my location. Emperor Novus laughed to himself. That was funny. Laugh. Novus looked around. There was no one in his vicinity. The royal guards were stationed outside, watching for intruders. Right. He then picked up an immaculate photo from a pocket in his armor, much too immaculate given Nabian technology. In fact, it was Divinian in origin. Printed from one of their cameras, Novus looked at the contents of the picture. It was a woman standing in front of a Divinion Museum, holding a child no more than five years of age. Oh, mother. 
If only you could see what I've become, soon, I will have the Mechanese bastards who started the war in the first place, and then I shall rebuild my empire. He placed his right hand onto the device he had activated days ago in order to resume configuring it. The device emitted a faint glow as former Emperor Novus tapped into it, programming it using his magical energy. He checked the status of the device. 76% and rising by one every half hour. My destiny is but moments away, Novus declared, his eyes twitching. Fifty years ago. Hi Vina, Divinian Empire. Mama. Lord Novus screamed for his mother as he was dragged away by his father. It is okay, my dear La An K, you will be safe with your father. Now go and be safe. Shovad, I need to go back to the house and get the necklace. Take care of our son. I love you. He watched as his mother gave his father a kiss before retreating down the street, toward the booming metal behemoths on the beach. Goodbye Halia, I love you too. Shovad Novus, still carrying his son, ran away from the Mechanese soldiers storming the beachhead. A mile west lies their salvation, a small fishing river that stretched from the North Ocean all the way through the Divinian continent of Arthi, toward the Aurelian Ocean. Because of its small size, it saw little traffic. Other larger rivers were used as trade routes. Hopefully, by the time they reached the river, their escape barge and crew would still be there. Lor's father ran with all his strength, the explosions going off in the distance reminding him of what was at stake and further motivating him. As he lay in his father's arms, he stared into the battlefield above. The scene was a spectacle indeed. The First Divinion Mechanese War, dubbed the Lightning War, saw the introduction of mechanized units on the battlefield. Surprisingly, the name didn't originate from the speed at which the war ended. In fact, the war lasted nearly a decade. No, the name originated from the efficiency and speed at which troops could be deployed and annihilated. The Divinion Empire, noticing Mechan's military and economic expansion, saw it as a threat to its dominion over the central continents and launched a preemptive strike in order to prevent Mechan from growing too powerful. The Divine Emperor sent a vast fleet, equipped with the latest in Divinian magical technology, including shields and mana conduits, to subjugate the Mechanese. After traveling weeks on the open sea, the fleet finally reached Mechanese waters some 5,000 miles away. Orders to begin bombardment of the Mechanese coastal fortifications were received, but as soon as they began, Unbeknownst to the Divinions, Mechan immediately responded. Arcane war machines powered by Divinion mages rumbled forth along the road, toward the coastline, attracting the attention of a Mechanese warbird. The massive, shielded blimp edged closer toward the road, propelling itself using an unknown combination of magical and scientific technologies, before coming into range of the road. Lore's father continued to run, putting distance between them and the Divinion air race core vehicles. Behind, Lore watched as the heavily armored boxes opened up their hatches. In all four Terrasque vehicles, a mage popped out and began channeling mana energies into a cylindrical shape, resembling a barrel. Then, the shot lightning threw it, aiming at the Mechanese warbird above. The lightning struck the warbird's shielding, producing a bright blue flash as the electrical currents were dispelled by the protective field surrounding the airship. As the mages prepared for another volley, the airship retaliated unleashing thundering booms as chunks of metal were accelerated from onboard cannons, releasing clouds of smoke from the numerous artillery platforms that covered the width of the airship. All four Terrasque vehicles were obliterated, leaving burning metal husks. Lor's father stumbled and almost dropped him as the ground trembled from the impact of the airship's barrage. He regained his balance and continued to run toward the river, looking back and catching a glimpse of the destruction behind him. He then looked back toward his son, with tears in his eyes. Lor said nothing, understanding why he was crying. There was no way his mother could return from all that. He took one last look at the sky. The scene was beautiful, yet terrifying. New Divinion aircraft had arrived and shot down a few of the Mechanese airships, while aging wyverns were deployed against ground targets. Despite the atmosphere being filled with a staccato of gunfire and thunderous explosions, Lore, exhausted from the initial escape, drifted off in his father's arms. New York, United States After a day of extensive touring, the Mechanese and Sonaran diplomatic teams slept heavily, 
enjoying the alien comforts of American society. Wrapped up in warm sheets and a thick blanket while simultaneously being cooled by the air conditioning was blissful for the relatively primitive gay errands. Indeed, one of his first thoughts when Brianna woke was that of these air conditioning units. They were everywhere, from cars to homes to markets. It seems that every building in the city had such technology which led Prion to consider the massive power requirements for such a task. The Mechanese power grid was still in relative infancy, as electricity had only been discovered decades prior, with the first widespread distribution of power amongst the Mechanese population contributing to the First Dominion Mechanese War. After several decades, however, their electrical infrastructure grew such that each home could support numerous appliances, such as radios and television sets. Currently. The majority of Mechanese electricity came from coal plants, since coal was the most abundant fuel source in their region. Some monoreactors were also commissioned, but they are still in construction. He wondered if the Americans were familiar with any other types of power sources. The digital alarm clock buzzed. Yet another device these Americans have improved upon. Preon turned on the television in order to watch the news. On the screen, a man in a blue suit walked up to a podium. The scrolling headlines on the bottom of the screen identifying him as President Keener. Once he approached and tapped the mic, the crowd went silent, allowing him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you on our day of independence, when we birthed a nation, built upon the foundations of liberty. We, as Americans, agreed upon these truths, that all humans are created equal and that humans have certain unalienable rights, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Today we shall revisit these truths and ask ourselves, are they limited only to humanity? Now, I can see some of your faces in the crowd and it looks like you folks are beginning to see where I'm going with this. Just over two weeks ago, I made an announcement regarding the discovery of a wormhole on American soil, and discussed our first impressions of the planet. The vegetation we have seen was indicative of animal life and it didn't take us long to find it. As you can see on these screens, this is a livestock animal known as a calf. It closely resembles a cow, and actually tastes better than one. Now hopefully I won't have an alien bursting out of my stomach. The crowd bursted into a flurry of discussion and laughter. Many were hoping to have a taste of new foods discovered on this alien world. When the crowd quieted down, President Ryan Keener continued. Some of you may be wondering, how did we figure out that this animal was livestock? We didn't. They did, he said, gesturing toward a clip that was now playing on the screens. Two beast people resembling cats, a female and a male, answered several questions during an interview. They spoke a language similar to Latin, so audio of an English translation had to be placed over the conversation. The crowd remained silent as they allowed the short interview to conclude. Once it finished, the clip remained paused at the final frame which depicted the cat woman smiling at something or someone to the left of the camera. All those present were speechless, then erupted into a cacophony of discussion. Preon was intrigued by this, but then again, these people had never seen beast people before. Surely, they would have similar reactions to the other numerous surprises Gay Era had in store for the Earth humans. He watched as President Keener held up his hands in order to signal to the crowd to quiet down. After a few seconds, they did so with impressive speed. Today, I want to announce that the United States of America is officially the first nation in human history to have met aliens. We are not alone in the universe. His declaration was followed by massive cheering. The American president allowed them to express his subjects' elation. Even some of the residents in the nearby rooms were cheering. A loud holy shit came from his left, followed by running and the slamming of a door. He turned his attention back to the screen but it appears the president's speech has been put on a hold. What time is it? Prion muttered to himself. He was already dressed, ready to enjoy the one free day he had here in New York. As such, Prion got up from the bed and walked toward third commander Danny's room. Three knocks on the door. Come in, a voice within answered. Morning, Jean. Have you been watching the American news? Yes I have, Prion. I must say, it is a bit strange being able to see the news so clearly in such vivid detail. From what I've heard, the Americans think we are perhaps a decade away from color television. Did you ask them how close we might be to jet fighters like theirs? Jean asked. They merely smiled and said nothing. Evidently they do not want to share too much of their technology, 
but I'm certain I can strike a bargain using our magical technology, with your advice, of course. And so you will. Now, let us join the Sonarans downstairs. They always like to begin their days early. In the lobby, the Sonarans chatted with the American diplomatic team. Today, their plan was to continue their tour of New York, visiting the Statue of Liberty and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In particular, some of the Sonarans were excited to determine if there were any similarities between artwork from their planet and those from Earth. A ding alerted everyone, causing them to glance over towards the elevator. The elevator doors opened, revealing the Mechanese group. Once they grouped up with the Sonarans, Ambassador Perry reviewed their plans for today. With only two destinations in their itinerary, they would most likely finish their activities within a few hours. The gay errands were told that it was a holiday today. And as such, some businesses were closed. Both the Sonaran and Mekanese parties did not mind. They welcomed a chance to relax and wait for the fireworks. All right, everyone ready to go? Ambassador Perry asked. A chorus of yes answered him. Perfect. He tapped on a device attached to his ear. Agent Simmons, we're ready for departure. Our first stop will be the Statue of Liberty, followed by the Met. Within a minute, Black SUVs pulled up to the street in front of the hotel. The gay errands entered excitedly, ready to sightsee and take pictures with their newly purchased cameras. Ina, Eanif Imperium. Emperor Evalian once again found himself in the Imperial Archives, sifting through information collected on the Divinian recording artifacts. He revisited a recording submitted by a spy who participated in the massacre on the North Grendon Plains. Artillery, automatic weapons, and flying machines. He released a sigh, shaking his head as he pondered the implications of such advanced weaponry and attempted to formulate viable strategies against the Americans. Some of their weapons seemed formidable enough to challenge his beast forces, including powerful monsters such as the heavily armored Darisk and the recently tamed Basilisk. Breeding programs for these creatures were expensive and thus his military could deploy only a few dozen of each type of larger monster. Still, even when was enough to rout entire armies, in the Anif at least, simulated wars against Mechanese and Avignon forces proved tougher, but winnable as long as they were fighting defensively. Eanish Kraken and Sea Serpent forces were sufficient in deterring and sometimes wiping out enemy naval forces. The only counters were depth charges. But even then only a small percentage of these charges actually hit. Sure, underwater boats may challenge his military's sea monsters, but neither the Divinions nor the Mechanese have developed them enough, partly because of their depth charge tactics. They most likely did not see the underwater boats performing well given their current arsenals. Based on the footage stored in the archives, the Americans appear to have similar weapons and tactics to the Mechanese. This meant that he couldn't exploit fear tactics like he can with primitive Nubian and Sonaran forces. One Darisk, it could defeat a thousand Nubians or Sonarans, provided they have no skilled mages or experienced heroes. What about a thousand of the American warriors? The Tarisk plating will protect it from their repeating rifles, but not from their larger artillery weapons especially the fortress vehicle with the cannon. How many hits a Tarisk could sustain from such a weapon, one could only guess. However, these cannon vehicles seem to lack mobility. Thus, the best way to make use of these beasts is to employ them in close quarters situations, or as an ambushing party in a dense forest or elevated area. Perhaps he could even supplement them with land dragons, assuming they are capable of fighting alongside each other and not with each other. As for basilisks, their ability to petrify with their toxic breath was useful in breaking armored forces. The unknown magical chemical process by which their breath solidified into a rocky substance could potentially devastate the American fortress vehicles. If only he had a decade to prepare, his wizards might have even found a way for magical users to employ this very spell in battle. Still, he was glad that the basilisks were tameable in the first place albeit at a heavy sacrifice. Their sacrifices will not be in vain, for he plans to use his forces wisely. The emperor tapped his fingers on a desk as he thought about potential targets for his basilisk forces. Surely, the Americans stored their flying machines somewhere, he would need to coordinate with his intelligence department in order to figure that out. Hopefully, the spies won't be too overwhelmed like the one who committed suicide. Another force he could make great use out of might be the Hellworm contingent. Of all the monsters in his arsenal, 
the Hellworm is quite possibly the deadliest, capable of burrowing and tunneling through nearly any material. The Hellworm could be used to harass convoys and strike at weaker outposts. Yes, with all these forces at his disposal, and only a limited number of forces stationed at the Grendon Fortress, he could secure a victory. But first, he must spend some time discreetly positioning his forces. Emperor Evalian knew that a victory could only be secured through a rapid strike, lest the enemy finds the time to send reinforcements. Satisfied with his plans, he put back the artifacts he had retrieved for review and exited the archives. Tomorrow, he will call a meeting with the generals. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 35, Independence Day Part 2 Note, sorry for the late update, I've been busy with university. To somewhat compensate for the late upload, I've extended the length of this chapter to nearly 5,000 words. Please remember to show your support by submitting a rating, voting, and or leaving a comment. Enjoy! Discord https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw The White House President Keener returned to his office after giving his speech and enjoying a fine lunch. He had nothing left for his schedule today aside from preparing for the upcoming meeting with the Sonarans and Mechanese representatives from the alien planet. Essentially, the rest of the day was for relaxation since his staff would handle all the details regarding the meeting. Just as he was about to retire for the day, a frantic man rushed into the room. Keener sighed internally. Can it wait? President Keener asked. Ah oh, Mr. President, there's been a development on gay era. President Keener sighed. What now? The aide scratched his neck before replying. The team that went out scouting a few days ago sent an urgent report. They're being told by a large uh, Hydra. Sir, what? President Keener exclaimed. His initial shock faded away, replaced by exasperation, evident in his sighing. Details? The team initially encountered the Hydra a few hours prior, part of their original mission to scout the forest for any dangerous fauna that might disrupt our plans for expansion and colonization. Fort Grendon sent out a UAV in order to keep tabs on the monster. And that's when the operator found out that the monster was following in the general direction of the team. As the aide continued to speak, President Keener's frown grew deeper. Why must things always go wrong in this alien world? He asked himself. Mr. President? Keener snapped back to reality, and muttered a response. Yes? Do you want to warn the citizens of Philomia? Alpha team is still at the town waiting for orders. How long can reinforcements get there? It'll take about 40 minutes for the two fighters serving a rapid response role. Over an hour for something that might actually be able to kill the monster, since most of the base personnel have the day off today. I thought we had cruise missiles there already? Ah, the aide chuckled nervously. He did not want to reveal the vice president's contradictory orders from a couple weeks ago. With preparations finalized for Operation Upper Hand, Chapter 23, the Vice President had taken a gamble in order to expedite the ROI, return on investment, from the scientists stationed in Gay Era. Discreetly, he arranged for the delays of numerous military shipments, instead sending scientific equipment, personnel, and supplies to Site Beta-1 and various research labs. Let me guess, Stanley's at it again. Huh? The aide now looked like a cartoon character who had a large drop of sweat forming on his head. Yes? Always trying to think he knows best. Well, to be fair, he didn't know something like this would happen. In fact, he would have been right if it weren't for this monster randomly deciding to follow one of our teams. Anyway, have the base send reinforcements immediately and warn the Felomia townspeople. Oh and make sure they send out the drone with the good camera. Those damn Hollywood folks put too much human drama in their monster movies. Yes, Mr. President. The aide quickly left the room in order to relay his orders to General Harding. Fort Grendon. Major Adam Griffin nearly choked on his hot dog when he was asked to suit up. Luckily for the general, he hadn't been able to get wasted yet. What's the matter? Griffin asked chewing madly in order to finish his hot dog before leaving. Monster attack at the town Alpha team is in, sir. Adam sighed. All right, come on Dragon Slayers, let's go make some fireworks. He waved his hand in an exaggerated motion, 
gesturing for his squad to follow him. There goes the plans for beer and barbecue, he thought. Border town of Felomia, Esseth. U.S. Territory, 266 miles from Fort Grindon. Can you send that again, Command? Emma asked in disbelief. The rest of Alpha Team was crowded around her as they too needed to confirm the message. Hydra en route to the town of Felomia, 30 miles out. ETA, 2 hours. What? Henry asked. How could the Hydra have followed us? I don't know sir. But we are really lucky the UAV operator noticed the monsters heading any later and we wouldn't be able to get there in time. ETA for reinforcements? About 40 minutes sir, but they're only the fighters we had in case of emergencies. They don't have specialized cast loadouts either. It'll be an hour and a half until the Dragon Slayers get to you. Henry smiled upon hearing that. The Dragon Slayers has gotten quite popular around the base ever since their battle against the Epic Dragon. It wasn't quite heroic as depictions in fantastical medieval tales, but then again, there was nothing glorious about annihilating a target miles away using guided missiles. Hopefully the Dragon Slayers will prove to be just as effective at ground targets as they are at aerial ones. If their ordnance isn't enough to take out the monster, then they'll have to harass it with their guns to keep it busy until the next set of reinforcements arrive. Earlier, they didn't observe any attacks that could really threaten the high-flying jets. Although the third head's signature attack was obscured, they'd be screwed if it was anything similar to the attacks shown in this decade's Godzilla movies. Major Doniger began to direct his team to help evacuate the locals, as per the president's orders, but given the town's population of over 9,000, a timely evacuation within a couple hours would be near impossible. Local Lord's Estate Fellow Mia. Master Tamer Korsholian wrinkled his nose in annoyance at the local lord who had stubbornly opposed his advances. Back in the Imperium, he wouldn't have had to deal with such blatant disrespect and in this particular case, severity. I must say once more, I do not have the authority to allow that. You must take your concerns to the Essetian capital. That's hundreds of miles down along the coast. Surely. No one would notice. You can earn extra gold just by securing the necessary lodging for my party. Corn nearly growled, exhausted at the local lord's stubbornness. The Americans will notice. They say they have eyes everywhere, and I am quite frankly not too keen on the idea of the Americans finding out that I have authorized the eviction of the inn's customers for some foreign soldiers. What would it take for this man to concede? And why does he have such a neutral face? Thinking about his predicament infuriated Kor, but he kept his temper. If his tough visage wasn't enough to persuade the Lord, if his men's intimidating appearances weren't enough to force the Lord to capitulate to his demands, then he must play along by his rules and use cunning to secure deal. Oh, he definitely would have simply taken what he needed by force? But the Emperor's strict orders were to be discreet. A quick taming of the Hydras needed to be as covert as possible, so as to not arouse the suspicion of Meccan or the Divinian Empire. Kor paused for a split second to come up with a counter. Ah, we're not foreign soldiers. We're merely adventurers. Oh? Is that so? Yes, yes. Kor smiled as best he could, although his expression looked more like a sneer due to the scars on his face. We are tier 1 adventurers looking for the dreaded forest hydra. The lord broke his neuter expression for the first time in their conversation, leading court to cheer mentally for this small victory. Ah, my apologies. I would be honored to serve such high-ranking adventurers. The lord bowed deeply, then continued once he returned to an upright position. But first, May I please see your tier 1 badges? Kor's eyes widened slightly. The look on the Lord's face, it was none other than that of a victorious man. His evil grin. Did he really need to see the badges? And Kor looked back to his party members, as if he could somehow find an answer. I left it at home. The Lord frowned and merely stated, Then I cannot allow you to take lodging from the inn's paid customers. Ah to the hells with this. Kor was on the verge of breaking the Emperor's strict rules. But his decision-making process was interrupted by a set of knocks. Suddenly, a set of knocks hit the door. The Lord called for a servant to open it, and to his pleasant surprise, a group of familiar faces strolled in. Ah, Major Doniger and friends. I was under the impression that you all would have gone back home by now. The Lord greeted Alpha Team. Henry spared a glance at the rough-looking individuals off to his right, marking them as a potential threat. We have bad news, Lord Talvin. 
Henry replied in a low voice. Lord Talvin looked over to the supposed adventurers before asking, Is this something that needs to be discussed privately? No, sir. Very well. Please tell us this bad news. Henry summarized the details given by the radio operator who had informed him of the Hydra's advances. After recommending an evacuation of the city, Henry voiced his concerns about the speed at which such a task could be accomplished. Cor eyed the newcomers suspiciously. One was clearly so narrow while the others seemed mechanese, except their black outfits and weapons only minimally resembled those of the mechanese. He deduced that these must be the Americans. The patches on their clothing matched the article that fluttered gloriously on a flagpole in the front courtyard. As a master tamer, Cor was privy to most of the pieces of information released to Emperor Evalian's inner circle. The same could not be said for his fellow tamers, who were struggling to identify this strangely dressed group. Three of them moved professionally, likely soldiers. The other two, the Sonaran wizard and the mage with the masterfully crafted scepter, moved behind the three. What surprised Cor was that a woman was among the three. While females working as adventurers was not unheard of. This one displayed a level of professionalism only present in a trained soldier. Kor smiled at her, once again his smile being distorted by his scars. The woman frowned, likely because his distorted smile appeared to be quite creepy. Disregarding her obvious disapproval, Kor continued to watch the group and eventually the leader approached the local lord and whispered something inaudible. The tone however, was unmistakably that of urgency. The expression on the lord's face was negative. Whatever news he had just received must have been terrible. He then nodded and walked towards Kor, explaining the situation. Perfect timing, Kor replied. Let me and my party handle the beast. Very well, Lord Talvin agreed. After all, if they were truly tier 1 adventurers, then handling a legendary monster wouldn't be much of a problem. Lord Talvin quickly excused himself and left to relay the order to evacuate the town, leaving Alpha Team and the Ianish Tamers in the chamber. Kor snuck a peek over his shoulder and saw the strangely dressed people talking amongst themselves in hushed voices. With them preoccupied and the Lord gone, he ushered his fellow tamers toward a corner in order to discuss the situation privately. Sire, I don't believe we can tame the beasts in two hours, one of the tamers voiced. Kor scoffed. Of course not. We will trap the beast using standard procedure, except this time. We have an entire town as delicious bait. The trio laughed evilly as they hurried to inform their fellow tamers of the approaching Hydra and their arcane strategies to trap it. What was that about? Jones asked, looking at the trio running out of the mansion. Dunno, but those guys gave me the creeps, especially the one with the scars over his face, Emma said. Something doesn't seem right about them, Ron added causing the rest to nod. Who are they anyway? They don't look like bandits and they don't look like soldiers, despite their gear, Jones wondered. They are most likely adventurers, Kelmethus answered. Although I've never met a group as suspicious as this one, I'll keep an eye on them. They said they could handle the Hydra. If that's true, then we might learn a thing or two from these professional adventurers, Henry surmised. He then clapped his hands. All right, the rest of you, try and catch up with Laura Talvin. See if you can help him out with the evacuation. Actually, Dr. Jones and Calmethus, try to find a way to slow or defeat the Hydra. I'm going to follow these other guys and see what they're up to. Alpha team subsequently split up, leaving Henry alone in the chamber. Reaching into his pack, he fished out a small drone with a camera on it and sent it in the direction where the trio was running off to. The Spider Wasp PRS, a more predatory looking version of its predecessor. The Black Hornet PRS, boasted a stealthy radar cross-section, speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, and a stable internal mount for a camera or weapon. Because of the relatively isolated position of the mansion, which had its own medieval era defenses, it was easy to spot the trio running off into the northeastern woodlands. Henry pursued them with the drone, keeping it away from their range of detection. Seeing their trajectory, Henry moved the drone further into the woods hoping to catch a glimpse of their camp. Surprisingly, it was much larger than expected. The mass of people looked more like a small army rather than a group of adventurers, unless adventurers in this world tended to group in the dozens. Due to the bustling activity and commotion coming from the camp, Henry was able to move the drone closer, 
allowing it to rest above a tree. Then, he activated the machine's listening device and spies on the conversations from the people below. Outskirts of Felomia, Imperial Tamer Camp. You there, hurry and pick up the pace, or you shall become bait for the beast. A rough overseer type yelled out, lashing his whip toward a group of people in rags. Henry frowned as he watched the video feed. He was surprised that the Sonarans and Nabians didn't have slaves, since they were relatively primitive societies. Well, maybe it's because each nation cultivated borrowed traditions from their respective patrons. Both the Mechanese and Avinians did not practice slavery, and so the idea of free labor was passed down after the era of colonization. He rotated the drone a bit more to the left finding more of the slaves before he had to do a double take. Wait a second, Henry thought. They didn't look like people. Zooming in to get a clear picture, his suspicions were confirmed. The slaves were indeed of a different species than humanity, beast people. Remembering some details from prior briefings, he realized that these weren't adventurers, these were troops from the Ianif Imperium. So that's why they were so relentless in their campaign against the beast people. He thought they needed physically strong slaves. As he continued to watch the actions of the Imperials and their slaves, he slowly realized that they were building a large trap meant to be placed under foliage. The trap was similar to a Terran bear trap, except this one had additional notches for mana gems. Connected to sets of runes, the device and its engravings looked much more complicated than anything seen amongst the Sonarans and Nubians. The scene thus begged the question, why would the Ianif Imperium want a Hydra? Utilizing knowledge of role-playing games, Dungeons and & Dragons, and other fantasy-related media back on Earth, Henry deduced that the Hydra must drop some good loot when killed. The spiders he killed back when first exploring Site Beta-1 left behind monogems and husks made of an intriguing, durable material which was also highly flexible. He was too busy fighting for his life to even think about checking the bodies not realizing that such a strange rebounds per game mechanic would apply in real life. At least they didn't unrealistically drop gold or anything, he thought. Focusing his attention back on the presence of Imperials, he debated whether or not to allow them to carry on with their work. Of course, he wouldn't stop them if they were indeed attempting to prevent the Hydra from destroying the town. Alpha lead to all Alpha team members, Henry called into his radio, be advised. Unknown Trio is in fact a group of Ianif Imperials. Base camp is in the woods, bearing northeast from the mansion. Lamar, please inform command of this new information. On it, sir, came the reply. Henry flew the drone back to the mansion and stored it away before setting off to find Lord Talvin. Perhaps he would know something about the Imperium. The continuous hour of hard labor that the beast slaves had to endure, under threat of being used as bait was finally interrupted by an unfamiliar roar that pierced the skies. Staring into the skies, the Imperials and their slaves were unable to spot the two silvery objects in the horizon, which was obscured by the tree line. Only when the low-flying jets were directly above them did they notice, as many of the weaker slaves were pushed to the ground by the immense winds from the jets that skimmed above the trees. None of them had seen such monsters before. Aside from a few tamers who had knowledge of Mechanese airplanes. As such, most of the slaves and overseers burst into commotion, delaying work for a few minutes. One of the Ianish men led a crowd of both slaves and Imperial soldiers to Master Kor's command tent. Master Tamer, I beseech thee, abandon these lands. Let us work on the Hydra's taming on our own accord, without this deadline we are given. The soldier called out to Kor who stood unconvinced. Murmurs of agreement triples throughout the crowd. Yes, this land is overrun by monsters. If we leave now, we can escape with some of the town's people. When the crowd became silent, Kor spoke. We will not have another chance like this in the future. The main reason why we have not attempted a taming of the Hydra sooner is because of the beast's elusivity. We would have to spend additional months tracking the beast. We were lucky that it came to us within the first revolutions of our arrival. But my lord, the soldier dissented. If we wait and plan, more of us may survive. We will die trying. You can die trying, or you can die where you stand, Kor said coldly. But, my lord. The man attempted to protest again. Korf round and in a lightning fast movement, drew his new second form revolver and shot the borderline rebellious soldier in the head. Back to work. Or I will retire you immediately, Kor commanded. The crowd quickly dispersed and returned to work, 
fearing the master tamer's iron fist and big iron on his hip, Philomia Western Forests. Two F-15E strike eagles flew at a low altitude, speeding past the town and venturing into the wilderness of the forest. After exiting the airspace of the town, the F-15S initiated their slow deceleration so that they would reach their target flying at cruising speed. In one of the strike eagles, the pilot spotted an irregular shape trotting through the trees. Hey Chuck, he called out to his co-pilot. Yeah, you see that thing, walking into that clearing down to our left. The strike eagles were approaching rapidly, granting the co-pilot but a few seconds to identify the object before it became a blur. Shit, isn't that the Hydra? Chuck replied. Indeed, the three heads of the towering beast were unmistakable. It angled itself toward the plains which were still barely above the tree line at this point. Suddenly, a large glow began to form in one of its heads. Oh crap, the pilot replied as he jerked his joystick, pulling the strike eagle into a steep climb. The fireball missed. Even if the pilot hadn't executed such a maneuver, the fireball still would have missed, since they were still moving at Mach 1.2. The other plane, seeing the quick movement of its partner, radioed in. Monster 1. What's going on? Damn Hydra just shot a fireball at us. Monster 1's pallet answered. What the hell? Intel says it's supposed to be 10 clicks at still. Damn, we need to circle back around. Overshot by a damn mile. Roger that. We'll hit it from the front while you hit it in the back. Solid copy. Make sure you let the Dragon Slayers know the situation, and please ask Ghost 1 to hurry their asses up. Will do. The pilot of Monster 1 said as he moved his jet back toward the town and did a 180 in order to attack the Hydra. With a loadout of two short-range Sidewinder missiles, two medium-range AMROMs, and four AGM-65 Maverick missiles, this essentially meant that between the two fighters, they had eight opportunities to deal damage to the beast. Once they ran out of their ground attack missiles, they would need to switch to their guns and harass the Hydra for as long as possible. With Monster 2 having completed its turn, both jets fired a missile each. The missiles were specifically designed to penetrate armor, but how well could they do against a monster's hide? The 300-pound explosive ordnance in each missile detonated as the missiles made contact with the Hydra's skin. After the smoke settled, the jets made visual confirmation of the damage done which was comparable to the chipping of paint on a warship. Because of the speeds at which they moved, the pilots couldn't see that the missiles had actually torn off small chunks of flesh. They could only see a slight charring on the surface of the beast's skin. As they circled back for another attack run, the Hydra angled its head, trying to predict the trajectories of the planes. The next set of missiles impacted, creating a cloud of dust and debris. From this smoke, the Hydra shot a fireball into the air, narrowly missing Monster 1. Each attack run was met with a close call, closer than the preceding calls. After the jets exhausted their ground attack missiles, they switched to their guns, requiring them to enter the Hydra's effective combat range. Got the target in my sights, a pilot said over the combat network. Guns, guns. A stream of bullets erupted from the plane's mounted M61 Vulcan hitting the Hydra in the face and creating a small scar where the skin was deformed by the kinetic energy of the impacts. The enraged Hydra seemed to almost grin at the sight of the approaching planes. Feigning defense by throwing one of its arms up, it secretly charged a fireball and was able to successfully hit one of the pesky metal gnats. The fireball scorched Monster 2's left wing, corroding the metal and almost entirely disabling the left tailor on. How bad is it? The pilot asked. We can still fly. Sir, but it'll be harder to perform complex maneuvers to dodge the Hydra's attacks. The pilot contemplated. Okay that's not too bad. Let's shorten our strafes just to be safe. A few more attack runs could make all the difference, especially now that the damn thing is this close to the town. The Hydra watched the gnats angrily as they had come around for another pass, the injured one it hit earlier flying higher. The Hydra saw this as a mixed blessing and curse since it meant that their piercing attacks wouldn't hit it as often. Sure, the piercing attacks were capable of dealing damage, but nothing so far could pierce its thick hide. Having a decorated history of battles against other large beasts, this particular Hydra was truly an apex predator, even more so than the rest of its skin, which are known to regularly challenge massive sharks and krakens. Still, the beast felt a sense of unease as the pesky flyers retreated and it marched toward the delicious smell of food. After moments of silence, 
the unease drifted away and eventually it saw lights in the distance a glaring contrast to the darkening skies. Its stomach crumbled as it pushed forward, relishing the thought of a full belly and biomass with which to heal itself. But the evacuations aren't even halfway done. Lord Talvin cried out, You must ask the people to leave their belongings. We can get them supplies and help rebuild the town once the Hydra has been dealt with. Henry's tone was solemn. He's seen livelihoods destroyed once before. Yes, I shall do that. I only pray the beast does not destroy everything we have built here. Perhaps the Eanish can stop them before they get here. I know not why they had to lie about their intentions and status, but as long as my people are safe, I will leave them to their arcane beast traps. The two men stood in silence until Lord Talvin spoke again. May I use your radio messengers? Lord Talvin's wording lightened Henry's mood and he granted the Aseth man's request with a smile. I will likely never cease to be fascinated by your nation's magic. And after hearing of your victory against Arnabian overlords, I will never cease to be grateful. We fight for freedom, Henry replied smiling internally because he finally got a chance to say that line. His chest was swelling with pride. Lord Talvin then communicated his orders to Ron and Emma, who were paired with some of the Lord's aides in order to expedite the flow of information. They quickly got to work, and soon enough, the flow of evacuees on the road increased. With that settled, Henry decided to check up on Kelmethus and Dr. Jones. Any breakthroughs? The tired voice of Kelmethus replied, Yes. We have just finished collecting metal from the town barracks, anything that the guards could not carry with them. You all right Kel? You sound a bit tired. Oh, yes, yes. I am just mama exhausted. I will be fine once I regenerate my mana using the few gems that the guard captain has graciously donated. What do you have planned? This time, Dr. Jones replied. We all know that we can't outright kill the creature with our available materials and given time. So we came up with a solution to buy as much time as possible. Kelmethus continued in his place, smoothly explaining the details of his plan. A stun spell is simple, such that most beginner wizards are able to learn it easily. It is a variant of the lightning spell, which uses electricity to stun a target. I have learned many things about currents and conductivity that I have never known before, and today I would like to apply my experiments on the field. As you Americans may say, I will need some time to prepare the remaining gems and I need a straight line of sight. Henry recalled the plans of the Imperials. With Captains Lamar and Owens keeping tabs on the Eanish, he was able to deduce their overall strategy. Kel, you might want to set up around the town circle. There, you'll have a clear line of sight to the western gate, which is where the monster should be coming from. Be careful with the Eanish. They're setting up traps using these pylons or cones scattered in some shape alongside an enormous pitfall trap. Very well, Dr. Jones, let us commence our work. Western Gate. Kor watched his people toil endlessly as they hurried to ready the trap. Looking back at the two wizards setting up their little spell conduit, he scoffed. These people should leave the difficult work of handling large monsters to the professionals. They couldn't even get the beast's estimated time of arrival correct. As a master tamer, Kor had long ago sensed the approaching Hydra, and now, Gazing upon his workers finalizing their conduit placements, he felt ready. He heard two roars. One was distinctly from the Hydra, another came from behind him. The Americans brought a vehicle in order to escape. How cowardly! He turned his attention back into the forest, where a large, three-headed beast suddenly appeared. Let me show you how a master tames a monster. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 36 Independence Day Part 3 Like, Comment, and Follow Discord https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw july 4 2019 on route to felomia 36 miles out what's the valkyries payload a dragon slayer pilot captain grant asked a reply came over the combat network huh oh the general said it's got one 250 pounder it was captain grant swingman Captain Miller. What? Captain Grant was confused. That's it? Well, most of it is jammed with sensors and stuff raw. Tactical analysis, Miller replied. 
you'd think it's carrying something special. A. It kinda is. The general said it's for the new drone network. Things got to learn from something. Why not the best? I'll write you two dragon slayers. Cut the chatter. We're about to reach the target, Major Adam Griffin announced. For this mission, Dragon Slayer Squadron flew 6 F-35S, leaving behind the F-22 Raptors they had used last month against the Epic Dragon. One of the primary reasons for this selection was to test the viability of current generation U.S. aircraft against various targets in gay era. Another was to collect data for the prototype YQ-58 Valkyrie so that the drone may finally be put into official service as swarming wingmen for human-piloted aircraft. For this operation, Adam was tasked with coordinating a bombing with a Valkyrie to determine how well the drone received communications from its controller. To minimize collateral damage, all aircraft were equipped with small, laser-guided bombs. Trailing in between the Dragon Slayers were two larger aircraft, designated as Ghost-1 and Ghost-2. In these lumbering aircraft, crew were hurriedly making checks to the weapons. 105 is good to go. 40 is all ready. 25s are good. With a few minutes left to reach their destination, some were excited. Some were even nervous, unsure if they could make it in time. However, all were confident in their faith of superior firepower, that their selection of the finest American ordnance would be able to reduce the beast to bloody chunks. Let me show you how a master tames a monster. The declaration from the Ianish man was loud, loud enough to be heard by Kelmethus and Jones, who continued their work in the town circle. Kelmethus, what else do we need? Dr. Jones asked as he placed the final box of monogems in the appropriate position. The setup is complete. Now, all I require is Omnis. As a conduit for the massive amounts of magical energy we must channel from these crates. Jones frowned. I never signed up for this, but I shall reluctantly agree to be a conduit. Greater than. Don't I use you as a conduit every time I cast a spell? Jones asked. Kelmethus had an expression of confusion on his face for a split second before he realized that Jones was communicating with Omnis. Yes. But handling this amount of energy is quite uncomfortable. You do know there are conduits in Sight Beta 1? Greater than. Ah, I don't think you've ever told us about that. I am an artificial intelligence. I have records of my communications with you. June 27, 317 AM. I relayed this information to you. Greater than. Omnis. I'm pretty sure I was asleep. HMPH. Perhaps you should consider getting an upgrade to your organic brain. Greater than. Whatever. Cal. Omnis says he is willing to do it. There is a difference between willingness and reluctant to greens. Greater than. Dr. Jones ignored Omnis and passed his scepter to Kelmethus, who placed it in the center of the runic depictions and crates scattered throughout the town circle. Kelmethus began chanting and soon enough, a beam of light shot into the sky, not unlike the beam seen a few days ago. Interesting, Dr. Jones thought. Kelmethus then stood in silence, allowing the magical energies to build up. Just a couple more minutes, the Hydra eyed the puny mammal that so confidently strolled up to challenge it. Unfortunately for the beast, it was so blinded by hunger and hubris that it could not see the arcane symbols hidden among the bushes, nor could it see the flaws in the hastily crafted leaf coverings in front of it. The mammal raised its hands, letting out a war cry, and then beat its chest. In response, the hydra roared, sending chills down the spines of the other mammals, standing behind their walls and towers. Curiously, the one in front of him did not falter. Offended, the hydra lunged forward in an attempt to eat the creature. Unexpectedly, the hydra fell short and instead fell through the leaves, nearly tripping. Despite the dig trap being but a story in height. The Hydra was firmly entrenched by the numerous poisoned mithril spikes that pierced its feet. The Hydra stifled a roar of pain, instead screaming in anger as the human laughed and rushed around it. It would take time to lodge itself free, but in the meantime, it could still kill the nimble little creature with its attacks. Master Core laughed and rushed toward the first activation rune. Nine such others were scattered along the circumference of the trap to Core. This was routine. The plan was to activate the runes in sequence so that the Imperium's magical suppression tendrils could restrain the Hydra and slowly send it into a mana-exhausted state. The Imperial Tamers were first founded decades ago, years after Ianish sages rediscovered the lost art of mana siphoning. With such magic, intricate runes were developed for the purpose of restraining powerful mages. This allowed the Ianish kingdom to expand relentlessly 
since rivaling nations couldn't challenge the Anif without their magic users. Eventually, a group of Tier 1 adventurers decided to apply this knowledge to the capture of a Tarisk and the rest became history. Master Tamer Kor has learned directly from these legendary adventurers, who still prowl the lands in search of everlasting glory thanks to an abundance of incredible loot which has improved upon their durability and lifespans. Athalfi certainly did not meet up to their standards, Master Kor was still confident in his ability to wrangle this Hydra even if it was the hardest challenge he had ever faced. Dodging a ball of acid, Kor made his way over to the second rune and activated it. A head lunged in his direction, nearly biting his upper torso off. Kor rolled backward only to have to jump forward once more to avoid another attack. Some splashes of flames and acid landed on his gear, which was enchanted to protect against magic. Still, the heat from the Hydra's fireballs threatened time overwhelm his magical defenses if he kept only narrowly avoiding the attacks. Muttering a few incantations, he renewed the various buffs he had cast on himself. As he activated the third rune, he began to feel the effects of exhaustion. After navigating through a storm of fire and acid, he finally reached the fourth and cursed. The runes seemed so far apart, yet if the circular trap is any smaller, he likely would have succumbed to a fireball or acid ball by now. If the runes were farther apart, he would have more time to dodge the Hydra's ranged attacks and even avoid the head's physical attacks, but at the cost of having to run more. Already, Kor had run the equivalent of several blocks on top of the magical strain of maintaining his defenses and the physical strain of quickly dodging incoming attacks. While running to the fifth rune, Kor noticed a bright beam of light shooting up into the sky. Curious? He thought the distraction was enough to send him flying from a fireball that had landed behind him. He quickly rolled, dodging yet another lunge from the Hydra's hungering jaws and recovered. By the sixth rune, Kor was exhausted. The Hydra, sensing the wavering of its prey, ceased its attacks and grinned at the man who stood defiantly against it. It was nearly free from the crude spike trap and after consuming this core, it would have no problem ravaging the town. Kor whispered a prayer to Avis and Avon the goddess of death and god of war, respectively. As of a response from the gods themselves, a massive bolt of lightning erupted from the town circle, striking the hydra who was climbing out of the pitfall. The beast jerked wildly and it fell back down into the spikes, having lost control over its motor functions. Master Kor smiled at the gift he was granted and quickly activated the nearly all of the remaining runes without any challenge from the hydra who could only glare at the running little creature. Upon reaching the tenth and final rune, the Hydra stirred as it began to recover from its temporary paralysis. The central head opened its mouth, beginning to unleash an attack. Kor was a bit unnerved by the Hydra's actions, since he recalled the middle head doing nothing but attempting to bite him. He shuddered thinking of its attack, then calmed down after activating the final rune. The buildup of energy within the middle head's mouth reached a critical state and just as it was about to obliterate the pesky critter before it, tendrils lashed, seemingly out of nowhere, and grabbed it. The surprising nature and unexpected force of the tendrils forced the heads to face the sky, and thus Kor was spared. Holy hell, did that come from the Hydra? Lieutenant Hopkins asked. Affirmative. Slayer 6. Looks like the damn thing's got some sort of laser or energy beam weapon. Adam replied. Why didn't Monster 1 or 2 get hit with it? Miller wondered. Must be some hell of a fight going on down there for it to use that specific attack maybe. Grant speculated. The American aircraft approached the site of the battle, where ten purplish tendrils grasped a thrashing Hydra. The fuck? I thought we were just dealing with the Hydra? The pilot of Ghost One said. Intel messed up the Hydra's ETA. Wouldn't be surprised if they messed up something else, Ghost Two replied. Suddenly, a transmission from the ground came in, identifying as Captain Emily Marr. She explained the situation on the ground based on Kalmethus and Dr. Jones's accounts. Well folks, looks like we should thank the Z-Anish later for trapping the thing for us. I'll be sending the Valkyrie first. After that, Dragon Slayer squad will commence bombing runs. By the time we finish, Ghosts 1 and 2 will have arrived on site to finish off the thing, Adam announced. Roger that. Came the simultaneous reply from the local network. The Valkyrie shot forward accelerating to speeds that would certainly crush a human. The onboard computer received targeting information from Adam's F-35 and calculated the necessary information to conduct a successful bombing. The test went off without a hitch, 
as the precision bomb landed smack in the Hydra's chest. The ghostly purplish tendrils within the blast radius disintegrated for a split second before reforming and securing the Hydra. Subsequent bombs from Dragon Slayer Squadron devastated the once pristine skin of the Hydra, turning the emerald skin into a dark charcoal. With its magical powers dwindling, the fireballs it shot missed their targets by a pathetic margin, missing chunks of flesh throughout the body. The Hydra attempted to regenerate. Despite being hindered by the tendrils, regeneration commenced relatively smoothly as some of the burnt skin returned to its original color. The Hydra's devastated right arm slowly regained its mass as tendons and flesh grew from the remaining chunks. With all ordnance depleted, the F 35S turned away, remaining in the general vicinity in order to escort the two gunships back to base once they finished their mission. To the Hydra, the circling jets looked like vultures waiting for a dying animal. Yet, these vultures were nearly enough to kill a hydron on their own. What could they be waiting for? Two AC-130 gunships rumbled toward the Hydra, drawing cheers from Alpha Team on the ground and open mouths from the gay Aaron natives. Neither the Philomian people nor the Ianish had ever seen such an object, except of course for Master Kor, who had seen massive bombers in Meccan. Master Kor resting safely behind the town walls, frowned as he saw the approaching planes. He had seen Mechanese bombing runs before, and just a single plane could decimate a village. What could these two American planes do? To course surprise the American planes were less like bombers and more like flying ships, equipped with massive guns and cannons. Boom, 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 boom. The two gunships fired their first salvo. Four 105mm rounds shrieked through the air and impacted the Hydra with tremendous force, almost causing the tendrils to lose their grasp. With the immense stopping power of the plane's guns, the Hydra was already effectively restrained and forced to the ground. Just the opening volley was enough to negate any regeneration done by the Hydra. The beast was now missing half of its left leg and the right arm was once again devastated only attached to the main body by a few strands which had somehow managed to hold on. Then came the next volley. Eight corresponding explosions signified the impact of the AC-130's 40mm rounds onto the designated target, completely severing the limbs damaged from the first salvo. The Hydra, now released from the shackles of tendrils which took but a few seconds too long to reform, watched the beasts above angrily. They flew low and slow, easier targets than the smaller more nimble pests from before. The middle head began to charge its attack, opening its mouth only to receive a meal of dozens of 25 mm rounds. The rounds impacted the soft flesh of the middle head's throat, causing the energy build-up process to be interrupted. Consequently, without the biological components in the throat to stabilize the magical energy, a massive blue explosion engulfed the hydra, vaporizing the middle head and severely burning the other two. With the most powerful head gone and half the body missing, the Hydra attempted a retreat into the forest, crawling with whatever limbs it had left. These efforts were futile. The gunship's 105mm howitzers were ready to fire, and thus they did. The damaged skin and depleted magical energy of the Hydra stood no chance against the final salvo of 105mm rounds. The ground upon which the Hydra stood was bathed red with gore and the nearby environment was showered with bloody flying chunks. On the ground, the Philomian townspeople looked back toward the thunderous sounds and bright flashes in the distance, wondering what happened. Soon, a radio communication alerted Lord Talvin. How do you answer this thing again? Ah there it is. Lord Talvin, we have excellent news. The voice of Major Donager announced. The Hydra has been slain. Thank you, Major Donager. We the people of Philomia owe you yet another debt, on top of liberating us from the Nubians. Ha ha, don't worry about that. Esseth is an American territory now, so you fall under our protection. Once more. I thank you. I will now announce the news to my people. Turning his attention to the Philomian evacuees gathered by the Eastern Gate, he declared, The Hydra is no more. You may all return to your homes. He was met with cheers and the crowd quickly dispersed, everyone walking back to their homes and discussing the whole ordeal. Lord Talvin grinned. This marked a new era for his people. I just gave Lord Talvin the good news. The townspeople should be working their way back here. That's nice. Emma said, Yeah? And we had quite the fireworks show too. Kalmethus joked. Alpha team laughed heartily.
prompting several glances from the awestruck Yanish. Master Kor in particular was at an extreme loss for words. He would certainly be reprimanded for his failure to tame the Hydra. Now, he wouldn't be killed, since Emperor Evalian isn't stupid enough to waste the talents of his people, but he may lose many of the benefits he had seen in recent months such as additional gold. Perhaps he could focus his tell more on his encounter with the Americans? Yes, Emperor Evalian is known for seeking information. Depending on what Kor said, Emperor Evalian could potentially spend days, even weeks, pondering over this report. Satisfied with his decision, Kor began to organize his camp for a return back to the Imperium. They would not return on the back of a tamed Hydra but returning with one of its heads should be enough to make him a hero. As the last of his workers exited the East Gate, he spared one last glance at the stars and stripes upon the gate's flagpole. A nation that could decimate a Hydra in a few short minutes. Kor smiled softly, his face actually depicting a smile this time. In the background, several fireworks went off above numerous Essex towns in the distance. This world was about to get interesting. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 37 The White House My chapter updates will hopefully become more frequent after Thanksgiving. Bonus points if you get the little Easter egg smile. July 5, 2019 Colorado Springs Jack woke up next to his wife, Samantha, ready to start the day. After a pleasant night fishing with his buddies from work, he felt fulfilled and energetic. He sighed happily as he went downstairs to prepare breakfast. While gathering the ingredients for a delicious French toast, he decided to turn on the TV and watch the news. After a short advertisement for a new season of Wormhole Extreme, a musical note played alongside an animation, signifying the continuation of today's news. On the screen, a handsome caster introduced himself and today's primary topic. Good morning America, I'm Harlan Davidson with BFA News. Today, we're going to discuss the talk of the town, or more appropriately, the world. Yesterday, the president announced the existence of intelligent alien life on this new world, gay era. This officially marks the first time humanity has encountered such aliens, unless the government knows something we don't. He laughed, joking at the possibility of alien conspiracists being correct. The image of the newscaster faded away as the clips from yesterday's announcement came to view. In case you missed it, here are some of the highlights from President Keener's speech. Jack who was too busy setting up for his 4th of July party, was incredulous that he had missed such a historical announcement. He nearly burned his food, causing his wife to wake up and come down. Both of them watched the clips intently, unable to believe that they were literally watching a talking humanoid cat give an interview. When the clip concluded, the caster listed some examples of food items discovered in gay era with mouth-watering pictures sliding into the screen. This is one of the more popular dishes according to the noble folk we've talked to. Calf steak, usually served with a portion of local greens, bread, and a special sauce derived from unique, alien spices, the calf steak is a staple amongst the medieval nobles of this world. According to some reports from scientific expeditions in gay era, the meat itself tastes a bit like beef but with an indiscernible taste to it. They also say that trade talks are commencing and we might see the introduction of this meat into high-end supermarkets initially, with projected prices past those of ASIC Swaju beef. We tried to get an exclusive interview with one of these scientists, but unfortunately we were turned away by the military. A transcript of the expedition's press release will be available on our website at bfs.com later tonight. Another particularly succulent-looking item from the gay Aaron menu is this, the Kaltrian freshwater eel, similar to unagi. Thinking back on the grilled foods and barbecue from last night's party, Jack wondered when he might be able to experiment with this calf meat. He watched the growing list of popular food items with his wife until renowned chef Gordon Ramsay was brought into the screen, his icon partitioned to the left half while the newscaster was moved to the right half. So Mr. Ramsay, are you excited for your upcoming trip to this new world? Oh, 
Certainly, I've been asked to work with some of the scientists and experiment with the new food items that they've considered safe to eat. Over the course of two weeks, the personnel station there will be my test subjects, tasting the masterpieces I will perfect. These meals will be free of charge. Once my stay is over, President Keener has graciously allowed me to bring some of these new dishes over to my restaurants in Las Vegas. Sounds appetizing. Mr. Ramsey, I bet a lot of people watching this interview right now are wishing they could be one of those scientists. Gordon Ramsey nodded. I can't say much, but I can say that we're getting a pretty good supply. That's wonderful news. Can you say what the prices in your restaurants might be? That I can't say right now. My initial shipment of meat and spices will be free, but afterwards I'll need to pay the normal market price. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, if you're ever curious. Be sure to check out Mr. Ramsey's restaurants in Las Vegas. These new menu items will debut by August, so plan your trips accordingly. Mr. Ramsey, thank you for doing this quick interview. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Have a good day, Mr. Davidson. Harlan clasped his hands after saying farewell to the famous chef. In other news, the United States government has received numerous requests for access to gay air by nations around the world. China is currently leading a loose coalition of countries under the UN, hoping to pressure the United States into opening its borders for scientific expeditions and corporations. The response from the White House remains to be announced, but we at BFA were able to talk to an anonymous source. According to them, a few key American companies have already been selected to expand their enterprises into the new world. The official response will be released by White House Press Secretary Alice Waltz later this evening. After this short break, we will return to discuss SpaceX's rumored contracts and Russia's growing amiability and open-mindedness with NATO. Another musical note played as the camera panned away and the screen faded to black. New York City Ambassador Perry looked down at his wedding ring as he waited for the Sonarans and McCainese at the hotel lobby. He rubbed the ring, thinking about his wife, claimed years ago by cancer. He wondered if magic could have saved her. Could she still be alive if the portal to gay era opened back in 2014? The elevator ding brushed away these thoughts, although seeing Sarah sign does cause some memories regarding his wife to resurface. The resemblance is uncanny, he thought. Even the names, Sarah and Sarah. John sighed and took a deep breath before greeting the Sonarans and McCainese delegations. I hope you all enjoyed the fireworks last night, he smiled. It made me think of a constant siege. One of King Celia's knights commented, My, this amount of explosives could certainly scare away any army in the NF. King Celia's added, The Mechanese on the other hand voiced simple opinions, with indeed and it was quite nice being common remarks. Well I'm glad everyone had a good time yesterday. Today will be a bit more serious. We will be flying to our nation's capital, Washington DC, so you all may commence your scheduled meetings with the president. Now, before we all leave. Who here wants a jacket? Nearly everyone raised their hands, causing Ambassador Perry to chuckle. The last time they flew, only the Mechanies desired jackets. The Sonarans rejected the offer of jackets, thinking such an offer would be ridiculous while the surrounding environment was baking under the scorching Nevada sun. Now, they've learned their lesson, as airplane flights can get very cold with blankets provided during said flights usually being insufficient. Despite the Mechanese group's relative familiarity of flying, they were still amused by the various amenities provided by their private jet. As the group settled in, Perry took a seat alone by a table so he could work on new documents regarding the integration of the Essex Kingdom and Aracel Province as American territories. While analyzing details on the Aracel Province's population, he was interrupted by a woman who took the seat in front of him on the opposite side of the table. Hello Lady Sindus. Hi there Ambassador. She smiled. Is there anything I can do for you? Can we talk about last night, when we were watching the fireworks together? Uh, sure, John said with much uncertainty in his voice. Why didn't you tell me you were married? She hissed, pointing at the ring on his finger. Wasting my time. HMPH. I am sorry you feel that way. Miss Sindus, I actually used to be married, but my wife succumbed to cancer. Oh, Sarah replied, now feeling embarrassed because of her small outburst. I am sorry. It is fine. In fact, I almost lost it, but thanks to you and your people, my government was able to rescue me back in Sorn. Sarah's mood lightened upon hearing this, 
glad that they could be of some use to these highly advanced and sophisticated foreigners. Changing the topic, Ambassador Perry began describing the details regarding Sarah's upcoming meeting. Once they arrived, the Meccanese and Sonarans would be directed to the White House. Lodging more spacious than that of the hotel will be provided, causing Sarah to sigh gratefully. With regards to the meeting itself, Perry listed several major topics that Sarah and King Celius can expect, such as the recent land transfer, international politics and gay era, and magic. Preon and Jean joined in after overhearing some of the topics, Jean was particularly interested in technology exchange. He thus asked John about it, to which he replied, I'm not at liberty to discuss our plans with regards to technology exchange. Upon seeing Jean frown slightly, he continued, don't worry. You'll find out about it in just a few hours. You all might want to head back to your seats. We're about to land. On cue, the pilot announced their position and asked the passengers to put on their seatbelts. As the plane descended slowly, the pilot pointed out famous landmarks, such as the Washington Monument and the Capitol Building. Sarah, confused about the architecture, asked John, why do the buildings here look much older than the buildings in New York? Well versed in historical knowledge of Washington, D.C., John explained the architecture of the city. Some sections, as he pointed out, were modernized just like New York, albeit without the towering skyscrapers. Sarah simply nodded in response. The passengers then sat in silence, taking pictures of the scenery outside their windows with their newly acquired phones. Despite not knowing what the rest of the phone was capable of, they understood the basic functions of calling, texting, and taking pictures. The Mechanies in particular learned quickly, Prion, if such high-quality photos can be sourced from this puny device, what might a dedicated camera of theirs be capable of? I wager that their spy planes are able to produce excellent pictures, Jean said. Remembering the drone video they watched weeks ago. Yes, yes. I will be sure to ask their leader about such technologies. We must make our shield technology as valuable as possible in their eyes, something they can't figure out on their own, Prion whispered. Thinking back to the massacre they witnessed when the Americans brought fire and an entire mountainside down upon the Bracton gang, Prion realized that the Americans have already witnessed their reactions. Indeed, the whole reason they were there was to flex their aerial capabilities and to see how they would react to an overwhelming display of firepower. Priyank continued, Is there anything you would be willing to trade from the artificers? The plane buckled, experiencing turbulence as it descended into a cloud. The sonarans erupted into a small commotion before being calmed down by the attendants on the plane, who reassured them that the turbulence is the same thing they experienced during the flight to New York. Meanwhile, the Mechanese continued their conversations and activities as if nothing had happened. They were used to rougher flights than the ones provided by the Americans. Ah, I just remembered that I have some recordings in my baggage. And you just remembered now? How did you become a third commander in the first place? How are we supposed to review our materials when we're about to land? Brian hissed. Ah, do not worry Prion. I believe I can recall some of the artificer's most incredible achievements. For example, they figured out how to miniaturize shield emitters into a small box. Prion smiled and nodded in satisfaction. Yes, yes. As long as the Americans don't know about the ancient vaults, they'll never be able to learn how to make such barriers. Anything else? They would certainly be interested in our WD engines. Have they even seen our airships yet? Prion wondered. Mm, I don't believe so. However, I think there might be some general information on our airships in the material I've brought. What if they think it is propaganda? A. Jean shrugged. It's up to them to believe it or not. The initial ancestors likely wouldn't believe it either, if they had our knowledge on scientific principles. True, I suppose. I wonder, shall we sell engines or the technology itself? Either would probably be fine. Their aircraft seem to be quite heavy and it stands to reason their engines consume a lot of fuel to provide enough lift for this heavy beast to fly, he said as he looked outside the window toward the plane's left wing and associated turbines. We could probably inflate the prices of our blueprints and documents, 
I doubt they have the magical capacity to even make our WD engines in the first place. Nor can they study the ruins. Prion laughed and nodded his head. Indeed, we can potentially come out of these negotiations with far more than expected. The two men laughed as their hopes swelled for an extremely productive relationship with the United States. Despite being on friendly terms, the Mechanese were above all focused on their own prosperity, and thus were willing to take advantage of even their closest of allies as evidenced in their disproportionately favorable trade deals with neighboring countries. A toast, Prion suggested, to our newfound friends, and our ever-increasing prosperity. The two Mechanese men hit their wine glasses together, a tradition remarkably similar to that of Earth society. An announcement interrupted their small celebration, prompting them to prepare for landing. As the two men looked out their respective windows in order to watch the plane setting down, a hidden camera in an obscure corner of the plane traced their movements. The White House, HMPH, can't blame them for being businessmen I guess, President Keener remarked, his hand over a mouse as he rewound the recording. CIA Director Samantha Gray, who sat next to him, nodded in agreement. President Keener continued, would be real nice if we could get these into President Lynn's office, or President Ivanov for that matter. He then sighed as he shut off the laptop. I wish for the same thing, sir. Maybe some new toys from the Groom Lake facility or even Site Beta 1? Samantha smirked, hoping to get a positive response from the President. Ha, in your dreams. Mike's got all of our scientists working full time on either reverse engineering the alien tech we've got, studying the stuff we found in Gay Era studying that portal, or collaborating with the Sonarans on magic. President Keener analyzed Samantha's reaction. She nodded reluctantly. Even then, I don't think we'd be able to appease the Chinese short of granting full access. Uncle, shit, he's a damn enigma. I mean, I'm glad his administration is opening up to NATO a bit, but I sure do wish the man himself was a bit more open, you know? On that I wholeheartedly agree, sir, President Keener. Satisfied with her response, continued, I just got off the phone with Richard, General Harding, and also Tyler's guy, what's his name? Well anyway he's the main candidate for the new Secretary of Science position. They've all suggested gestures of goodwill toward our closest allies, and even Russia, if China ever wants to bring this matter to the Security Council. For some reason, Richard is the most supportive of giving away some of our magical artifacts and alien biological samples. Secretary of Defense advocating for the release of precious defense secrets. Can you believe that? No, sir. Neither did I, but he later explained his plan. Apparently, we've got a lot of minor magical artifacts, which give off very minimal readings on the new magic detectors. This stuff, alongside some samplings of gay air and flora and fauna would certainly be enough to satisfy our British brethren and the French. The Russians on the other hand, I am not too certain. We could lift the rest of our sanctions on them, but this might arouse the suspicion of the Chinese. Especially if all we're doing in response to their demands is giving away some insignificant materials for research and allowing more foreign scientific and exploration teams through to gay era. Eventually, the world's gonna call for an oversight committee. Ugh, President Keener buried his face in his hands. I'm sure you'll figure everything out, sir, Samantha replied, trying her best to be supportive. As a former CIA operative, she was excellent with personal relations, particularly in seducing top officials around the world, but that time has long passed. Additionally, none of her past experiences had anything to with emotional support. Her niece Sarah would probably know, but she's off on mission probably socializing with the cat people right now. The president's stressful state made her nervous. Thankfully, he recuperated quickly in order to answer a knock on the door. He answered and an aide appeared. Mr. President, the guests are a minute away. All right, I'll be heading down to greet them. Give me a second, he said as he turned around to relay the news to Samantha. I've got to meet the Mechanies and Sonarans now. Let me know if anything resurfaces in regard to our new acquaintances and do look into the ancient vaults and ruins the Mechani spoke of. I'm guessing they're Homagus sites, so I'm giving you full access to the data we've got from Gay Era. Hopefully whatever you need will be in the 0.1% we've managed to analyze so far. President Keener then exited the Oval Office and ventured toward the front of the White House, 
where he saw two columns of marine guards and a lavish red carpet waiting to greet the first living aliens from another world. He straightened his tie, amused by the difference between reality and expectations. The first aliens to step foot into the White House looking, talking, and acting like humans? Incredible, he thought as a convoy of black vehicles pulled up. It's time to make history once more. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. I would also appreciate it if you all could share my story. You guys are the people who motivate me to write. Join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw. Chapter 38, Discussions. Note, I have returned after a long hiatus. With finals now over. I can dedicate more time to the development of my story. I have also decided to incorporate summaries into my chapter uploads, due to the infrequency of my updates. Summary Last time on Manifest Fantasy, Alpha Team went to investigate the forests near Philomia in the newly annexed Tassith Kingdom, formerly Anabian territory. While searching for hostile fauna, they encountered a magical anomaly originating from a mountain range causing gravity to fluctuate. Diverting their efforts to investigate the anomaly yielded no results, and thus they continued their search for hostile fauna until they discovered a hydra. After a few minutes of documentation, they began their trek back to Felomia. Upon arrival, they discovered that the hydra had set course toward the defenseless medieval town. Since this town was now a U.S. territory, they were obligated to defend it. Interestingly enough, a mysterious group of adventurers led by Master Tamer Core appeared, offering their aid in defeating the Hydra. While Kelmethus and Dr. Jones prepared their spells, Core prepared a trap for the Hydra. When the Hydra arrived, Core sprung into action, activating over half of his trap before becoming bogged down by the Hydra's combat abilities. Thankfully, it was at this moment Kelmethus and Dr. Jones completed the casting of their spell striking the Hydra with incapacitating lightning. Core was able to activate the entire trap easily, holding the Hydra down for the U.S. Air Force's planes. Two gunships easily tore the beast to shreds, creating a spectacular display fitting for a 4th of July night. Meanwhile, the Sonaran and Mechanese delegations on Earth prepared for their visit to the White House. The Mechanese were revealed to have interesting technologies, and appeared to be playing some sort of mind game that even the CIA director, Samantha Gray, couldn't determine. President Keener will need to rely on his intuition for the coming discussions. July 5, 2019 The White House A set of handsome men waited along the front lawn of the Americans' humble abode and they graciously helped the passengers out of their vehicles after the convoy came to a stop. As King Celia stepped out of his party's limousine, he gazed his eyes upon the White House. He maintained a neutral expression as he analyzed the architecture of the building. The building especially its columns, resembled the structures of old. It could be considered extravagant perhaps thousands of years ago, but it really surprised him that a nation much more advanced than possibly the Divinions did not have a proportionally grandiose palace or castle for their leader. He did however admire the humble nature of the site. These people were so advanced that they didn't need to demonstrate their sophistication and technology through their capital, they could do so with everything else from devices to culinary masterpieces. The Mechanese delegates held similar perspectives. Both Prion and Jean expected something much more glorious, even mistaking the Capitol building for being the White House earlier. Most of the Mechanese anticipated a building similar to their own version of the White House, known as the Silver Tower. Modeled after the elegant structures of the faraway elves, it became the designated administrative center for the Mechanese president after a traveling elf visited their country and provided a peculiarly large collection of tomes from his impossibly lightweight baggage. The information on the tomes were mostly useless, since the Mechanese had a low altitude for magic, much less the magical capabilities of elves. However, many insights and advanced scientific principles were derived from said books including knowledge on how to combine magic and technology. These repositories also proved invaluable in competing with the Divinions, who mostly relied on their pure magical prowess. In contrast, the Americans relied on their pure technological prowess. Despite the humble appearance of the White House, the Mechanese quickly noticed the defenses along the building's perimeter and the surrounding environment. Armed guards clad in black and buzzing fairy-like objects patrolled the rooftops of various buildings 
and situated on the roof of the White House itself were a number of tubular devices, gun turrets, strange-looking cannons that had a very small barrel. The tubular devices resembled something the Mechanies are currently developing, the same thing that the delegates learned of while enjoying a presentation provided on the U.S. military and its armament. These were missile launchers. The gun turrets seemed to move on their own, without an operator, further solidifying the Mechanies' suspicion of America employing computer guidance not only in their explosive weapons like missiles, but other weapons as well. Finally, the strange cannons were something truly alien to the gay errands. They pulsed with light, seemingly like Divinion gun batteries. Unfortunately for the Mechanese, they had but a few seconds to ponder the mysterious device before they had to move toward the front door of the White House. They walked along the red carpet as smartly dressed men played play drum and trumpet based fanfare. The short musical demonstration stopped when they reached the front door. There, the president greeted both alien parties. King Celia's, Legate Urban Aparius, 3rd Commander Danius, and friends, it is an honor to finally meet you all. I welcome you all to the United States, to Washington, D.C., and to the White House. Please, come in. I'm certain you are all famished after your travels. It is an honor to meet you as well, President Keener, King Celia's replied. We on behalf of President Duke Relius are honored to meet you, President Keener. Unfortunately, our president is currently busy with important civil matters, Prion said. Ha ha, I understand. Politics can be very demanding, President Keener replied, gesturing for his guests to come in. The Sonaran and McCainese parties followed after the American leader toward a dining room, where they are scheduled to have their lunch meeting. Along the way, they noticed various portraits and other works of art adorning the walls. They stopped to admire them asking questions about the identities of these historical leaders. After a few short history lessons, they continued onward to the dining room. A plethora of covered dishes populated the tabletop, and as the Mechanese and Sonarans took their seats, waiters arrived to remove the silvery covers, revealing the delicacies within. The initial dishes included a steak made of the highest quality of Wagyu beef. Lobster seasoned with a mixture of earthly and gay Aran spices and drenched in a similarly diverse sauce, and a selection of classic American foods. Made by carefully chosen top chefs, this selection included hot dogs, hamburgers, and pizza. As the delegates indulged in earthly delicacies and fine wine, they shared their impressions of American society. King Celius began with an expression of gratitude for essentially defeating the Nubians for them. We were incredibly lucky you decided to help us, bless be to soul for connecting our worlds in my nation's most dire moment of need. King Celius remained careful not to reveal the Sonaran's involvement in creating the portal in the first place. Unbeknownst to him, the Americans already knew thanks to the Nubians captured during the Battle of Area 51. Oh. They knew all right, they just simply didn't care. In fact, the Americans were secretly thankful since they now have access to the greatest resource ever discovered by humanity in Earth, magic. As such, President Keener responded humbly, We fight for peace. It only helped that you were so hospitable to us while the Nubians stubbornly refused to accept and participate in our diplomatic efforts. Indeed. King Celia's replied after he finished savoring a piece of lobster. It seems that in the end, all of this was good for the Nubians. They now have a strong, uncorrupted leader and the Sonaran Federation has never before had such good relations with our western neighbors. I wonder what happened to their former emperor? We suspect he ran away, most likely scared of execution, President Keener replied. He did wonder though, what really happened to the emperor? Last he heard, Alpha Team found Emperor Nova's personal guards lounging about in a Harmagus outpost of all places. This worried him slightly. Somewhere in the S8 Kingdom, the blood within you is strong, nearing even the potency of his divinity's heavenly guards. Certainly, I am impressed. It looks like we made the right choice. Former Emperor Novus powered his suit down after another successful test causing numerous floating objects to become once again subject to the laws of gravity, thus crashing to the floor. With another such recalibration, his plan for reclaiming his lost glory could be set in motion. The White House I find it quite interesting we share a similar form of government, President Keener, Prion pointed out. Yes, I must agree. From what I've read, Meccan was a constitutional monarchy for most of its history. What changed? We had a somewhat incompetent king at one point, 
hated by most subjects. Generations of inbreeding within the royal family created a leader who never heeded the advice of our top generals nor his personal advisors. He got us into a war we were ill prepared for. Without a stock treasury to fund the efforts, he resorted to ludicrously high taxes imposed on all subjects, nobles and commoners alike. Needless to say, the Mechanese people were enraged. Even his royal guards participated in his beheading. Ha! You might want to look into the French Revolution. Lots of beheadings over there. Yes, yes. I do intend to indulge myself in the many books we are bringing back. It looks like our scholars are going to have to learn English, since we can't cast clarification spells on everyone. This reminded President Keener of yet another obstacle he would need to overcome while planning the development and integration of the newly acquired Essex Kingdom and Aracel Province as U.S. territories. He pushed this new consideration aside as he received more compliments regarding the technology of Earth. The group continued to flatter each other, with Keener asking the occasional question on magic, until they finished with the meals. Now, it was time for the real meetings. The Sonarans are scheduled for a meeting with Ambassador Perry, the President, and his cabinet for today, while the Mechanese will have their meeting tomorrow. The Mechanese were directed back towards the front, where the President bid them farewell and gave them a few sightseeing tips. He then brought the curious Sonarans to the meeting room, where they stuck out amongst the men and women dressed in sharp suits. King Celia's personal guards looked incredibly out of place standing alongside secret service agents by the door. Everyone took their seats and the meeting commenced. It didn't take long for the group to come to an agreement on expanded trade deals and research agreements with the Sonarans. The infrastructural developments in their capital was well received by the public, especially by those who were lucky enough to get the first installments of public utilities such as plumbing and electricity. King Celius himself even remarked, I can't believe I missed out on such luxuries. If only the Mechanese were generous enough to give us such an offer. With most survey teams done with their assignments, the Americans were able to secure mining rights for newly discovered deposits of radioactive materials and rare earth metals. In exchange, the Sonarans will receive tax exemption and a hefty 10% discount on any products derived from said raw materials, including phones and smoke detectors. Additionally, with the American public now aware of humanoid life in this new world, all American companies were cleared to expand into gay era. Luckily for them, the Sonarans were very grateful for American involvement against Nubia and thus quickly agreed to exclusivity and prioritization for American businesses. Of course, the world's nations wouldn't be too happy once they found out about this, but they can certainly be satisfied in other ways. As for research agreements, both governments agreed to work together on combining magic and technology. Copies of reports and discoveries from the alphabetical teams, currently up to Gamma, will be sent to the Sonaran Arcane Institute, where American researchers and Sonaran professors will be able to collaborate on the findings. Unlike the research agreement expected with the Mechanese, this one will make use of the Sonaran's greater aptitude for magic. The Mechanese currently employ a few mages, but they don't have access to any magical academies, since they have been so far unwilling to provide favorable deals to their trading partners. As for Kalmethus, he has been granted a temporary position as a specialist in the United States Air Force, due to his membership in Alpha Team. The Sonaran government has agreed to officially recognize Kalmethus' position. Kalmethus will be glad to know that he now has the freedom he once had as an adventurer and that he has a position available for him in King Celia's court if he ever decides to return. Over the next several hours, the meeting focused on the development of the Aracel province. King Celia's proved to be extremely knowledgeable in civil matters, having incorporated many concepts from Meccan. After ironing out the details, he and Lady Sindas were also able to help accommodate the new plan for implementation in the S8 Kingdom. Both territories would be subject to massive education reforms and would require heavy investment and subsidization. Fortunately, the United States didn't have to deal with slavery in either of the territories, as the Sonaran Federation mostly employed laborers under a Mechanese derived capitalist system while the Essex Kingdom operated under a combination of serfdom and early mercantilism. End of Block 2